The God in the Box by Sewell Peasley Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. G. Parenti. The God in the Box by Sewell Peasley Wright. This is a story I never intended to tell. I would not even tell it now if it were not for the Zenians. Understand that I do not dislike the Zenians. One of the best officers I ever had was a Zenian. His name was Itel, and he served under me on the old Tamun, my first command. But lately the Zenians have made rather too much of the exploits of Ame Beov. The history of the universe gives him credit, and justly, for making the first successful exploration in space. Beov's log of that trip is a classic that every school child knows. But I have a number of friends who are natives of Xenia, and they fret me with their boastings. Well, Hansen, they say, your special patrol service has done wonderful work, largely under the officership of Earthmen. But after all, you have to admit that it was a Xenian who first mastered space. Perhaps it is just fractiousness of an old man, but countless repetitions of such statements, in one form or another, have irritated me to the point of action. And before going any further... Let me say for the benefit of my Zenian friends that if they care to dig deeply enough into the archives, somewhere they will find a brief report of these adventures recorded in the log of one of my old ships, the Ertak, now scrapped and forgotten, except, perhaps, by some few like myself, who knew and loved her when she was one of the newest and finest ships of the service. I commanded the Ertak during practically her entire active life. Those were the days when John Hansen was not an old man, writing of brave deeds, but a youngster of half a century, or thereabouts, and full of spirit. Sometimes, when the memory brings back those old days, it seems hard for me to believe that John Hansen, commander of the Ertak, and old John Hansen, retired, and a spinner of ancient yarns, are one and the same. But I must get on to my story, for youth is impatient, and from old man to old fool is a short leap for a youthful mind." The Special Patrol Service is not all high adventure. It was not so even in the days of the Ertak. There was much routine patrolling, and the Ertak drew her full share of this type of duty. We hated it, of course, but in that service you do what you are told and say nothing. We were on a routine patrol with only one possible source of interest in our orders. The wizened and sour-faced scientist the universe acclaimed so highly had figured out that a certain planet, thus far unvisited, would be passing close to the line of our patrol and our orders read, if feasible, to inspect this body, and if inhabited, which was doubted, to make contact. There was a separate report, if I remember correctly, with a lot of figures. This world was not large, smaller than Earth, as a matter of fact, and its orbit brought it into conjunction with our system only once in some immemorable period of time. I suppose that record is stored away, too, if anybody is interested in it. It was largely composed of guesses, and most of them were wrong. These white-coated scientists do a lot of wild guessing, if the facts were known. However, she did show up at about the place they had predicted. Kincaid, my second officer, was on duty when the television disc first picked her up, and he called me promptly. Strobus. That was the name the scientists had given this planet we were to look over. Strobus is in view, sir, if you'd like to look her over, he reported. Not close enough yet to determine anything of interest, however, even with maximum power. I considered for a moment, scowling at the microphone. "'Very well, Mr. Kincaid,' I said at length. "'Set a course for her. We'll give her a glance anyway.' "'Yes, sir,' replied Kincaid promptly. "'One of the best officers in the service, Kincaid. Level-headed and a straight thinker. He was a man for any emergency. I remember—' But I've already told that story. I turned back to my reports, and I forgot all about this wandering strobus. Then I turned in, to catch up somewhat on my sleep for we had some close calls in the field of meteors, and the memory of a previous disaster was still fresh in my mind. I had spent my watch below in the navigating room, and now I needed sleep rather badly. If the scientists really want to do something for humanity, why don't they show us how to do without food and sleep? When, refreshed and ready for anything, I did report to the navigating room, Corey, my first officer, was on duty. "'Good morning, sir,' he nodded. It was the custom on ships I commanded for the officers to govern themselves by Earth standards of time. We created an artificial day and night, and disregarded entirely, except in our official records, 
the ENR and other units of the Universal Time System. Good morning, Mr. Corey. How are we bearing? Straight for our objective, sir. He glanced down at the two glowing charts that pictured our surroundings in three dimensions to reassure himself. She's dead ahead and looming up quite sizably. Right. I bent over the great hooded television disc, the ponderous type we used in those days, and picked up Strobus without difficulty. The body more than filled the disc, and I reduced the magnification until I could get a full view of the entire exposed surface. Strobus, it seemed, bore a slight resemblance to one view of my own Earth. There were two very apparent polar caps and two continents, barely connected, the two of them resembling the numeral eight in the writing of Earthmen, a numeral consisting of two circles, one above the other and just touching. One of the roughly circular continents was much larger than the other. Mr. Kincaid reported that the portions he inspected consisted entirely of fluid, sir, commented Corey. The two continents now visible have just come into view, so I presume that there are no others, unless they are concealed by the polar caps. Do you find any indications of habitation? I haven't examined her closely under high magnification, I replied. There are some signs. I increased power and began slowly searching the terrain of the distant body. I had not far to search before I found what I sought. "'We're in luck, Mr. Corey,' I exclaimed. "'Our friend is inhabited. There is at least one sizable city on the larger continent, and—' "'Yes, there's another. Something to break the monotony, eh? Strobus is an unknown on the charts.' "'Suppose we'll have trouble, sir?' asked Corey, hopefully. Corey was a prime hand for a fight of any kind. A bit too hot-headed, perhaps.' but a man who never knew he was beaten. I hope not. You know how they rant at the base when we have to protect ourselves, I replied, not without a certain amount of bitterness. They'd like to pacify the universe with never a sweep of a disintegrator beam. Of course, Commander Hansen, some silver sleeve will say, if it was absolutely vital to protect your men and your ship. Ugh! They ought to turn out for a tour of duty once in a while and see what conditions are. I was young then and the attitude of my conservative superiors at the base was not at all in keeping with my own views at times. You think, then, that we'll have trouble, sir? Your guess is as good as mine, I shrugged. The people of this Strobus know nothing of us. They will not know whether we come as friends or enemies. Naturally, they'll be suspicious. It's hard to explain the use of the menorah to convey our thoughts to them. I glanced up at the attraction meter, reflecting upon the estimated mass of the body we are approaching. By night we should be nearing her atmospheric envelope. By morning we should be setting down on her. We'll hope for the best, sir, said Corey innocently. I bent more closely over the television disc to hide my smile. I knew perfectly what the belligerent Corey meant by the best. The next morning, at atmospheric speed, we settled down swiftly over the larger of the two continents, Corey giving the orders to the navigating room while I divided my attention between the television disc and the altimeter with a glance every few seconds at the surface temperature gauge. In unknown atmospheres, it is not difficult to run up a considerable surface temperature, and that is always uncomfortable and sometimes dangerous. The larger city seems to be nearer the other continent. You should be able to take over visually before long. Has the report on the atmosphere come through yet? Not yet. Just a moment, sir. Corey spoke for a moment into his microphone and turned to me with a smile. Suitable for breathing, he reported. Slight excess of oxygen and only a trace of moisture. Hendricks just completed the analysis. Hendricks, my third officer, was as clever as a laboratory man in many ways, and a red-blooded young officer as well. That's a combination you don't come across very often. Good. Breathing masks are a nuisance. I believe I'd reduce speed somewhat. She's warming up. The big city I mentioned is dead ahead. Set the Ertak down as close as possible. Yes, sir, snapped Corey and I leaned over the television disc to examine, at very close range, the great Strobian metropolis we were so swiftly approaching. The buildings were all tall, and constructed of a shining substance that I could not identify, even though I could now make out the details of their architecture, which was exceedingly simple, and devoid of ornament of any kind, save an occasional pilaster or flying buttress. The streets were broad, and laid out to cut the city into lozenge-shaped sections, instead of the conventional squares. In the center of the city stood a great lozenge-shaped building with a smooth arched roof. From every section of the city, great swarms of people were flocking in the direction of the spot toward which the Ertak was settling, on foot and in long, slim vehicles of some kind that apparently carried several people. "'Lots of excitement down there, Mr. Corey,' I commented. "'Better tell Mr. Kincaid to order up all hands and to station a double guard at the port. 
have a landing force armed with atomic pistols and bombs and equipped with menores as an escort. And the disintegrator ray generators? You'll have them in operation, sir, just in case? That might be well, but they are not to be used except in the greatest emergency, understand? Hendricks will accompany me if it seems expeditious to leave the ship, leaving you in command here. Very well, sir. I knew the arrangement didn't suit him, but he was too much the perfect officer to protest, even with a glance. And besides, at the moment, he was very busy with orders to the men in the control room forward as he conned the ship to the place he had selected for her to set down. But busy as he was, he did not forget the order to tune up the disintegrator ray generators. While the great circular door of the Ertak was backing out ponderously from its threaded seat, suspended by its massive gimbals, I inspected the people of this new world. My first impression was that they were a soldiery people, for there were no jostling crowds swarming around the ship, such as might have been expected. Instead, the citizenry stood at ease in sort of military formation of numerous small companies, each apparently in charge of an officer. These companies were arranged to form a long, wide avenue, leading to the city, and down this avenue a strange procession was coming toward the ship. I should make it clear at this point that these Strobians were, in form, very similar to Earthmen, although somewhat shorter in stature and certainly more delicately formed. Perhaps it would be better to say they resembled the Xenians, save for this marked difference. The Strobians were exceedingly light in color, their skins being nearly translucent, and their hair a light straw color. The darkest hair I saw at any time was pale gold, and many had hair as colorless as silver, which I should explain as a metal of earth somewhat resembling aluminum in appearance. The procession was coming toward the ship slowly, the marchers apparently chanting as they came, for I could see their lips moving. They were dressed in short kirtles of brilliant colors, scarlet, green, orange, purple, and wore brilliant belts suspended about their waists by straps which crossed over their breasts and passed over each shoulder. Each marcher bore a tall staff from which flew a tiny pennon of the same color as his chief garment. At the top of each staff was a metal ornament, which at first glance I took to be the representation of a fish. As they came closer, I saw that this was not a good guess, for the device was without a tail. "'The exit port is open, sir,' reported Hendricks. "'The people seem far from hostile, and the air is very good. What are your orders?' "'There will be no change, I think,' I said as I hurried toward the now-open door. "'Mr. Kincaid will be in command of the guard at the port. You and I, with a small landing force, will advance to meet this procession. Make sure there are a number of extra menores carried by the escort. We shall need them.' "'Yes, sir.' Hendricks snapped a command, and the landing force fell into place behind us as we passed through the circular doorway and out into the rocky ground of Strobus. The procession stopped instantly, and the chanting died to a murmur. The men forming the living wall on each side bowed their heads and made a quick sign, a peculiar gesture as though they reached out to shake an invisible hand. The leader of the procession, a fine-featured man with golden hair, walked forward with a bowed head, chanting a single phrase over and over against a voice as sweet as a woman's. Toma Anderson, Toma Anderson, Toma Anderson. Sounds friendly enough, I whispered to Hendricks. How many extra menore? I'll see. The chanting stopped, and the Strobian lifted his head. Greetings, he said. You are welcome here. I think nothing ever surprised me more. I stared at the man like a fool, my jaw dropping and my eyes bulging. For the man spoke in a language of earth, spoke it haltingly and poorly, but recognizably. You, you speak English? I faltered. Wh where did you learn to speak this language? The Strobian smiled, his face shining as though he saw a vision. Toma Anderson, he intoned gravely, and extended his right hand in a greeting which Earthmen have offered each other for untold centuries. I shook hands with him gravely, wondering if I were dreaming. I thank you for your welcome, I said, gathering my wits at last. We come as friends from worlds not unlike your own. We are glad that you meet us as friends. It was so ordered. He ordered it, and so Arthur is his mouthpiece in this day. The Strobian weighed every word carefully before he uttered it, speaking with a solemn gravity that was most impressive. Arthur? I questioned him. That is your name? That is my name, he said proudly. It came from he who speaks, who gave it to my father many times removed. There were many questions in my mind, but I could not be outdone in courtesy by this kindly Strobian. I am John Hansen, I told him, commander of the Special Patrol Service Ship Ertak. This is Avery Hendricks, my third officer. Much of that, said Arthur slowly, 
I do not understand, but I am greatly honored. He bowed again, first to me and then to Hendricks, who was staring at me in utter amazement. You will come with us now to the place, Arthur added. I considered swiftly and turned to Hendricks. This is too interesting to miss, I said in an undertone. Send the escort back with word for Mr. Corey that these people are very friendly and we are going on into the city. Let three men remain with us. We will keep in communication with the ship by a menore. Hendricks gave the necessary orders, and all our escort, save for three men, did a brisk about-face and marched back to the ship. The five of us, conducted by Archer, started for the city, the rest of the procession falling in behind us. Behind the double file of the procession, the companies that had formed the living wall marched twenty abreast. Not all the companies, however, for perhaps a thousand men in all formed a great hollow square about the Urtak, a great motionless guard of honor, clad in kirtles like the pennon-bearers in the procession, save that their kirtles were longer and pale green in color. The uniform of their officers was identical, save that it was somewhat darker in color, and set off with a narrow black belt, without shoulder straps. We marched on and on, into the city, down the wide streets, walled with soaring buildings that shone with an iridescent luster, toward the great domed building I had seen from the Urtak. The streets were utterly deserted, and when we came close to the building I saw why. The whole populace was gathered there. They were drawn up around the building in orderly groups, with a great lane open to the mighty entrance. There were women waiting there, thousands of them, the most beautiful I have ever seen, and in my younger days I had eyes that were quick to note a pretty face. Through these great silent ranks we passed majestically, and I felt very foolish and very much bewildered. Every head was bowed as though in reverence, and chanting of the men behind us was like the singing of a hymn. At the head of the procession we entered the great domed, lozenge-shaped building, and I stared around in amazement. The structure was immense, but utterly without obstructing columns, the roof being supported by great arches buttressed to pilasters along the walls, and furnished with row after row of long benches of some polished, close-grained red wood so clear that it shone brilliantly. There were four great aisles, leading from the four angles of the lozenge, and many narrower ones to give ready access to the benches, all radiating from a raised dais in the center, and the whole building illuminated by bluish globes of light that are recognized from descriptions and visits to scientific museums as replicas of an early form of the Ethon tube. These things I took in at a glance. It was the object upon the huge central dais that caught and held my attention. Hendrix, I muttered, just loud enough to make my voice audible above the solemn chanting. Are we dreaming? No, sir. Hendrix's eyes were starting out of his head, and I have no doubt I looked as idiotic as he did. It's there. On the dais was a gleaming object perhaps sixty feet long, which is a length equal to the height of about ten full-size men. It was shaped like an elongated egg, like the metal object surmounting the staffs of the pennon bearers. And unmistakably it was a ship for navigating space. As we came closer, I could make out details. The ship was made of some bluish shining metal that I took to be chromium, or some compound of chromium, and there was a small circular port in the side presented to us. Set into the blunt nose of the ship was a ring of small disks, reddish in color and deeply pitted, whether by electrical action or oxidation I could not determine. Around the more pointed stern were innumerable small vents, pointed rearward, and smoothly streamlined into the body. The body of the ship fairly glistened, but it was dented and deeply scratched in a number of places, and around the stern vents the metal was dark, iridescent blue, as though stained by heat. The chanting stopped as we reached the dais, and I turned to our guide. He motioned that Hendricks and I were to precede him up a narrow, curving ramp that led upwards, while the three Zenians who accompanied us were to remain below. I nodded my approval of this arrangement, and slowly we made our way to the top of the great platform, while the pennon-bearers formed a close circle around its base, and the people— who had surrounded the great building, filled in with military precision, and took their seats. In the short space of time that it took us to reach the top of the dais, the whole great building filled itself with humanity. Archer turned to that great sea of faces and made a sweeping gesture, as of benediction. Toma Anderson! His voice rang out like the clear note of a bell, filling that vast auditorium. In a great wave, the assembled people seated themselves and sat watching us, silent and motionless. Archer walked to the edge of the dais, and stood for a moment, as though lost in thought. Then he spoke, not in the language which I understood, but in a melodious tongue which was utterly strange. His voice was grave and tender, 
He spoke with a degree of feeling which stirred me, even though I understood no word that he spoke. Now and again I heard one recognizable sequence of syllables, that now familiar phrase, Toma Anderson. "'Wonder what that means, sir?' whispered Hendricks. "'Toma Anderson? Something very special from the way he brings it out. And do you know what we're in here for, and what all this means?' No, I admitted. I have some ideas, but they're too wild for utterance. We'll just go slow and take things as they come. As I spoke, Arthur concluded his speech and turned to us. John Hansen, he said softly, our people would hear your voice. But, but, but what am I to say? I stammered. I don't speak their language. It will be enough, he muttered, that they have heard your voice. He stood aside, and there was nothing for me to do but walk to the edge of the platform, as he had done, and speak. My own voice in that hushed silence frightened me. I would not have believed that so great a gathering could maintain such utter, deathly silence. I stammered like a schoolchild reciting for the first time before his class. "'People of Strobus,' I said. This is nearly as I remember it, and perhaps my actual words were even less intelligent. "'We are glad to be here.' The welcome accorded us overwhelms us. We have come. We have come from worlds like your own. And, and we have never seen a more beautiful one, nor more kindly people. We like you, and we hope you will like us. We won't be here long anyway. I thank you. I was perspiring and red-faced by the time I finished, and I caught Hendricks in the very act of grinning at his commander's discomfiture. One black scowl wiped that grin off so quickly, however, that I thought I must have imagined it. "'How was that, Arthur?' I asked. "'All right?' "'Your words were good to hear, John Hansen. he nodded gravely. "'In behalf—' The hundreds of blue lights hung from the vaulted roof, clacked suddenly, and went out. Almost instantly they flashed on again, and then clicked out. A third time they left us momentarily in darkness, and, when they came on again— a murmur that was like a vast moan rose from the sea of humanity surrounding the dais, and the almost beautiful features of Arthur were drawn and ghastly with pain. "'They come,' he whispered. "'At this hour they come.' "'Who, Arthur?' I asked quickly. "'Is there some danger?' "'Yes, a very great one. I will tell you, but first. He strode to the edge of the dais and spoke crisply, his voice ringing out like a thin cry of military brass. The thousands in the auditorium rose in unison and swept down the aisles toward the doors. Now, cried Arthur, I shall tell you the meaning of that signal. For three or four generations we have awaited it with dread. Since the last anniversary of his coming, we have known the time was not far off, and it had to come at this moment. But this tells you nothing. The signal warns us that the Neans have at last made good their threat to come down upon us with their great hordes. The Neans were once men like ourselves, who would have none of him, and Arthur glanced toward the gleaming ship upon the dais, nor his teachings. They did not like the new order, and they wandered off to join those outcasts who had broken his laws and had been sent to the smaller land of this world, where it is always warm and where there are great trees thick with moss, and the earth underfoot steams and brings forth wriggling life. Nain we call that land, as this larger land is called Libar. These men of Nain became the enemies of Libar, and of us who call ourselves Libars, and follow his ways. In that warm country they became brown, and their hair darkened, they increased more rapidly than did the Libars, and as they forgot their learning, their bodies developed in strength. Yet they have always envied us, envied us the beauty of our women and of our cities, envied us those things which he taught us to make, and which their clumsy hands cannot fashion, and which their brutish brains do not understand. And now— they have the overwhelming strength that makes us powerless against them. His voice broke, and he turned his face away, that I might not see the agony written there. Toma Anderson, he muttered. Ah, Toma Anderson. The words were like a prayer. Just a minute, Arthur, I said sharply. What weapons have they, and what means of travel? He turned with a hopeless gesture. They have the weapons we have, 
he said, spears and knives and short spears shot from bows. And for travel they have vast numbers of monocars they have stolen from us generation after generation. Monocars? I asked, startled. Yes, he who speaks gave us that secret. Ah, he was wise. To hear his voice was to feel in touch with all the wisdom of all the air. He made a gesture as though to include the whole universe. There were a score of questions in my mind, but there was no time for them then. I snatched my menorah from its clip on my belt and adjusted it quickly. It was a huge and cumbersome thing, the menorah of that day, but it worked as well as the fragile bejeweled things of today. Maybe better. The guard posted outside the ship responded instantly. Commander Hansen emanating, I shot at him. Present my compliments to Mr. Corey and instruct him as follows. He is to withdraw the outside guard instantly and proceed with the Ertak to the large domed building in the center of the city. He will bring the Ertak to rest at the lowest possible altitude above the building and receive further orders at that time. Repeat these instructions. The guard returned the orders almost word for word, and I removed the menorah with a little flourish. Oh, I was young enough in those days. Don't worry any more, Arthur, I said crisply. I don't know who he was, but we'll show you some tricks you haven't seen yet. Come. I led the way down the ramp, Hendricks, Arthur, and the three Zenians following. As we came out into the daylight, a silent shadow fell across the great avenue that ran before the entrance, and there, barely clearing the shining roof of the auditorium, was the sleek, fat bulk of the Urtak. Corey had wasted no time in obeying orders. Corey could smell a fight further than any man I ever knew. From her emergency landing trap, the Urtak let down the cable elevator, and the six of us, Hendricks, Arthur, the three Zenians of the crew, and myself, were shot up into the hull. Corey was right there by the trap to greet me. "'What are the orders, sir?' he asked, staring curiously at Arthur. "'Is there trouble brewing?' "'I gather there is, but we'll talk about that in a moment, in the navigating room.' I introduced Arthur and Corey as we hurried forward, and as soon as the door of the navigating room had closed on the three of us, I turned to Arthur with a question. "'Now, where will we find the enemy, these Neans? Have you any idea?' "'Surely,' nodded Arthur. "'They come from their own country to the south. The frontier is the narrow strip of land that connects Libar with Nin, and since the alarm has been sounded, the enemy is already at the frontier, and the forces of my people and the enemy are already met. I don't know anything about the setup, put in Corey, but that sounds like poor management to me. Haven't you any advance guards or spies or outposts? Arthur shook his head sadly. My people are not warlike. We who spread his teachings have tried to warn the masses, but they would not listen. The land of the Neans was far away. The Neans had never risen against the Libars. They never would, so my people reasoned. And you think there is fighting in progress now? I asked. How did the word come? By phone or radio, I presume, said Arthur. We are in communication with the frontier by both methods and the signal of the lights has been arranged for generations. In the day all lights were to flash on three times. At night they were to be darkened three times. So they had telephones and radios. It was almost amazing, but my questions could wait. They would have to wait. Corey was shuffling his feet with anxiety for orders to start action. All right, Mr. Corey, I said. Close the ports and ascend to a height that will enable you to navigate visually. Are you sufficiently familiar with the country to understand our objective? Yes, sir. Studied it coming down. It's that neck of land that separates the two continents. He picked up the microphone and started punching buttons and snapping out orders. In twenty seconds we were rushing, at maximum atmospheric speed, toward the scene of what, Arthur had told us, was already a battle. Arthur proved to be correct. As we settled down over the narrow neck of land, we could see the two forces locked in frenzied combat the Libars fighting with fine military precision in regular companies, but outnumbered at least five to one by the mob-like masses of brown Neans. From the north and from the south, slim, long vehicles that moved with uncanny swiftness were rushing up reserved forces for both sides. There were far more monocars serving the Libars, but each car brought but a pitifully few men, and every car shot back loaded with wounded. "'I thought you said your people weren't fighters, Arthur,' I said. They're fighting now, like trained soldiers. Surely, they are well trained, but 
They have no fighting spirit like the enemy. Their training, it is no more than a form of amusement, a recreation, the following of custom. He taught it, and my people drill, knowing not for what they train. See? Their beautiful ranks crumple and go down before the formless rush of the Neans. The disintegrator beam, sir? asked Corey insidiously. No, that would be needless slaughter. Those brown hordes are witless savages. An atomic bomb, Mr. Corey. Perhaps two of them, one on either flank of the enemy. Will you give the order? Corey rapped out the order, and the ship darted to the desired position for the first bomb. Darted so violently that Arthur was almost thrown off his feet. Watch, I said, motioning to Arthur to share the port with me. The bomb fled downward, a swift black speck. It struck perhaps half a mile to the west, to adopt earth measures and directions, of the enemy's flank. As it struck, a circle of white shot out from the point of impact, a circle that barely touched that seething west flank. The circle paled to gray and settled to earth. Where there had been green, rank growth, there was now no more than a dirty red crater, and the whole west flank of the enemy was fleeing wildly. I said the whole west flank. That was not true. There were some that did not flee, that would never move again. But there was not one hundredth part of the number that would not have dissolved into dust with one sweep of the disintegrator ray through that pack of striving humanity. The other flank, Mr. Corey, I said quietly and just a shade further away from the enemy, a little object lesson, as it were. The battle was at a momentary standstill. The Neans and the Lebar seemed, for the moment, to forget the issue. Every face was turned upward, even the faces of the runners who fled from a disaster they did not understand. "'I think one more will be enough,' chuckled Corey. "'The beggars are ready to run for it right now.' He gave a command, and as though the microphone itself released the bomb, it dropped from the bottom of the Urtac and diminished swiftly as it hurtled earthward. Again the swift spread of white that turned to gray. Again the vast red crater. Again, too, a flank crumpled. As though I could see the faces of the brown men, I saw terror strike the heart of the Neans. The flanks were melting away, and the panic of fear spread as flame spreads on a surface of oil. Corey has a good eye for such things, and he said there were fifty thousand of the enemy massed there. If there were... In the space that it takes the heart to tick ten times, fifty thousand Neans turned their back to the enemy and fled to the safety of their own jungles. The Lebars made no effort to pursue. They stood there, in their military formations, watching with wonderment. Then, with crisp military dispatch, they maneuvered into great long ranks, awaiting their arrival of transportation. "'And so it is finished, John Hansen,' said Arthur slowly, his eyes shining with a light that might almost be called holy. My people are saved. He spoke well, as always, when he said that those who would come after him would be our friends if we were their friends. We are your friends, I replied. But tell me, who is this one of whom you speak always but do not name? From what I have seen, I guess a great deal, but there has been no time to learn all of the story. Will you tell me now? I will, if that is your wish, said Arthur but I should prefer to tell you in the place. It is a long story, the story of Toma Anderson, the story of he who speaks, and there are things you should see so that you may understand that story. As you wish, Arthur. I glanced at Corey and nodded. Back to the city, Mr. Corey. I think we're through here. I believe we are, sir. He gave the orders to the operating room, and the Urtac swung in a great circle toward the gleaming city of the Lebars. It looked like a real row when we got here. I wouldn't have minded being down there for a few minutes myself. With the Urtac poised over your head, dropping atomic bombs? Corey shook his head and grinned. No, sir, he admitted. Just hand to hand with clubs. Arthur and I were in the great domed building he called The Place. There were no others in that vast auditorium, although outside a multitude waited. Arthur had expressed a wish that no one accompany me and I could see no valid reason for refusing the request. First, he said, pausing beside the great shining body of spaceship upon the central dais, let me take you back many generations to the time when only this northern continent was inhabited, and the Lebars and the Neans were one people. In those days we were of less understanding than the Neans of today. There were no cities. Each family lived to itself in crude huts, tilling the ground and hunting its own food. Then out of the sky came this. 
He touched reverently the smooth side of the spaceship. It came to earth at this very spot, and from it, presently, emerged he who speaks. Would you inspect the ship that brought him here? Gladly, I said, and as I spoke, Arthur swung open the small circular door. A great Ethon flashlight, of a type still to be seen in our larger museums, stood just inside the threshold, and aided by its beams, we entered. I stared around in amazement. The port through which he had entered led to a narrow compartment running lengthwise of the ship, a compartment twice the length of a man, perhaps, and half the length of a man in breadth. The rest of the ship was cut off by bulkheads, each studded with control devices the uses of which I could but vaguely understand. Forward was a veritable maze of instruments, mounted on three large panels, the central panel of the group containing a circular lens which apparently was the eyepiece of some type of television disc, the like of which I have never seen or heard. From my hasty examination I gathered that the ship operated by both a rocket effect, an early type of propulsion which was abandoned as ineffective, and some form of attraction repulsion apparatus, evidently functioning through the reddish pitted disks I had observed around the nose of the ship. The lettering upon the control panels and the instruments, while nearly obliterated, was unmistakably the same language in which Artur had addressed us. The ship had, beyond a shadow of a doubt, come from Earth. Arthur, I said gravely, you have shown me that which has stirred me more than anything in my life. This ship of the air came from my own world, which is called Earth. True, he nodded. That is the name he gave to it, Earth. He was a young man, but he was full of kindness and wisdom. He took my people out of the fields and forests, and he taught them the working of metals and the making of such things as he thought were good. Other things, of which he knew, he kept secret. He had small instruments he could hold in his hand, and which roared suddenly that would take the life of large animals at a great distance. But he did not explain these, saying that they were bad. But all good things he made for my people, and showed them how to make others. Not all of my people were good. Some of them hated this great one, and strove against him. They were makers of trouble, and he sent them to the southern continent, which is called Nin. Those among my people who loved him and served him best, he made his friends. He taught them his language, which is this that I speak, and which has been the holy language of his priests since that day. He gave to these friends names from his own country, and they were handed down from father to son, so that I am now Artur, as my father was Artur, and his father before him, for many generations. Just a second, I put in. Artur. That is not, ah, Arthur. That is the name, Arthur. Perhaps so, nodded the priest of this unknown earth child. In many generations a name might slightly change, but I must hasten on with my story, for outside my people become impatient. In the course of time he passed away, an old man, with a beard that was whiter than the hair of our newborn children. Here our hair grows dark with age, but his whitened like the metal of his ship that brought him here. But he left us to his voice, and so long as his voice spoke to us on the anniversary of the day upon which he came out of the sky, the Neans believed that his power still protected his people. But the Neans were only awaiting the time when his voice would no longer sound in the place. Each year their brown and savage representatives came, upon the anniversary, to listen, and each time they cowered and went back to their own kind with the word that he who speaks still spoke to his people. But the last anniversary no sound came forth. His voice was silenced at last, and the Neans went back rejoicing to tell their people that at last the god of the Libars had truly died, and that his voice sounded no more in the place. A tense excitement gripped me. My hands trembled, and my voice, as I spoke to Artur, shook with emotion. A and this voice? It came from where, Artur? I whispered. From here. Sorrowfully, reverently, he lifted from a niche in the wall a small box of smooth, shining metal, and lifted the lid. Curiously, I stared at the instruments revealed. 
In one end of the horizontal panel was a small metal membrane, which I guessed was a diaphragm. In the center of the remaining space was thrust up a heavy pole of rusty metal, supported by tiny brackets in such a fashion that it did not quite touch the pole of rusty metal, was a bright wire, which disappeared through tiny holes in the panel on either side. Each of the brackets which supported the wire was tipped with a tiny roller, which led me to believe that the wire was of greater length than was revealed, and designed to be drawn over the upright piece of metal. Until the last anniversary, said Arthur sadly, when one touched this small bit of metal here, he indicated a lever beside the diaphragm, which I had not noted. This wire moved swiftly, and his voice came forth. But this anniversary the wire did not move, and there was no voice. Let me see that thing a moment. There were hinges at one end of the panel, and I lifted it carefully. An intricate maze of delicate mechanism came up with it. One thing I saw at a glance, the box contained a tiny, crude, but workable atomic generator, and I had been right about the wire. There was a great orderly coil of it on one spool, and the other end was attached to an empty spool. The upright of rusty metal was the pole of an electromagnet, energized by the atomic generator. "'I think I see the trouble, Arthur,' I exclaimed. One of the connections to the atomic generator was badly corroded. A portion of the metal had been entirely eaten away, probably by the electrolytic action of the two dissimilar metals. With trembling fingers I made a fresh connection and swung down the hinged panel. Is this the lever? I asked. Yes, you touch it so. Archer moved the bit of metal, and instantly the shining wire started to move, coming up through the one small hole, passing on its roller guides, directly over the magnet, and disappearing through the other hole, to be wound up on the take-up spool. For an instant there was no sound, save the slight grinding of the wire on its rollers, and then a powerful voice spoke from the vibrating metal diaphragm. I am Thomas Anderson, said the voice. I am a native of a world called Earth, and I have come through space to this other sphere. I leave this record, which I trust is imperishable, so that when others come to follow me, they may know that to Earth belongs the honor, if honor it be, of sending this world its first visitor from the stars. There is no record on Earth of me, nor my ship of space, the adventurer. The history of science is a history of men working under the stinging lash of criticism and scoffing. I would have none of that. The adventurer was assembled far from the cities, in a lone place where none came to scoff or criticize. When it was finished, I took my place and seated the port by which I had entered. The adventurer spurned the earth beneath its cradles, and in the middle of the twenty-second century, as time is computed on earth, man first found himself in outer space. I landed here by chance. My ship had shot its bolt. Perhaps I could leave— but the navigation of space is a perilous thing, and I could not be sure of singling out my native earth. This is a happy world, and the work I am doing here is good work. Here I remain. And now, to you who shall hear this, my voice, in some years so far away that my bones shall be less than dust, and the mind refuses to compute the years, let me give into your charge the happiness and the welfare of these, my people. May peace and happiness be your portion. That is the wish of Earth's first orphan, Thomas Anderson. There was a click, and then the sharp hum of the wire respooling itself on the original drum. Toma Anderson, said Arthur solemnly, he who speaks. He offered his hand to me, and I understood, as I shook his hands gravely, that this old Earth greeting had become a holy sign among these people, and I understood also the meaning of the familiar phrase, Toma Anderson. It was a time-corrupted version of that name they held holy, the name of Thomas Anderson, child of my own earth, an explorer of space centuries before Amé Beov saw his first son. There is more I could tell of Strobus and its people, but an old man's pen grows weary. The menace of the Neans, Arthur agreed, had been settled forever. They knew now that he who speaks still watched over the welfare of his people. The Neans were an ignorant and superstitious people, and the two great craters made by our atomic bombs would be grim reminders to them for many generations to come. "'You have done all that need be done, John Hansen,' said Arthur, his face alight with gratitude. "'And now you must receive the gratitude of my people.' Before I could protest, he signaled to the men who guarded the four great entrances, and my words were lost in the instant tramp of thousands of feet marching down the broad aisles. 
When they were all seated, Arthur spoke to them, not in the holy language I understood, but in their own common tongue. I stood there by the ship, feeling like a fool, wondering what he was saying. In the end he turned to me, and motioned for me to join him, where he stood near the edge of the dais. As I did so, every person in that monstrous auditorium rose and bowed his head. They greet you as the successor to he who speaks, said Arthur gently. They are a simple folk, and you have served them well. You are a man of many duties that must soon carry you away. But first will you tell these people that you are their friend, as Toma Anderson was the friend of their fathers? For the second time that day I made a speech. Friends, I said, I have heard the voice of a great countryman of mine, who is dead these countless centuries, and yet who lives today in your hearts. I am proud that the same star gives us birth. It wasn't much of a speech, but they didn't understand it anyway. Archer translated it for them, and I think he embroidered it somewhat, for the translation took a long time. They worship you as the successor to Toma Anderson, whispered Arthur as the people filed from the great auditorium. Your fame here will be second only to his, for you saved today the people he called his own. We left just as darkness was falling, and as I shot up to the hovering Urtak, the chant of Arthur and his bright-robed fellows was the last sound of Strobus that fell upon my ears. They were intoning the praises of Thomas Anderson, man of earth. And so, my good Zenian friends, you learn of the first man to brave the dangers of outer space. He left no classic journal behind him, as did Ame Beove, nor did he return to tell the wonders he had found. But he did take strong root where he fell in his clumsy craft. And if this record, supported by only the log of the Urtak, needs further proof, some five or six full generations from now, Strobus will be close enough for doubting Xenians to visit, and they will find there, I have no least doubt, the enshrined adventurer, and the memory, not only of Thomas Anderson, but of one John Hansen commander, now retired, of the Special Patrol Service. End of The God in the Box by Sewell Peasley Wright Recorded by J. G. Parenti How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit CompleteAudiobooks.com for more quality content. Wedding Day by Winston Marks This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Mike Ferry 252 Wedding Day by Winston Marks Some folks say a good wife is a composite of many things, and sometimes a girl finds it tough. But with the ratio of the sexes drastically changed. At breakfast, Polly and June had an argument over the coffee. Polly had brewed it. June thought it was too strong. Doris and Sue stay out of the argument at first. Polly defended, Sure, it's a little stronger, but men like it strong. You might as well get used to it. June said, See here? He's got to make some concessions. After all, why should four of us suffer? Suffer? You call being married to Hollis Jameson suffering? Don't be so impressed. He's not doing badly marrying us either. He could do a lot worse. Why, you vain witch. Just because you play a fair game of chess. Well, I'm not taking all the credit. You're a fine cook. Doors is witty, and Sue's body would make any man's mouth water. But that's just the point. Look what he's getting. Why should we have to change all our habits and tastes to conform with his? Now Doris entered the argument. You know darn well why. It's still a man's world and a man's choice. Back when there was a man for practically every woman, it was different. But it's five women to one man right now. Don't ever forget that. Five to one. And so far, the law only requires a quad or so. Just be grateful you aren't the one who's left out, you and your chess playing. 
How far would you get attracting a man all by yourself? Shh. Now all of you. Sue broke into the telepathic conversation. Let's clear the dishes and get the apartment straightened up. Hollis did make one concession. Moving in with us, instead of making us live in that dismal bachelor's hole of his, let's not make him regret it. They heated Sue and got busy. Sue was the arbiter. She ruled the quartet with a gentle but confident mind. All four knew that her lithe, athletic body with its curves and golden hair was the greatest asset in this transaction of matrimony. There had been no dissension on this point, nor could there have been. The Bureau would have never allowed them to be together and form a marriage cell had there been the slightest dispute. Many differences of opinion were allowable, but the four had been carefully screened in certain matters of basic tastes. They liked the same colors, foods, styles of clothing, video programs, sports, and vacation activities. All were carefully schooled ambiverts of roughly equal education. Instead of conflicting, their differences of skills, talents, and personality traits complemented each other. Even with all this care in selecting and matching, however, the big test was the culmination of the marriage itself. The whole purpose of this banding together, the unpredictable quality of the most stable feminine emotions made the choice of a mate most difficult of all. This awareness was all in their minds this day, and it made them a little nervous. Even the argument that had started over the coffee had been faintly alarming to Sue. They were a team. Welded together by the wonderful gift of telepathy, which was only possible through formation of a marriage cell. The most complete intimacy of thought and feeling had been nurtured for a whole year before a marriage was permissible. Sympathy, tolerance, and sharing a common experience with mutual enjoyment and happiness was the keystone of the polygamous unions. Nothing must spoil it now. The delivery vault thumped and the signal light flicked on. Sue rushed to slide up the door. Orchids, they coursed mentally, and Sue noticed with satisfaction that June's thought was as strong as the others. The lovely flowers were put in the cooler, the apartment was tidied, and they turned to the exciting task of becoming beautiful for the handsome husband. The tiff over the coffee was forgotten as they became immersed in sprays, powders, tints, cosmetics, body ornaments, and the precious nuptial perfume. This latter issued to them only yesterday when they signed the register and received the license was now as traditionally exclusive to weddings as trousseaus had been centuries ago. Feminine clothing, of course, had long been since eliminated from the occasion, along with other redundancies such as waggish, and mischievous guests, old shoes, rice, and hectic honeymoon trips. The official and religious arrangements had been completed yesterday at the registry and the chapel. The union to become legal and effective at noon on this day. When Hollis Jameson walked through their door at twelve o'clock, he would bring four gold rings, and the moment the rings were placed on the proper fingers, the ceremony was complete. Dor said, Let's steal just a tiny whiff of the perfume. I'm too curious to wait. June and Polly were game, but Sue cut them off. Not on your life. I used to know a chemist at the hormone labs where they compound this stuff, and he told me about it. We have things to do, and if what he told me is true, well, it's very distracting. Polly backed her up. I hear it is terribly volatile. I guess we wouldn't want it to wear off before Hollis came. Hollis! The thought was June's, and it came thin and quavery. What do you suppose it's like to be married? No one answered, for there was no experience among them. Each had her own romantic idea, so cherished, so private, that even within the intimacy of their clique, it was too sacred to discuss. Suddenly June said, I'm scared. The thought had come sharply and unexpectedly. It was contagious. Polly said, me too. Of what? Doris asked. Of drinking strong coffee the rest of your lives? It was a weak, nervous stab at humor. And Sue knew that Doris was as jumpy as the rest of them. Steady, gals, she said sympathetically. It'll be worth it. 
We want a baby, don't we? It was the right thought at the right time. Sue felt their minds relax, and the thought even did her some good. A sweet little round pink baby. She let the mental picture flow out to the others, and the little crisis passed. The minutes flew, and soon it was five minutes to twelve. Have we forgotten anything? Sue asked. The perfume, Polly and June said together. Hurry, Dora said. I think he's coming. The seal on the tiny vial was broken, one drop on each breast, and the rich, exotic fumes exuded a gentle, warm excitement that was entirely different from the innocent scents they had known. The door was unlocked, and now it opened. Hollis stepped in, bronzed, body bare to the waist. The flowers! Polly wailed inwardly. We forgot the orchids! But Hollis Jameson didn't notice the discrepancy. He advanced smiling from his gray eyes and strong mouth. Sue opened her lips and her fine white teeth showed a welcoming smile. She was proud of her lovely body and June, Polly, and Doris shared in that pride. Sue held out her left hand with fingers outstretched. Her man came forward, jingling the four rings in his right hand. He paused before her, drew her left hand to his lips, kissed the little finger, and slid the proper ring on it. Then, in order, he kissed Sue's other three fingers and banded them with the remaining rings, symbolic of the four separate feminine entities who dwell in this one magnificent body. And with each ring, he said a name. June, Polly, Doris... Sue, he straightened and gazed into the two blue eyes. I thee wed, he said simply. End of Wedding Day by Winston Marks Recorded by Mike Ferry 252 The Passenger by Kenneth Harmon This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recorded by Daryl Nobles The Passenger By Kenneth Harmon The classic route to a man's heart is through his stomach, and she was just his dish. The transport swung past Centaurus on the last leg of her long journey to Seoul. There was no flash, no roar as she swept across the darkness of space, as silent as a ghost, as quiet as a puff of moonlight, she moved, riding the gravitational fields that spread like tangled, invisible spider webs between the stars. Within the ship, there was also silence, but the air was stirred by a faint, persistent vibration from the field generators. This noiseless pulse stole into every corner of the ship, through long, empty passageways lined with closed stateroom doors up spiraling stairways to the bridge and navigational decks, and down into vast and echoing holes filled with strange cargo from distant worlds. This vibration pulsed through Lenora's stateroom as she relaxed on her couch. She bathed in it, letting it flow through her to tingle in her fingertips and whisper behind her closed eyelids. Home, it pulsed. You're going home. She repeated the word to herself, moving her lips softly, but making no sound. Home, she breathed. Back home to Earth. Back to the proud old planet that was always home. No matter how far you wandered under alien suns. Back to the shining cities clustered along blue sea coasts. Back to the golden grain lands of the central states and the high blue grandeur of the western mountains. And back to the myriad tiny things that she remembered best. The little friendly things. A stretch of maple-shadowed trees, heavy, and still with the heat of a summer noon. A flurry of pigeons in the courthouse square. Yellow dandelions in a green lawn. The whir of a lawnmower and the smell of cut grass ivy on old bricks, and the rough feel of oak bark under your hands, white lilies and watermelons, and crepe papery dances and picnics by the river in the summer dusk, 
and the library steps in the evening with fireflies in the cool grass and school chimes sounding, the slow hours through the friendly dark. She thought to herself, It's been such a long time since you were home. There will be a whole new flock of pigeons now. She smiled at the recollection of the eager, awkward girl of twenty that she had been when she had finished school and had entered the government education service. Travel while helping others had been the motto of the GES. She had traveled all right, a long, long way inside a rusty freighter without a single portal to a planet out on the rim of the galaxy that was as barren and dreary as a cosmic slag heap. Five years on the rock pile. Five years of knocking yourself out trying to explain history and Shakespeare and geometry to a bunch of grubby little miners' kids in a tin schoolhouse at the edge of a cluster of tin shacks that was supposed to be a town. Five years of trudging around with your nails worn and dirty and your hair chopped short of wearing the latest thing in overalls. Five years of not talking with the young miners because they got in trouble with the foreman, and not talking with the crewmen from the ore freighters because they got in trouble with the first mate, and not talking with yourself because you got in trouble with the psychologist. They took care of you in the education service. They guarded your diet and your virtue, your body and your mind. Everything but your happiness. There was lots to do, of course. You could prepare lessons and read papers and cheap novels in the miners' library, or nail some more tin on your quarters to keep out the wind and the dust and the little animals. You could go walking to the edge of town and look at all the pretty gray stones and the trees, like squashed down barrel cactus. Watch the larger sun sink behind the horizon with its little companion star circling around it, diving out of sight to the right and popping up again on the left. And Saturday night, yippee, three-year-old movies in the tin hangar, and after five years, they come and say, here's Miss So-and-so, your relief, and here's your 5,000 credits and... Wouldn't you like to sign up for another term? Ha! So they give you your ticket back to Earth. You're on the transport at last. And who can blame you if you act just a little crazy and eat like a pig and take baths three times a day and lie around your stateroom and just dream about getting home and waking up in your own room in the morning and getting a good cup of real coffee at the corner fountain and kissing some handsome young fellow on the library steps when the moon is full behind the bell tower. And will that young fellow like you? She asked herself, knowing the answer even as she asked the question. She whirled about in the middle of the state room, her robe swirling around her and ended with a deep curtsy to the full-length mirror. Allow me to introduce myself, she murmured. Lenora Smithson, formerly of the Government Education Service, just back from business out on the rim. What? Why, of course you may have this dance. Your name? Mr. Fairheart? Of the billionaire Fairhearts? She waltzed with herself a moment. Halting before the mirror again, she surveyed herself critically. Well, she said aloud, the five years didn't completely ruin you after all. Your nose still turns up and your cheeks still dimple when you smile. You have a nice tan and your hair's grown long again. Concentrated food hasn't hurt your figure either. She turned this way and that before the mirror to observe herself. Then suddenly she gave a little gasp of surprise and fright, for a cascade of laughter had flooded soundlessly inside her head. She stood frozen before the mirror while the laughter continued. Then she slowly swung around. It ceased abruptly. 
She looked around the compartment, staring occasionally at each article of furniture in turn, then quickly spun around to look behind her, meeting her own startled gaze in the mirror. Opening the door slowly, she ventured to thrust her head out into the corridor. It was deserted. The long rows of doors all closed during the afternoon rest period. As she stood there, a steward came along the corridor with a tray of glasses, nodded to her, and passed on out of sight. She turned back into the room and stood there, leaning against the door, listening. Suddenly the laughter came again, bursting out as though it had been suppressed and could be held back no longer. Clear, merry, ringing, and completely soundless, it poured through her mind. What is it? she cried aloud. What's happening? My dear young lady, said a man's voice within her head, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Fairheart, of the billionaire Fairhearts. May I have the next dance? This is it, she thought. Five years on the rock pile would do it to anyone. You've gone mad. She laughed shakily. I can't dance with you if I can't see you. I really should explain, the voice replied, and apologize for my silly joke. It was frightfully rude to laugh at you, but when I saw you waltzing and perining yourself, I couldn't help it. I'm a telepath, you see, from Decur Star, out on the rim. That would explain, she thought, his slightly stilted phraseology. English was apparently not his native tongue, or, rather, his native thought. There was a mild mutation among the settlers there, and the third generation all have this ability. I shouldn't use it, I know, but I've been so lonely, confined here to my room, that I cast around to see if there was anyone that I could talk to. Then I came upon you, considering your own virtues, and you were so cute and funny that I couldn't resist. Then I laughed, and you caught me. I've heard of telepaths, she said doubtfully, though I've never heard of Decur's star. However, I don't think you have any right to go thinking around the ship spying on people. Shh, whispered the silent voice. You needn't shout. I'll go away if you wish and never spy on you again. But don't tell Captain Blake, or he'll have me sealed in a lead-lined cell or something. We're not supposed to telepath around others, but I've been sitting here with all sorts of interesting thoughts, just tickling the edges of my mind for so long that I had to go exploring. Why not go exploring on your own two feet like anyone else? Have you so much brains, your head's too heavy to carry? Unfortunately, the voice mourned. My trouble is in my foot and not in my head. On the second night out from Decur Star, I lost my footing on the stairs from the dining hall and plunged like a comet to the bottom. I would probably have been killed but for the person of a stout steward who, at that moment, started to ascend the stairs. He took the full impact of my descent on his chest and saved my life, I'm sure. However, I still received a broken ankle that has given me so much pain that I have been forced to remain in my cabin. I have had no one to talk to except the steward who brings me my meals, and, as he is the one whom I met on the stairs, he has little to say. In the morning he frowns at me, at noon he glowers, and in the evening he remarks hopefully, Foot still pretty bad? Thus I'm starved for conversation. Lenore smiled at this earnest speech. I might talk with you for a minute or two, but you must admit that you have one advantage over me. You can see me, or so you say, and know what I look like, but I can't see you. It isn't fair. I can show myself to you, he said 
but you'll have to help me by closing your eyes and concentrating very hard. She closed her eyes and waited expectantly. There was a moment of darkness. Then there appeared in the middle of the darkness a point of light, a globe, a giant balloon of color. Suddenly, she was looking into the corner of a stateroom which appeared to hang in space. In the center of the area stood a handsome young man in a startling black and orange lounging robe, holding on to the back of a chair. She opened her eyes. For an instant, the vision of the young telepath hung in the air over her couch like a ghostly double exposure. Then it faded, and the room was empty. That's a terrible effort, came his thought, particularly when I have to balance on one foot at the same time. Well, now, are we even? Abandoning her post by the door, she moved to the couch and sat down. I'm really disappointed, she smiled. I was sure you'd have two heads. But I think you do have nice eyes and a terrible taste in bathrobes. She took a cigarette from her case and lit it carefully. Then she remembered her manners and extended the case to the empty air. Won't you have one? I certainly would like to. I'm all out of them until the steward brings my dinner. But I'm afraid I'll have to wait, unless you can blow the smoke through the ventilators to me, or unless you bring me one. Lenore blushed and changed the subject. Tell me, what do you do all day in your stateroom? Do you read? Do you play the flute? Do you telepath sweet nothings across the light years to your girlfriend on Decur Star? I'm afraid my telepathic powers are a bit short-range to reach Decur Star, he replied. Besides, what girl would commune with me through the depths of space when some other young man is calling her from the dancing pavilion? And my musical talents are limited. However, I do read. I brought some books, connected with the research I intend to do on Earth from my degree, and I have spent many happy hours poring over the thrilling pages of extraterrestrial entomology and galactic arachnida. I came better prepared than you did, she said. Perhaps I could lend you some of my books. I have novels, plays, poetry, and one very interesting volume called Progressive Education Under Rimstar Conditions. But, she lowered her voice to a whisper. I must tell you a secret about the last one. What is it? I haven't even opened it. They laughed together, her merriment bubbling aloud in her cabin, his echoing silently inside her mind. I haven't time to read a novel, his thought came, and drama always bored me, but I must confess to a weakness for poetry. I love to read it aloud, to throw myself into a heroic ballad and rush along, spouting grand phrases as though they were my own, and feeling for a moment as though I were really striding the streets of ancient Rome, pushing west on the American frontier, or venturing out into space in the first wild, reckless, heroic days of rocket travel. But I soon found her. I get swept away by the rhythm lost in the intricacies of cadence and rhyme, and when the pace slows down, when the poem becomes soft and delicate, and the meaning is hidden behind a foliage of little gentle words, I lose myself entirely. She said softly, Perhaps I can help you interpret some verses. Then she waited, clasping her hands to keep them from trembling with the tiny thrill of excitement she felt. That would be kind of you, he said after a pause. You could read there, and I could listen here, and feel what you feel as you read. Or, if you wished, another pause. Would you care to come down? She could not help smiling. You're too good a mind reader. A girl can't have any secrets anymore. Now look here, 
he burst out. I wouldn't have said anything, but I was so lonely, and you're the only friendly person I've come in contact with. And don't be silly, she laughed. Of course I'll come down and read to you. I'd love to. What's your cabin number? It hasn't got a number, because actually I work on this ship, so I'm away from the passengers' quarters, but I can direct you easily. Just start down the hall to your left and... My dear sir, she cried, just wait a minute. I can't come visiting in my robe, you know. I'll have to change. But while I dress, you must take your spying little thoughts away. If I detect you peeking in here at the wrong moment, I'll run straight to Captain Blake and have him prepare his special lead line cell for one unhappy telepath. So you just run along. When I am ready, I'll call you, and you can lead me to your lair. He thought only the one word. Hurry. But in the silence after he was gone, she fancied she heard her heart echoing him loud in the stillness. She laughed gaily to herself. Now stop acting like a schoolgirl before the junior prom. You've got to get busy, and wash, and dress, and comb, and brush. And then to her reflection in the mirror, Aren't you a lucky girl? You're still millions and billions of miles from Earth, and it's starting already. And he's going to do research there for some time. And maybe at the university in your hometown, if you tell him just how nice it is, and he doesn't know any other girls, you'd have an inside track. Now you'd better get going, or you'll never be ready. For reading poetry, don't you think this dress is just the thing? This nice soft blue one that goes so well with your tan and shows your legs, which are really quite pretty, you know? And your silver sandals, and those silver pins. Just a touch of perfume, that's right, and now a little lipstick. You do have a pretty smile. There, that's right. Now stop admiring yourself and let's go. She moved to the bookshelf, frowning now, considered, selected, and rejected. Finally, she settled on three slim books, bound in russet leather, in glossy plastic, in faded cloth. She took a little purse from the table put the cigarette case into it. Then, with a laugh, she took one cigarette and slipped it into a tiny pocket on her skirt. I really meant to bring you one, she whispered to the empty air, but wasn't I mean to tease? In the corridor, she walked quickly past the rows of closed doors to the tiny refreshment stand at the foot of the dining room stairs. The attendant rose from his stool as she approached and came to the counter. I'd like two frosted starlights, please, she said, on a tray. Two, said the attendant, and nothing more. But his eyebrow climbed up his forehead, hung for a second, then slowly drooped back to normal, as if to say that after all these years he no longer puzzled about a lovely young girl who came around in the middle of a Wednesday rest period, dressed like Saturday night and smelling of perfume, ordering two intoxicating drinks when she was obviously traveling alone. Lenore felt a thrill of secret pleasure go through her, a feeling of possessing a delicious secret, a delightful sensation of reckless gaiety, of life stirring throughout the sleepy ship of a web of secrets and counter-secrets hidden from everyone but this unconcerned observer. She walked back down the corridor, balancing the tray, when a little splashed over the rim of the tall glasses. She took a sip from each, tasting the sweet cold liquid in her throat. When she came to the head of the stairs, she realized that she did not even know her telepath's name. Closing her eyes, she said very slowly and distinctly inside her head, Mr. Fairheart? Instantly, his thought was with her, overpowering, as breathless as an embrace. Where are you? 
at the head of the central stairs. Down you go. She went down the stairs, through more corridors, down more stairs, while he guided her steps. Once she paused to sip again at each glass when the liquid splashed as she was going down. The ice tickled her nose and made her sneeze. You live a long way down, she said. I've got to be near my charges, he answered. I told you, I work on the ship. I'm a zoologist, classifying any of the new specimens of extraterrestrial life they're always picking up. And I always get stuck with the worst quarters on the ship. Why, I can't even call all my suite my own. The whole front room is filled with some sort of ship's gear that my steward stumbles over every mealtime. She went on and on, down and down. How many flights, she wondered. Two or twelve or twenty. Now, why couldn't she remember? Only four little sips and her mind felt so cloudy. Down another corridor. And what was that funny smell? These passages were poorly ventilated in the lower levels. Probably that was what made her feel so dizzy. Only one more flight, he whispered. Only one more. Down and along and then the door. She paused, conscious of rising excitement, conscious of her beating heart. Dimly she noticed the sign on the door. You... You mean whatever it is you're taking care of is in there with you? Don't be frightened. His persuasive thought came. It can't hurt you. It's locked in a cage. Then she slid the bolt and turned the handle. Her head hurt for an instant, and she was inside, a blue and silver shadow in the dim anteroom, with a tray in her hand and the books under her arm and her pulse hammering. She looked around the dim anteroom at the spidery tangle of orange and black ropes against the left-hand wall, then at the doorway and the right-hand wall with the warm light streaming through. He was standing in the second room, one hand on the chair for support, the other extended toward her. For the first time he spoke aloud. "'Hello, butterfly,' he said. "'Hello,' she said. She smiled and walked forward into the light. She reached out for his hand. Then she stopped short. Her hand pressed against an impenetrable wall. She could see him standing there, smiling, reaching for her hand, but there was an invisible barrier between them. Then slowly his room began to fade. The light dimmed. His figure grew watery, transparent, vanished. She was standing, staring at the riveted steel bulkhead of a compartment which was lit only by the dim light filtering through the thick glass over the transom. She stood there, frozen, and the ice in the glasses tinkled nervously. Then the tray slipped from her fingers and clattered to the floor. Icy liquid splashed the silver sandals. In the silent gloom she stood immobile, her eyes wide in her white face, her fist pressed to her mouth, stifling a scream. Something touched her gently at head and wrist and ankle, all over her body. The web clung, delicate as lace, strong as steel. Even if she had been able to move, she could not have broken free as the thing against the wall began to clamber down the strands on eight furred legs. Hello, Butterfly, he said again. End of The Passenger by Kenneth Harmon Recorded by Daryl Nobles Harwood's Vortex by Robert Silverberg. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Weeks. Imagine walking up a street and having the sky literally burst open over your head. 
Imagine Invaders Pouring Down, and you have Harwood's Vortex by Robert Silverberg. The vortex bubbled up out of nowhere, hung shimmering in the air in front of me, glistened and gleamed brightly. There was a whirlpool of twisting currents in the air, and I wavered dizzily for a second or two while the invaders poured through the newly created gulf. Then someone had me by the hand. Someone was pulling me away, leading me inside the house, behind a screen safe from danger. I didn't understand what had happened. I was numb with shock, half blinded by the brightness. I felt Laura near me, and that was all I cared to think about. After a couple of minutes, I opened my eyes. What was that? I asked weakly. What happened? Two minutes before, I had been approaching the Harwood house, impatient to see Laura, untroubled by the world around me, and suddenly... It was Daddy's experiment, Laura half sobbed. It... it worked. The old crackpot, I said, the dimensional gulf at last. I wouldn't believe it if I hadn't nearly fallen into it. She nodded. I saw you staggering around out there. I got out front just in time to, to... I held her tight against me while she unloaded some of her anxiety. She sobbed for a minute or two, not trying to say anything. I looked uneasily out the window. Yes, it was still going on. Right in front of Abel Harwood's house, the vortex was open, and coming up through it were what we later knew as the invaders, globes of light, radiant and intangible, floating up out of nowhere and wringing themselves in the air like so many loathsome jellyfish. Why doesn't he close it, I asked. Those things are still coming through. Laura, where's your father? I'm right here, said a cold, business-like voice from behind me. I turned and saw Abel Harwood's husky frame in the door. What do you want of me, Harwood asked. Do you see what's going on out there? He nodded. So? Those things out there, what are they? What are you letting into the world, Harwood? It's an experiment, young man. He crossed his arms over his dressing gown. Would you mind leaving my house now? Daddy! You keep out of this, Laura. He turned to me. I've asked you to leave my house. I don't want you meddling in my experiments any more. I repressed an urge to aim a kick at his well-stuffed belly. Abel Harwood was a crackpot, a crazy amateur scientist who had been riding this other dimensional kick for years. Now he'd let loose Lord knew what upon the world. The things were still funneling through the gateway, and he was determined to see it continue. Harwood, you're playing with something too big for you. You're foolish and blind, and you... You're a trespasser, he interrupted. I've ordered you out of my home twice already. Will you go now, or do I have to get my gun? I'll go, I said. I broke loose from Laura, and with an uneasy look at the gateway outside, headed for the door. Wait, Dad. You can't make him go outside in that. Quiet, Laura. She started to say something else, but I put my hand on her arm. Never mind, Laura. I opened the front door and stepped outside. It was hellish out there. The things had formed a circle around the vortex in the air and hung there humming and crackling. The air was dry and strange-smelling. I paused on the porch of the Harwood house for just a moment, tucked my head under my arm and ran. Ran as fast as my legs would go. I charged through the garden, carefully averting the vortex that had opened right in front of me, circled the nest of things buzzing in the air, and dashed down the street. One of the creatures followed me a short distance, hovering a foot or two above my head. I watched it uneasily, dodged and ducked as it took swipes at me. It caught me once, a grazing blow on the side of my scalp. I smelled burned hair and felt as if I'd stuck my head up an electric socket. It drove low for another swipe, and just then it began to rain. The heavens opened, and the water came pouring down, and the sky was bright with lightning, and the globes went up to meet it. The one that had been tormenting me forgot me in an instant and went to join its fellows. I stood there and watched them. They rose in a straight line. There must have been a hundred of them by now, climbing upwards towards the black clouds overhead. The sky was split by a giant bolt of lightning, and I saw all hundred of them limbed grotesquely against it, enlarged and given color by the lightning, drinking it. Then I started running again. I kept on running until I was home, in my two-room flat near the university. 
I dove in, locked and bolted the door, threw off my soaking clothing. I grabbed for the phone and dialed the Harwood number. Hello? It was Laura's voice. I sighed in relief. It could have been old Abel, after all. Laura, this is Chuck. Her voice dropped. Daddy's right here. I can't talk very much. Tell me, what the devil has he done? You should have seen those things drinking up the lightning. I did, she said. I know what you mean. Is the gateway still open? Yes, they're still coming through. Chuck, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I know, Daddy. There was a sound of a little scuffle, and then the phone went dead. I stared at the silent receiver for a second, and then let it thunk back on the cradle. I sat down on the edge of my bed and stared at my soggy socks for a long while. Abel Harwood fit the classic description of a crackpot perfectly. My status as an authentic scientist, if only an underpaid engineer, gave me every right to make that statement. I had been doing some experimental force field work, and when I met Laura, she told me her father would be interested in talking to me about my work. So I had dinner at their home one night and started talking about my project, and then old Harwood started talking about his. It was some hodgepodge, dimensional tubes and force vertices and subspace converters, a network of gadgetry in the basement that had taken 20 years and as many thousand dollars to build a fantastic theory of bordering dimensions and alien races. I listened as long as I could, then made the mistake of expressing my honest opinion. Harwood looked at me a long time after I finished, then he said, Just like all the others, very well, Mr. Matthews. Kindly don't pay us a second visit. If that's the way you want it, I told him, but I still think it's cockeyed. And a month later I still did, only now there was this vortex in the street, spewing forth alien entities that drank radiation. Crackpot or not, Harwood had turned something on that might take some doing to turn off. Outside, the storm was continuing. I snapped on my radio, listened to the crackling of static that was the only sound it produced. Were Harwood's pets blanketing the radio frequencies? I wondered as I triddled the dials. Were they drinking them, too? I'd know soon enough, I thought. That was just the beginning, that night when the invaders came storming out of Harwood's vortex. The next few days told of terror and panic, of retreat and the swift crumbling of civilization. The invaders, they were called, thousands of them wandering around New York and the metropolitan area, devouring electricity, attacking people, bringing a reign of terror to the city. The newspapers the second day said in screaming two-inch headlines, Alien beings loose here. The third day, there were no more newspapers. No one dared leave his home, not with the invaders at large. No newspapers, no radio, no television. The channels of communication began to break down. On the fourth day, armed forces from the rest of the country began to arrive. They combed the city, searching for the creatures. Bullets had no effect, though. They passed right through the bodies of the invaders, splattered off buildings and lampposts as though there had been nothing in the way. Damn Harwood, I thought, as I stood at my window and watched the fruitless attempts to drive away the invaders. All the time, I knew that damnable vortex was still open and more and more of them were pouring through every second. It was funny, in a way, that the world should end this way. It was the end of the world, of course. We had no defense against them, and they burned and killed unstoppably. The streets were blockaded. We could go nowhere, see no one. Communication was impossible. Telephones no, were no longer working. Ever since the invaders had discovered what a juicy supply of radiation the coaxial cables provided, we were walled up with ourselves, waiting for the end. As I paced my room impatiently, I thought of Laura, there with her father, her father who had unwittingly or otherwise brought this destruction into the world. Then I looked around at my equipment, my partially designed force field generators. An idea struck me. We were completely defenseless against the invaders now, but maybe, if, I worked through the night and on into the morning, soldering and reconnecting. I had only the barest shred of a plan, and that mostly a wishful one, but I had nothing else at all to do but work. Finally, morning came. Again, there was the booming of guns from outside as the army continued its attempts to drive out the invaders. I glanced out the window and saw three of the translucent globes hovering over the charred body of a man in military uniform, and shuddered. I went back to my generator and worked until hunger reminded me that there was no food left in the house. This was the end, then. 
I was nowhere near the solution of my problem, and I knew I wouldn't be able to work for long without food. I glanced outside again. The air was thick with the things, and I didn't dare risk a break. So I turned back to my generator and forced myself to keep working. I did. I worked far into the afternoon, getting more and more tired, until sometime near nightfall I fell asleep. I slept. Suddenly I was awakened by the simultaneous touch of a hand on my shoulder and a clap of thunder outside. I looked up. Laura, what are you doing here? I had to get away, she said. She was soaked to the skin, cold and shivering. She was wearing only a flimsy house coat over some sort of pajamas. Daddy wasn't looking, and I ran out of the house. I ran all the way. But how'd you get past the, the, the invaders, she pointed outside? There's a storm going on. They're all in the sky, drinking up the lightning again. They didn't bother me at all on the way over. Much better food available, I guess. She shivered again. Look, you've got to get out of that wet stuff, I told her. I threw her a towel and my bathrobe. Here, get into this, then we can talk. Okay. She disappeared into my other room and returned a few minutes later, looking drier, but just as pale and frightened. She peered inquisitively at the machine I had been building, then turned to me. Chuck, Dad's out of his mind. I've known that a long time, I said. No, I don't mean that way. He's really insane, Chuck. You know he's been in contact with these invaders, that he deliberately brought them here? No, she nodded. He reached in through some shortwave transmitter of his and made mental contact with them. They showed him how to build the gateway, and he let them through. They promised to give him the world when they get through with it. I clenched my fists and stared angrily at the cloud-swept sky. The madman. He was getting his revenge for the years people laughed at him, I guess. But what's to happen to us? I don't know. The creatures won't harm him and they're under orders not to touch me unless I leave his protection, which I have. But as for you and the rest of the world, I don't think Daddy cares at all. Chuck, he's out of his head. We've got to stop him, I said grimly. We've got to close the gateway and drive off the things he's letting through. But how? The generator's in his basement, Laura said. If we could get in there and smash it somehow, and... How would we kill the invaders that have already come through? There must be thousands of them. We'll find some way, Chuck. There must be a way. I looked out the window. The rain was letting up, and there were only occasional flashes of lightning in the dark, tormented-looking sky. The invaders will be coming back soon, I said. Do you want to risk a dash over to your place to try to get the generator? She nodded. If we wait any longer, we won't be able to make it. But she gasped and pointed to the rear window. I turned, saw what she was trying to show me, Abel Harwood, hovering twenty feet off the ground, riding on a cloud of invaders. Come out of there, Laura. His voice was somehow amplified, and it seemed to shake my little room. Horror-stricken, we watched as the buzzing horrors bore Harwood closer and closer to my window. Laura shrank back against the wall and tried to flatten herself into invisibility. With a sudden nervous gesture, I pushed the table containing my unfinished generator into the closet and turned to face Harwood. He was right outside the window now. I saw the old man's staring eyes blazing at me as he stood there astride two of the invaders. They droned like defective neon signs, a horrifying slow buzz. I picked up a heavy soldering iron and waited as they reached the window. Then Harwood reached out and contemptuously smashed the glass and stepped through, stepped right off the backs of his hideous mounts and into my room. One of the invaders entered also, squeezing its bulk through the window. There was a pungent odor of ozone in the air. Get back, Harwood. You can't have her, I said. He laughed. Who are you to give me orders? Come here, Laura. Laura shrank back even farther. I gripped the hot soldering iron tightly and sprang forward, plunging it into the invader that hovered between me and Harwood. I stabbed again and again, and it was like stabbing air. Finally, Harwood made an impatient gesture, and the invader glowed a brilliant red for an instant. I dropped the soldering iron and clutched at my burned hand. For the last time, Laura, will you come with me? No, I hate you, she shrieked. Harwood frowned and started toward her. As he came past me, I grabbed him with my one good hand and tried to pull him back. I had thirty years on him, but my right hand was badly seared, and he was no weakling even at his age. He shoved me away and sent me sprawling against the wall. I saw him grab Laura roughly, 
The alien hummed ominously above my head. I made a mad dash for Harwood, caught him by the throat, started to squeeze. The humming sound grew louder, and then suddenly there was a blinding wave of heat sweeping through the apartment, and I fell back, clawing at the floor. When I was able to open my eyes a few minutes later, I dashed to the window, just in time to see Harwood holding the struggling form of Laura and riding off into the night on the backs of his extra-dimensional invaders. I sat down heavily on the bed and stayed there for what might have been hours, recovering my strength. The invader had given me just a glancing shock, just enough to stun me and singe my eyebrows, and Harwood had grabbed Laura. Now I had to find the answer. I had to close the gateway and find some way of killing the invaders and get Laura out of her father's clutches. It was nearly morning by the time I shook off the last effects of my stunning and was able to think clearly again. I pulled my generator out of the closet and looked at it, wondering what needed to be done. The gateway, first of all. It was a doorway to some alien dimension. Harwood had said, All right, I'd accept that at face value. The invaders, what were they? Pure radiation? Energy eaters? They were intangible, immaterial, but yet very much present. Perhaps I thought wildly their corporeal bodies were still in whatever dimension of infraspace they came from, and merely their essence, their elans, had come through. Could be, I thought, and if it were true, I might have an answer. Ignoring the fierce pangs of hunger shooting through me, I got back to work and concentrated steadily. The thought of Laura was with me always, the image of her riding off in the sky with her father's arm locked tightly around her, riding off as if kidnapped by a witch on a broomstick. I don't know how long it took, but finally my generator was finished, finished and portable. I strapped it to my back and picked up my longest and sharpest kitchen knife. I didn't have a gun, but it didn't matter. If my theory was correct, a knife would be just as good, and if I were wrong, a gun wouldn't help anyway. Then, without stopping to ponder, I ran downstairs and out into the street for the test. Fresh air smelled good after days of being cooped up in my little apartment. I stood in the middle of the street and surveyed the wreckage. Bodies lay everywhere, charred and lifeless. Overturned automobiles lay piled here and there. Stalled trucks, artillery batteries, and tanks. The defensive maneuver had failed, and what few people remained were in hiding. I stood alone in the middle of the street, the heavy generator on my back, and waved my kitchen knife as triumphantly as if it were Excalibur. Come and get me, I yelled. Come on, invaders. Let's see what you can do. I looked up. There were a few clusters of them, browsing idly around some television antennas atop a neighboring building. They ignored me for a few minutes. Maybe they were so surprised to see a living human in the streets that they were unable to move. I shook my fists at them. Come down here where I can get at you, I shouted. They hovered uncertainly, and then they came. Six of them swooped down, humming and buzzing, glowing faintly and billowing in and out as they dropped toward me. I waited, waited until they were no more than three or four feet above my head, waited until I was dizzy with the strain and suspense and could wait no more. Then I snapped on the generator. It was like catching flies in molasses. The six aliens stopped dead in their tracks as my force field spread out around them, engulfed them, imprisoned them. Suddenly they were forced to contend with more radiation than they could possibly swallow. It pinned them there, nine feet above the ground. I listened to their frenzied buzzing as they stretched themselves, elongated fantastically in an attempt to free themselves from the unexpected thing that had grabbed them, and then I stretched up on tiptoes and began to stab. My knife flashed once, twice, and the buzzing became an unbearable shriek. My heart surged as I struck home again and again. Now we had them. Now they were vulnerable. Snared in the force field, they no longer were able to flicker out of phase with our dimension every time a weapon approached. They were anchored now, mired in our continuum, helpless before my savage attack. I kept stabbing until all six of them were torn and wounded, and then I snapped off the force field and they were gone. Instantly, without lapse, they popped out of existence like so many snuffed flames. Six down, I thought grimly, six down and untold thousands to go, but now we have a weapon. I thumbed my power pack and the field spread out around me. I began to cut my way through the streets to the Harwood house. The aliens took notice of me now. No more hovering around TV antenna. They clustered in the air just outside the range of my force field 
and chattered and buzzed for all they were worth. Every once in a while one would blunder into my field, and a swift upward cut with the knife would take care of him. One cut, they were like balloons, and the first puncture did it. I didn't dare shut off the force field to see if they'd pop out of existence, for fear the clouds of them in the air would swoop in on me before I could turn it on again. But as I moved on through the dead and deserted streets, I could see the string of dead invaders hanging in the air, vanishing one by one as I moved out of range. And then I was standing in front of Laura's home, right in front of the vortex itself. It was still there, and the aliens came thundering through at a rate of ten or twenty a minute. I stepped past the vortex, ignoring the aliens that clustered around me, as helpless against me as humanity had been against them only a few hours before. There was no point in dealing with the invaders yet, not until the source was cut off. I strode up to the porch and peered in the window. I saw Laura huddled in a far corner of the sitting room, and behind her Abel Harwood marching up and down, probably delivering a fiery parental harangue. It was a nightmare scene, with a dead city outside, hordes of alien invaders swarming in the air, and the man responsible for it busy delivering a lecture to his unruly daughter. I banged on the door. Come on out of there, Harwood. He looked up astonished. I saw Laura's pale face brightened as she recognized me, then grew downcast as Harwood started to come toward me. I walked off the porch into the garden and waited there for him. He emerged, eyes blazing, and said, How did you get here? How did you get past my guards? Your guards don't worry me any more, Harwood. I'm going to put a stop to all this now. He chuckled, You're a very troublesome young man, Mr. Matthews. I spared you once for my daughter's sake, but I'll have no such scruples this time. He gestured imperiously to the thick swarm of invaders billowing out of the vortex. You don't scare me, Harwood. I drew a deep breath, reached around back, and cut off the force field for the barest fraction of a second, and then restored it. It was just enough time to trap twenty or so aliens in a glowing ring right above my head. Smiling, I drew my trusty kitchen knife and began to lay about. I heard Harwood's flustered exclamations as one by one the imprisoned invaders winked out, darkened, and died. I finished off the twenty and folded my arms. Care to send some more, Harwood? It's easier than swatting gnats. He sputtered a few unintelligible words, then rushed from the porch toward me. He was a big man, big and heavy. I was under the handicap of the heavy force field generator, which I knew I had to keep from his grasp, or else I was finished. All he had to do was smash the generator, and I'd be roasted the next second. Harwood barreled into me, sweeping away the kitchen knife while I was still debating whether or not to use it. It went clattering into a pile of rocks in one corner of the garden, and then his fists hit me. I backed away, making sure I kept the generator out of his reach, and flicked out a few defensive gestures. His face was contorted with rage. He was almost blind with fury, and I could hardly blame him. Here I stood, threatening to wreck whatever monument of villainy it was that he had been erecting for twenty years. We closed in a tight clinch, and his fist pummeled my stomach. I drove upward and felt teeth splinter as I connected. He spat out a mouthful of blood and backed off. "'Why did you have to do it?' he muttered. "'Why did you ruin everything?' "'You pitiful madman,' I said. "'For the sake of silly revenge on a world that rightfully regarded you as a crackpot, you—' His eyes blazed, and he came driving in at me again. In the background, I heard the continuing buzzing of the invaders, who hovered out of reach of my force field, unable to help their master, and overriding the dull droning of the aliens was a steady pattern of sobbing f coming from the porch. Laura, watching her father and the man she loved fighting to the death in her front yard. Harwood grasped me in a tight bear hug, his thick fingers reaching for the power pack on my back. I danced away and landed a solid punch in the midsection, and he countered with a wild roundhouse that staggered me and knocked me within a few inches of the garden fence. He came lumbering after me, obviously determined to flatten me against the fence and crush the generator that way. I didn't have any way of escaping to the right or the left. I could only wait there and hope to withstand his assault. As he drew near, I tensed my legs and crouched, 
Then he hit me, and I pushed upward with all my strength. The fate of the whole world, and Laura and me, depended on my strength at that instant. It worked. His heavy body lifted, and he grunted in pain as I rammed upward. He went up, up, over the garden fence, and then, to my horror, he cleared the garden fence, and with a soul-splitting cry, fell into the gaping mouth of his own vortex. I leaned against the fence, gaping, and before I could think of what to do, the vortex was gone, winked out as if it had never been. Then Laura was on the porch, white-faced, terrified. "'What happened? Where's Daddy?' I ran to her side. "'He's gone,' I said, tripped and fell into the vortex, and then, oh, she gave a little cry, and I thought she was going to faint, but she caught herself with an effort and straightened up. Speaking carefully, syllable by syllable, she said, "'I just smashed Daddy's machinery.' "'You what?' While you were fighting, I ran down to the basement and wrecked everything. Everything. I shivered. No wonder the vortex had vanished. At the very instant Abel Harwood was tumbling into it, his daughter was busily destroying the generator that operated it. Her control broke. She broke into sobs and huddled in my arms. Finally, she said, I hated him. He was out of his mind. Try not to think about it, I told her. Try to forget him. It's all over. There's just us now. I know, she said. I looked up at the sky, which was dark with the invaders. It was a frightening sight, but I no longer feared them. The gateway was closed, and Abel Harwood dead. So far as we were concerned, I didn't want to think of what might be happening to him in whatever universe he was in. There would be a lot of work to do. I would have to find the authorities, if any were left, and show them how to build my generator. Then would begin the long, slow war of eradication against the remaining invaders. Laura was still sobbing. Don't worry, I said soothingly. It's all over now. We had won. End of Harwood's Vortex by Robert Silverberg The Incomplete Theft by Ralph Burke this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman Stealing a new spaceship principle from Earth seemed like an easy enough task for the alien. But how does one deliver a principle? The Incomplete Theft by Ralph Burke Toiling Kai smiled grimly to himself as he thought of the approaching completion of the new Earth spaceship. Thus far, his disguise had completely fooled the Earthmen. They didn't even begin to suspect that a Valdorian spy was among the engineers who were building the space jumper. High above the space field it loomed, a great sphere of metal that housed the new teleportation drive. Toiling Kai looked up at its impressive bulk. Unlike the common type of spaceship, which had a top speed of 10,000 lights, the new drive would take the ship from Earth to any point in the galaxy in a fraction of a microsecond. If it were successful, Earth could win a war against Valdor in a matter of months. And if not... John Mitchell, the chief engineer of Sahara Spaceport, said, She's a beauty, isn't she, Pete? Toilin Kai, in his disguise as Earthman Pete Blaine, smiled and said, Yes, she's a real beauty. When will she be finished? This afternoon, Mitchell said. The boys are tightening the last bolts and putting in the final wiring now. The job's just about over, Pete. Good, thought Toilin. I'll be able to take it tonight to be able to bring both the spaceship's plans and the ship itself back to Valdor would be a major feat. It would result in a fine promotion. The ship was entirely different from any other vessel ever built. The hyperkinetic generator in its center generated a spherical force field around the ship which projected it to wherever it had been aimed for. It was simple to operate. All the pilot had to do was set up the coordinates of his target, turn on the hyperkinetic generator, and press the activator button. 
The generator itself did the rest. The field enclosed the ship, and instantaneously the ship was a hundred or a thousand light-years away. That evening, Toilin Kai stepped out of his room and strolled over toward the spaceship. It was surrounded by guards, and it was bathed in the blaze of a battery of searchlights. But that did not bother the Valdorian. Earthmen were such stupid fools. It would be a blessing for them if the Valdorians took them over and showed them how to run their lives more efficiently. On Valdor, everyone had a job, and he did it. He obeyed his superiors without asking questions, and the society, therefore, was efficient. But these Earthmen, such a lax, sloppy, inefficient society, they needed more regimentation, more precision. They needed to learn to obey orders, and they would learn, after the Valdorian victory. Evening, Mr. Mitchell. Good evening, Captain. Nice night, isn't it? Toil and Kai looked around wearily and saw the lean, spare figure of John Mitchell standing some distance away. He was talking to a man in a military uniform, one of the guards posted on the project. The Valdorian ducked away. He didn't care to be seen. Not tonight of all nights. He walked all around the spaceship, studying it carefully from all angles keeping well out of sight of the guards that surrounded it. The ship appeared to be ready to go. All he had to do was get inside and take off. Simple, very simple, Toil and Kai thought. The greatest victories are always simple. The ship was supposed to be lifted above the atmosphere on her jets before the hyperkinetic generator was used. But the generator could, in an emergency, be used on the ground. Toil and Kai smiled. As far as he was concerned, this would be an emergency. The Earthmen, he thought pleasantly, would feel very foolish when their greatest ship simply vanished from under their noses. After making a thorough reconnaissance of the area, the Valdorian decided he was ready. He switched on a tiny power pack at his waist, and the invisibility belt he was wearing was energized. If anyone had been watching the shadows where Toil and Kai was standing, they would have seen a faint blue glow as the Valdorian faded slowly from sight. Then, boldly, the alien strode toward the skyjumper. Nothing stood in the way of success now. He walked directly across the well-lighted safety area, and the guards paid not the slightest attention. At the airlock door he paused to take stock of the situation. He had to move fast now. The success of the whole mission depended on timing from here on out. At the airlock door he paused to take stock of the situation. He had to move fast now. The success of the whole mission depended upon timing from here on out. The guards, naturally, would see the airlock door swing open. They would know something was wrong. It would take them, he estimated, about four minutes to bring up heavy armament to blast the door open. Moistening his lips nervously, he decided to correct the estimate. Better make it three minutes, for safety's sake, he thought. In that time, he would have to warm up the generator and punch the coordinates for the planet Veldor into the big guiding computer. Doing that would require, say, two minutes, giving him a minute's leeway. Good. He waited until the guards all seemed to be looking away from the airlock door. Then he pressed the lock. The door swung open, and Toil and Kai stepped quickly inside. There was a shout from one of the guards below, but they were too late to do anything. The Valdorian had the airlock door closed before they could see what had happened. He turned the master switch on the inside of the door, which locked the door against any outside interference. He grinned sardonically. The fool Earthmen would have a devil of a time doing anything now. The next thing was to switch off his invisibility belt. It was difficult to do delicate work 
if you couldn't see your own arms and fingers, and punching coordinates into a computer was a delicate job. He turned toward the inner door, and, at that moment, the door opened. An Earthman stepped out, an engineer named Harris, who had apparently been making some last-minute adjustments on the ship. "'Oh, hello, Blaine,' Harris said. "'I—' Without a word, the Valdorian leapt forward, taking the Earthmen by surprise. He slammed his fist into Harris's abdomen, and he doubled up in pain. Torlin Kai jumped back as the Earthmen's boot sliced toward him. The toe of the engineer's boot hit him stingingly alongside the jaw, but the Valdorian managed to grasp the foot and twist. Then he bent and picked Harris up and knocked him down again with a crashing blow to the chin. He left the unconscious Earthman on the floor, locking him inside the airlock. He would be no trouble there. The real trouble was that the fight had delayed his timing. It must have taken all of a minute, and in a split-second operation such as this, an interval of a minute could be fatal. Without wasting any more time, he got moving. His jaw hurt where the Earthman had slugged him and his fingers felt stiff. He ran down the corridor to the control room. The big automatic computer was ready to go. Troiling Kai switched it on, waiting for a moment, then hastily began punching coordinates into the computer. He had to hurry. The Earthmen might still blast their way into the ship at any moment. Still, he dare not make an error. If he did, the ship might end up a thousand light-years from where it was supposed to materialize, perhaps in the heart of a sun. There was perspiration dripping from his brow by the time he finished. He turned on the hyperkinetic generator and waited for it to warm up. Still, there was no sound from the airlock. A red indicator light on the control panel came on, telling him that the generator was ready. With a triumphant smile, Troiling Cry reached out and pressed the activator stud. Outside the ship, the guards watched the airlock door. "'I wonder why Dr. Harris did that,' said a lieutenant. "'Who knows?' a sergeant replied. They had seen the airlock open and close, but knowing that Harris was still inside, they had thought little of it. Still, it was odd." The airlock door swung open again. Harris stepped out, looking dazed. The lieutenant ran toward him, and quickly the engineer explained what had happened. "'You mean he's inside there? We've got to stop him!' "'It's too late,' Harris said. "'He didn't know that I was doing some adjustments inside there. Go ahead and look.' The lieutenant went to the inner door of the airlock and peered in. The whole inside of the ship was gone, vanished, as though it had never been. I had just made a slight adjustment of the generator, Harris said quietly. The power field was cut down, so the projector field was smaller. I'm afraid our spies simply projected the inside of the spaceship out into the interstellar vacuum and left the hull behind. He shook his head grimly. Poor devil! He'll have quite a surprise in store for him, unless he can live without air. The End of The Incomplete Theft by Ralph Burke The Eyes Habit by Philip K. Dick This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Eyes Have It by Philip K. Dick It was quite by accident I discovered this incredible invasion of Earth by life forms from another planet. As yet, I haven't done anything about it. I can't think of anything to do. I wrote to the government, and they sent back a pamphlet on the repair and maintenance of frame houses. Anyhow, the whole thing is known. I'm not the first to discover it. Maybe it's even under control. I was sitting in my easy chair, idly turning the pages of a paper-backed book someone had left on the bus, when I came across the reference that first put me onto the trail. For a moment, I didn't respond. It took some time for the full import to sink in. 
After I'd comprehended, it seemed odd I hadn't noticed it right away. The reference was clearly to a non-human species of incredible properties, not indigenous to Earth. A species, I hastened to point out, customarily masquerading as ordinary human beings. Their disguise, however, became transparent in the face of the following observations by the author. It was at once obvious the author knew everything. Knew everything, and was taking it in his stride. The line, and I tremble remembering it even now, read, His eyes slowly roved about the room. Vague chills assailed me. I tried to picture the eyes. Did they roll like dimes? The passage indicated not. They seemed to move through the air, not over the surface. Rather rapidly, apparently. No one in the story was surprised. That's what tipped me off. No sign of amazement at such an outrageous thing. Later, the matter was amplified. His eyes moved from person to person. There it was, in a nutshell. The eyes had clearly come apart from the rest of him and were on their own. My heart pounded and my breath choked in my windpipe. I had stumbled on an accidental mention of a totally unfamiliar race, obviously non-terrestrial. Yet, to the characters in the book, it was perfectly natural, which suggested they belonged to the same species. And the author? A slow suspicion burned in my mind. The author was taking it rather too easily in his stride. Evidently, he felt this was quite a usual thing. He made absolutely no attempt to conceal this knowledge. The story continued. Presently, his eyes fastened on Julia. Julia, being a lady, had at least the breeding to feel indignant. She is described as blushing and knitting her brows angrily. At this, I sighed with relief. They weren't all non-terrestrials. The narrative continues. Slowly, calmly, his eyes examined every inch of her. Great Scott! But here the girl turned and stomped off and the matter ended. I lay back in my chair, gasping with horror. My wife and family regarded me in wonder. What's wrong, dear? My wife asked. I couldn't tell her. Knowledge like this was too much for the ordinary run-of-the-mill person. I had to keep it to myself. Nothing! I gasped. I leaped up, snatched the book, and hurried out of the room. In the garage, I continued reading. There was more. Trembling, I read the next revealing passage. He put his arm around Julia. Presently, she asked him if he would remove his arm. He immediately did so with a smile. It's not said what was done with the arm after the fellow had removed it. Maybe it was left standing upright in the corner. Maybe it was thrown away. I don't care. In any case, the full meaning was there, staring me right in the face. Here was a race of creatures capable of removing portions of their anatomy at will. Eyes, arms, and maybe more, without batting an eyelash. My knowledge of biology came in handy at this point. Obviously, they were simple beings, unicellular, some sort of primitive single-celled things. Beings no more developed than starfish. Starfish can do the same thing, you know. I read on, and came to this incredible revelation tossed off coolly by the author without the faintest tremor. Outside the movie theater, we split up. Part of us went inside, part over to the cafe for dinner. Binary fission, obviously, splitting in half and forming two entities. Probably each lower half went to the cafe, it being farther, and the upper halves to the movies. I read on, hands shaking. I had really stumbled onto something here. My mind reeled as I made out this passage. I'm afraid there's no doubt about it. Poor Bibney has lost his head again. Which was followed by... And Bob says he has utterly no guts. Yet Bibney got around as well as the next person. The next person, however, was just as strange. He was soon described as totally lacking in brains. There was no doubt of the thing in the next passage. Julia, whom I had thought to be the one normal person, reveals herself as also being an alien life form similar to the rest. Quite deliberately, Julia had given her heart to the young man. It didn't relate what the final disposition of the organ was, but I didn't really care. It was evident Julia had gone right on living in her usual manner, like all the others in the book, without heart, arms, eyes, brains, viscera, dividing up in two when the occasion demanded, without a qualm. Thereupon she gave him her hand. I sickened. The rascal now had her hand as well as her heart. I shudder to think what he's done with them by this time. He took her arm. Not content to wait, he had to start dismantling her on his own. Flushing crimson, I slammed the book shut and leaped to my feet. 
but not in time to escape one last reference to those carefree bits of anatomy whose travels had originally thrown me on the track. Her eyes followed him all the way down the road and across the meadow. I rushed from the garage and back inside the warm house, as if the accursed things were following me. My wife and children were playing Monopoly in the kitchen. I joined them and played with frantic fervor, brow feverish, teeth chattering. I had had enough of the thing. I want to hear no more about it. Let them come on. Let them invade Earth. I don't want to get mixed up in it. I have absolutely no stomach for it. End of The Eyes Have It by Philip K. Dick Recording by Jeremy Clark, Harrisonburg, Virginia The Day Time Stopped Moving by Bradner Buckner This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Day Time Stopped Moving by Bradner Buckner All Dave Miller wanted to do was commit suicide in peace. He tried, but the things that happened after he'd pulled the trigger were all wrong like everyone standing around like statues. No St. Peter, no pearly gate, no pitchforks or halos. He might just as well have saved the bullet. Dave Miller would never have done it had he been in his right mind. The Millers were not a melancholy stock, hardly the sort of people you expect to read about in the morning paper who have taken their lives the night before. But Dave Miller was drunk, abominably, roaringly so, and the barrel of the big revolver, as he stood against the sink, made a ring of coldness against his right temple. Dawn was beginning to stay in the frosty kitchen windows. In the faint light, the letter lay a gray square against the drainboard tiles. With the melodramatic gesture of the very drunk, Miller had scrawled across the envelope, This is why I did it. He had found Helen's letter in the envelope when he staggered into their bedroom fifteen minutes ago at a quarter after five. As had frequently happened during the past year, he'd come home from the store a little late, about twelve hours late, in fact. And this time, Helen had done what she had long threatened to do. She had left him. The letter was brief, containing a world of heartbreak and broken hopes. I don't mind having to scrimp, Dave. No woman minds that if she feels she is really helping her husband over a rough spot. When business went bad a year ago, I told you I was ready to help in any way I could. But you haven't let me. You quit fighting when things got difficult, and put in all your money and energy on liquor and horses and cards. I could stand being married to a drunkard, Dave, but not to a coward. So she was trying to show him. But Miller had told himself he'd show her instead. Coward, eh? Maybe this would teach her a lesson. Hell of a lot of help she'd been. Nag him every time he took a drink. Call her bloody murder when he put twenty-five bucks on a horse with a chance to make five hundred. What man wouldn't do those things? His drugstore was on the skids. Could he be blamed for drinking a little too much if alcohol dissolved the morbid vapors of his mind? Miller stiffened angrily and tightened his finger on the trigger. But he had one moment of frank insight just before the hammer dropped and brought the world tumbling about his ears. It brought with it a realization that the whole thing was his fault. Helen was right. He was a coward. There was a poignant ache in his heart. She'd been as loyal as they came. He knew that. He could have spent his nights thinking up new business tricks instead of smelling whiskey. Could have gone out of his way to be pleasant to customers, not snap at them when he had a terrific hangover. Even Miller knew nobody ever made any money on the horses, at least not when he needed it. The horses and whiskey and business had become tragically confused in his mind. So here he was, full of liquor and madness, with a gun to his head. Then again anger swept his mind clean of reason, and he threw his chin up and gripped the gun tight. Run out on me, will she? he muttered thickly. Well, this'll show her. In the next moment the hammer fell, and Dave Miller had shown her. Miller opened his eyes with a start. As plain as black on white, he heard a bell ring, the most familiar sound in the world, too. It was the unmistakable tinkle of his cash register. Now how in hell, the thought began in his mind, and then he saw where he was. 
The cash register was right in front of him. It was open, and on the marble slab lay a customer's five spot. Miller's glance straight up and around him. He was behind the drug counter, all right. There were a man and a girl sipping cokes at the fountains to his right. The magazine racks by the open door, the tobacco counter across from the fountain, and right before him was a customer. Good lord, he thought. Was all this a, a dream? Sweat oozed out on his clammy forehead. That stuff of Herman's that he had drunk during the game, it had had a rank taste, but he wouldn't have thought anything short of marijuana could produce such hallucinations as he had just had. Wild conjectures came boiling up from the bottom of Miller's being. How did he get behind the counter? Who was the woman he was waiting on? What? The woman's curious stare was what jarred him completely into the present. Get rid of her was his one thought. Then sit down behind the scenes and try to figure it all out. His hand poised over the cash drawer. Then he remembered he didn't know how much he was to take out of the five. Avoiding the woman's glance, he muttered, Let's see now. That was, uh, how much did I say? The woman made no answer. Miller cleared his throat, said uncertainly, I beg your pardon, ma'am. Did I say seventy-five cents? It was just a feeler, but the woman didn't even answer to that. It was right then that Dave Miller noticed the deep silence that brooded in the store. Slowly his head came up and he looked straight into the woman's eyes. She returned him a cool, half-smiling glance, but her eyes neither blinked nor moved. Her features were frozen. Lips parted, teeth showing a little. The tip of her tongue was between her even white teeth as though she had started to say this and stopped with a syllable unspoken. Muscles began to rise behind Miller's ears. He could feel his hair stiffen like filings drawn to a magnet. His glance struggled to the soda fountain. What he saw there shook him to the core of his being. The girl who was drinking a Coke had the glass to her lips, but apparently she wasn't sipping the liquid. Her boyfriend's glass was on the counter. He had drawn on a cigarette and exhaled the gray smoke. That smoke hung in the air like a large, elongated balloon, with the small end disappearing between his lips. While Miller stared, the smoke did not stir in the slightest. There was something unholy, something supernatural, about this scene. With apprehension rippling down his spine, Dave Miller reached across the cash register and touched the woman on the cheek. The flesh was warm, but his heart is flint. Tentatively, the young druggist pushed harder. Finally, shoved with all his might. For all the result, the woman might have been a two-ton bronze statue. She neither budged nor changed expression. Panic seized Miller. His voice hit a high hysterical center as he called to his soda jerker. Pete. Pete! he shouted. What in God's name is wrong here? The blonde youngster, with a towel wadded in a glass, did not stir. Miller rushed from the back of the store, seized the boy by the shoulders, tried to shake him, but Pete was rooted to the spot. Miller knew, now, that what was wrong was something greater than a hallucination or a hangover. He was in some kind of trap. His first thought was to rush home and see if Helen was there. There was a great sense of relief when he thought of her. Helen, with her grave blue eyes and understanding manner, would listen to him and know what was the matter. He left the haunted drugstore at a run, darted around the corner and up the street to his car. But, though he had not locked the car, the door resisted his twisting grasp. Shaking, pounding, swearing, Miller wrestled with each of the doors. Abruptly, he stiffened as a horrible thought leaped into his being. His gaze left the car and wandered up the street. Past the intersection, past the one beyond that, on up the thoroughfare until the gray haze of the city dimmed everything. And as far as Dave Miller could see, there was no trace of motion. Cars were poised in the street, some passing other machines, some turning corners. A street car stood at a safety zone. A man who had leaped from the bottom step hung in space, a foot above the pavement. Pedestrians paused with one foot up. A bird hovered above a telephone pole, its wings glued to the blue vault in the sky. With a choked sound, Miller began to run. He did not slacken his pace for fifteen minutes until around him were the familiar, reassuring trees and shrub-bordered houses of his own street. But yet how strange to him. The season was autumn, and the air filled with brown and golden leaves that tossed on a frozen wind. Miller ran by two boys lying on a lawn, petrified into a modern counterpart of the sculptors the wrestlers. The Swedish tang of burning leaves brought a thrill of terror to him, 
for, looking down an alley from whence the smoke drifted, he saw a man tending a fire whose leaping flames were red tongues that did not move. Sobbing with relief, the young druggist darted up his own walk. He tried the front door, found it locked, and jammed the thumb against the doorbell. But of course the little metal button was as immovable as a mountain. So in the end, after convincing himself that the key could not be inserted into the lock, he sprang toward the back. The screen door was not latched, but it might as well have been the steel door of a bank vault. Miller began to pound on it, shouting, Helen! Helen! Are you in there? Dear, there's something wrong. You've got to... The silence that flowed in again when his voice choked off was the dead stillness of the tomb. He could hear his voice rustling through the empty rooms, and at last it came back to him like a taunt. Helen! Helen! Chapter 2. Time Stands Still For Dave Miller, the world was now a planet of death on which he alone lived and moved and spoke. Staggered, utterly beaten, he made no attempt to break into his home. But he did stumble around to the kitchen window and try to peer in, anxious to see if there was a body on the floor. The room was in semi-darkness, however, and his straining eyes made out nothing. He returned to the front of the house, shambling like a somnambulist. Seated on the porch steps, head in hands, he slipped into a hell of regrets. He knew now that his suicide had been no hallucination. He was dead, all right, and this must be hell or purgatory. Bitterly, he cursed his drinking that had led him to such a mad thing as suicide. Suicide! He, Dave Miller, a coward who had taken his own life. Miller's whole being crawled with revulsion. If he just had the last year to live over again, he thought fervently. And yet, through it all, some inner strain kept trying to tell him he was not dead. This was his own world, all right, and essentially unchanged. What had happened to it was beyond the pale of mere guesswork. But this one thing began to be clear. This was a world in which change or motion of any kind was a foreigner. Fire would not burn and smoke did not rise. Doors would not open, liquids were solid. Miller's stubbing toe could not move a pebble, and a blade of grass easily supported his weight without bending. In other words, Miller began to understand change had been stopped as surely as if a master hand had put a finger on the world's balance wheel. Miller's ramblings were terminated by the consciousness that he had an acute headache. His mouth tasted, as Herman used to say after a big night, as if an army had camped in it. Coffee and a bromo were what he needed. But it was a great awakening to him when he found a restaurant and learned that he could neither drink the coffee nor get the lid off the bromo bottle. Fragrant coffee steam hung over the glass percolator, but even this steam was as a brick wall to his probing touch. Miller started gloomily to thread his way through the waiters and back of the counter again. Moments later, he stood in the street and there were tears swimming in his eyes. Helen, his voice was a pleading whisper. Helen, honey, where are you? There was no answer but the pitiful palpitation of utter silence. And then, there was movement at Dave Miller's right. Something shot between the parked cars and crashed against him. Something brown and hairy and soft. It knocked him down. Before he could get his breath, a red, wet tongue was licking his face and hands, and he was looking up into the face of a police dog. Frantic with joy at seeing another in this city of death, the dog would scarcely let Miller rise. It stood up to plant big paws on his shoulders and try to lick his face. Miller laughed out loud, a laugh with a throaty catch in it. Where'd you come from, boy? he asked. Won't they talk to you either? What's your name, boy? There was a heavy, brass-studded collar around the animal's neck, and Dave Miller read on its little nameplate, Major. Well, Major, at least we've got company now, was Miller's sigh of relief. For a long time, he was too busy with the dog to bother about the sobbing noises. Apparently, the dog failed to hear them, for he gave no sign. Miller scratched him behind the ear. What shall we do now, Major? What? Maybe your nose can smell out another friend for us. They had hardly gone two blocks when it came to him that there was a more useful way of spending their time. The library. Half convinced that the whole trouble stemmed from his suicide shot in the head, which was conspicuously absent now, he decided that a perusal of the surgery books in the public library might yield something he could use. That way they bent their steps, and were soon mounting the broad cement stairs of the building. 
As they went beneath the brass turnstile, the librarian caught Miller's attention with a smiling glance. He smiled back. I'm trying to find something on brain surgery, he explained. I... With a shock, then, he realized he had been talking to himself. In the next instant, Dave Miller whirled. The voice from the bookcases chuckled. If you find anything, I wish you'd let me know. I'm stumped myself. From a corner of the room came an elderly, half-bald man with tangled gray brows and a rueful smile. A pencil was balanced over his ear, and a notebook was clutched in his hand. You too, he said. I had hoped I was the only one. Miller went forward hurriedly to grip his hand. I'm afraid I'm not so unselfish, he admitted. I've been hoping for two hours that I'd run into some other poor soul. Quite understandable, the stranger murmured sympathetically, but in my case it is different. You see, I am responsible for this whole tragic business. You, Dave Miller gulped the word. I, I thought... The man wagged his head, staring at his notepad, which was littered with jumbled calculations. Miller had a chance to study him. He was tall, heavily built, with wide, sturdy shoulders despite his sixty years. Oddly, he wore a gray-green smock. His eyes, narrowed and intent, looked gimlet sharp beneath those toothbrush brows of his as he stared at the pad. There's the trouble, right there, he muttered. I provided only three stages of amplification, whereas four would have been barely enough. No wonder the phase didn't carry through. I guess I don't follow you, Miller faltered. You mean, something you did? I should think it was something I did. The baldish stranger scratched his head with the tip of his pencil. I'm John Erickson, you know, the Wanamaker Institute. Miller said, oh, in an understanding voice. Erickson was head of Wanamaker Institute. First laboratory of them all when it came to exploding atoms and blazing trails into the wildernesses of science. Erickson's piercing eyes were suddenly boring into the younger man. You've been sick, haven't you? he demanded. Well, no, not really sick, the druggist colored. I'll have to admit to being drunk a few hours ago, though. Drunk. Erickson stuck his tongue in his cheek, shook his head, scowled. No, that would hardly do it. There must have been something else. The impulsor isn't that powerful. I can understand about the dog, poor fellow. He must have been run over, and I caught him just at the instant of passing from life to death. Well, Dave Moore looked at his head, knowing now what Erickson was driving at. Well, I may as well be frank. I'm... I committed suicide. That's how drunk I was. There hasn't been a suicide in the Miller family in centuries. He took a skinful of liquor to set the precedent. Erickson nodded wisely. Perhaps we will find the precedent hasn't really been set. But no matter. His lifted hand stopped Miller's eager, wondering exclamation. The point is, young man, we three are in a tough spot, and it's up to us to get out of it. And not only we, but heaven knows how many others the world over. Would you... Maybe you can explain to my lay mind what's happened, Miller suggested. Of course. Forgive me. You see, Mr. Miller... Dave Miller. Dave it is. I have a feeling we're going to be pretty well acquainted before this is over. You see, Dave, I'm a nut on so-called time theories. I've seen time compared to everything from an entity to a long pink worm. But I disagree with them all, because they postulate the idea that time is constantly being manufactured. Such reasoning is fantastic. Time exists. Not as an ever-growing chain of links, because such a chain would have to have a tail end if it has a front end. And who can imagine the period when time did not exist? So I think time is like a circular train track, unending. We who live and die nearly travel around on it. The future exists simultaneously with the past for one instant when they meet. Miller's brain was humming. Erickson shot the words at him staccato fashion, as if they were things known from great primer days. The young druggist scratched his head. You've got me licked, he admitted. I'm a stranger here myself. Naturally, you can't be expected to understand things I've been all my life puzzling about. Simplest way I can explain it is that we are on a train following this immense circular railway. When the train reaches the point where it started, it is about to plunge into the past, but this is impossible because the point where it started is simply the caboose of the train. And that point is always ahead, and behind, the time train. 
Now, my idea was that with the proper stimulus, a man could be thrust across the diameter of this circular railway to a point in his past. Because of the nature of time, he could neither go ahead of the train to meet the future, nor could he stand still and let the caboose catch up with him. But he could detour across the circle and land farther back on the train. And that, my dear Dave, is what you and I and Major have done. Almost. Almost, Miller said hoarsely. Erickson pursed his lips. We are somewhere part way across the space between present and past. We are living in an instant that can move neither forward nor back. You and I, Dave, and Major, and the Lord knows how many others the world over, had been thrust by my time and pulser onto a timeless beach of eternity. We had been caught in time's backwash. Castaways, you might say. An objection clamored for attention in Nora's mind. But if this is so, where are the rest of them? Where is my wife? They are right here, Erickson explained. No doubt you could see your wife if you could find her. But we see them as statues because, for us, time no longer exists. But there was something I did not count on. I did not know that it would be possible to live in one small instant of time, as we are doing. And I did not know that only those who are hovering between life and death can deviate from the normal process of time. You mean, we're dead? Miller's voice was a bitter monotone. Obviously not. We're talking and moving, aren't we? But we are on the fence. When I gave my impulsor the jolt of high power, it went wrong and I think something must have happened to me. At the same instant, you had shot yourself. Perhaps, Dave, you are dying. The only way for us to find out is to try to get the machine working and topple ourselves one way or the other. If we fall back, we will all live. If we fall into the present, we may die. Either way, it's better than this, Miller said fervently. I came to the library here, hoping to find out the things I must know. My own books are locked in my study, and these, they might be cemented in their places for all they're used to me. I suppose we might as well go back to the lab. Miller nodded, murmuring. Maybe you'll get an idea when you look at the machine again. Let's hope so, said Erickson grimly. God knows I failed so far. Chapter 3 Splendid Sacrifice It was a solid hour's walk out to West Wilshire, where the laboratory was. The immense bronze and glass doors of Wanamaker Institute were closed, and so barred to the two men. But Erickson led the way down the side. We can get in a service door. Then we climb through transoms and ventilators until we get to my lab. Major frisked along beside them. He was enjoying the action and the companionship. It was less of an adventure to Miller, who knew death might be ahead for the three of them. Two workmen were moving a heavy cabinet in the side service door. To get in, they climbed up the back of the rear workman, walked across the cabinet, and scaled down the front of the leading man. They went up the stairs to the 15th floor. Here they crawled through a transom into the wing part, experimental, and are only by appointment. Major was helped through it, then they were crawling along the dark metal tunnel of an air conditioning ventilator. It was small, and took some wriggling. In the next room, they were confronted by a stern receptionist on whose desk was a little brass sign reading, Have you an appointment? Miller had had his share of experience with the receptionist's ways in his days as a pharmaceutical salesman. He took the greatest pleasure now in lighting his cigarette from a match stuck on the girl's nose. Then he blew the smoke in her face and hastened to crawl through the final transom. John Erickson's laboratory was well lighted by a glass brick wall and a huge skylight. The sun's rays glinted on the time impulsor. The scientist explained the impulsor in concise terms. When he had finished, Dave Miller knew just as little as before, and the outfit still resembled three transformers in a line, of the type seen on power poles, connected to a great bronze globe hanging from the ceiling. There's the monster that put us in this plight, Erickson grunted. Too strong to be legal, too weak to do the job right. Take a good look. With his hands jammed in his pockets, he frowned at the complex machinery. Miller stared a few moments, then transferred his interests to other things in the room. He was immediately struck by the resemblance of a transformer in a far corner to the ones linked up with the impulsor. What's that? he asked quickly. Looks the same as the ones you used over there. It is. But 
Didn't you say all you needed was another stage of power? That's right. Maybe I'm crazy, Miller stared from Impulsor to Transformer and back again. Why don't you use it, then? Using what for the connection? Erickson's eyes gently mocked him. Wire, of course. The scientist jerked a thumb at a small bale of heavy copper wire. Bring it over and we'll try it. Miller was halfway to it when he brought up short. Then a sheepish grin spread over his features. I get it, he chuckled. That bale of wire might be the Empire State Building as far as we're concerned. Forgive my stupidity. Erickson suddenly became serious. I'd like to be optimistic, Dave, he muttered. But in all fairness to you, I must tell you I see no way out of this. The machine is, of course, still working, and with that extra stage of power, the uncertainty would be over. But where, in this world of immovable things, will we find a piece of wire twenty-five feet long? There was a warm, moist sensation against Miller's hand, and when he looked down, Major stared up at him commiseratingly. Miller scratched him behind the ear, and the dog closed his eyes, reassured and happy. The young druggist sighed, wishing there were some giant hand to scratch him behind the ear and smooth his troubles over. And if we don't get out, he said soberly, we'll starve, I suppose. No, I don't think it will be that quick. I haven't felt any hunger. I don't expect to. After all, our bodies are still living in one instant of time, and a man can't work up a healthy appetite in one second. Of course, this elastic second business precludes the possibility of disease. Our bodies must go on unchanged. The only hope I see is, when we are on the verge of madness, suicide. That means jumping off a bridge, I suppose. Poison, guns, knives, all the usual wherewithal are denied to us. Black despair closed down on Dave Miller. He thrust it back, forcing a crooked grin. Let's make a bargain, he offered. When we finish fooling around with this apparatus, we split up. We'll only be at each other's throat if we stick together. I'll be blaming you for my plight, and I don't want to. It's my fault as much as yours. How about it? John Erickson gripped his hand. You're all right, Dave. Let me give you some advice. If ever you do get back to the present, keep away from liquor. Liquor and the Irish never did mix. You'll have that store on its feet again in no time. Thanks, Miller said fervently. And I think I can promise that nothing less than a whiskey antidote for snake bite will ever make me bend an elbow again. For the next couple of hours, despondency reigned in the laboratory, but it was soon to be deposed again by hope. Despite all of Erickson's scientific training, it was Dave Miller himself who grasped the down-to-earth idea that started them hoping again. He was walking about the lab, jingling keys in his pocket, when suddenly he stopped short. He jerked the ring of keys into his hand. Erickson, he gasped. We've been blind. Look at this. The scientist looked, but he remained puzzled. Well, he asked skeptically. There's our wire, Dave Miller exclaimed. You've got keys. I've got keys. We've got coins, knives, wristwatches. Why can't we lay them all end to end? Erickson's features looked as if he had been electrically shocked. You've hit it, he cried. If we've got enough... With one accord, they began emptying their pockets, tearing off wristwatches, searching for pencils. The finds made a little heap in the middle of the floor. Erickson let his long fingers claw through thinning hair. God give us enough. We'll only need the one wire. The thing is plugged in already, and only the positive pole has to be connected to the globe. Come on. Scooping up the assortment of metal articles, they rushed across the room. With his pocket knife, Dave Miller began breaking up the metal wristwatch straps, opening the links out so that they could be laid end-to-end for the greatest possible length. They patiently broke the watch to pieces, and of the junk they garnered made a ragged foot and a half of wire. Their coins stretched the line still further. They had ten feet covered before the stuff was half used up. Their metal pencils, taken apart, gave them a good two feet. Keychains helped generously. With eighteen feet covered, their progress began to slow down. Perspiration poured down Miller's face. Desperately, he tore off his lodge ring and cut it in two to pound it flat. From garters and suspenders, they won a few inches more. And then, they stopped, feet from their goal. Miller groaned. He tossed his pocket knife in his hand. We can get a foot out of this, he estimated, but that still leaves us way short. 
Abruptly, Erickson snapped his fingers. Shoes, he gasped. They're full of nails. Get to work with that knife, Dave. We'll cut out every one of them. In ten minutes, the shoes were reduced to ragged piles of tattered leather. Erickson's deft fingers painstakingly placed the nails, one by one, in the line. The distance left to cover was less than six inches. He lined up the last few nails. Then both men were sinking back on their heels as they saw there was a gap of three inches to cover. Beaten, Erickson ground out. By three inches. Three inches from the present, and yet it might as well be a million miles. Miller's body felt as though it were in a vise. His muscles ached with strain. So taut were his nerves that he leaped as though stung when Major nuzzled a cool nose into his hand again. Automatically, he began to stroke the dog's neck. Well, that licks us, he muttered. There isn't another piece of movable metal in the world. Major kept whimpering and pushing against him. Annoyed, the druggist shoved him away. No way, he muttered. I don't feel like... Suddenly, then, his eyes widened, as his touch encountered warm metal. He whirled. There it is, he yelled, the last link, the nameplate on Major's collar. In a flash, he had torn the little rectangular brass plate from the dog collar. Erickson took it from his grasp. Sweat stood shiny on his skin. He held the bit of metal over the gap between wire and pole. This is it, he smiled brittlely. We're on our way, Dave. Where, I don't know. To death or back to life. But we're going. The metal clanked into place. Live, writhing power leaped through the wire, snarling across partial breaks. The transformers began to hum. The humming grew louder. Singing softly, the bronze globe over their heads glowed green. Dave Miller felt a curious lightness. There was a snap in his brain, and Erickson, Major, and the laboratory faded from his senses. Then came an interval when the only sound was the soft sobbing he had been hearing as if in a dream. That and blackness that enfolded him like soft velvet. Then Miller was opening his eyes to see the familiar walls of his own kitchen around him. Someone cried out, Dave! Oh, Dave, dear! It was Helen's voice, and it was Helen who cradled his head in her lap and bent her face close to his. Oh, thank God that you're alive! Helen, Miller murmured. What are you doing here? I couldn't go through with it. I... I just couldn't leave you. I came back in, and I heard the shot and ran in. The doctor should be here. I called him five minutes ago. Five minutes? How long has it been since I shot myself? Oh, just six or seven minutes. I called the doctor right away. Miller took a deep breath. Then it must have been a dream. All that, to happen in a few minutes, it wasn't possible. How... How could I have botched the job, he muttered. I wasn't drunk enough to miss myself completely. Helen looked at the huge revolver lying in the sink. Oh, that old forty-five of grandfather's. It hasn't been loaded since the Civil War. I guess the powder got damp or something. It just sort of sputtered instead of exploding properly. Dave, promise me something. You won't ever do anything like this again if I promise not to nag you? Dave Miller closed his eyes. There won't be any need to nag, Helen. Some people take a lot of teaching, but I've had my lesson. I've got ideas about the store which I've been too lazy to try out. You know, I feel more like fighting right now than I have for years. We'll lick them, won't we, honey? Helen buried her face in the hollow of his shoulder and cried softly. Her words were too muffled to be intelligible, but Dave Miller understood what she meant. He had thought the whole thing a dream, John Erickson, the time enforcer, and Major. But that night he read an item in the evening courier that was to keep him thinking for many days. Police investigate death of scientist here in laboratory. John M. Erickson, director of the Wanamaker Institute, died at his work last night. Erickson was a beloved and valuable figure in the world of science, famous for his recently publicized a time-lapse theory. Two strange circumstances surrounded his death. One was the presence of a German shepherd dog in the laboratory, its head crushed as if with a sledgehammer. The other was a small chain of metal objects stretching from one corner of the room to the other, as if intended to take the place of wire in a circuit. 
Police, however, discount this idea, as there was a roll of wire only a few feet from the body. The End End of the Day Time Stopped Moving by Bradner Butner The Undetected by George O. Smith This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Undetected by George O. Smith Nothing can possibly be more baffling than a crime in a sealed room. But what if the investigator happens to have an open mind? Chapter One I took a quick look around the apartment, even though I already knew what I had to know. Gordon Andrews had been slain in his sleep by a quick thrust of some rapier-like instrument. There was no sign of any struggle. The wall safe stood with its door open and its contents missing. Every door and window was closed, locked, burglar-bugged, and non-openable from the inside. The front door had been forced by the police— Furthermore, it had been raining in wind-whipped torrents for hours, yet there was no trace of moisture on any of the floors. Of course, no one had heard a sound, and naturally there were no fingerprints. Police Chief Weston spied me and snapped, "'What do you make of it, Schnell?' I shrugged and said, "'Completely sealed room.' "'Got any ideas?' he demanded. I had a lot of ideas, but I was not going to express myself without a lot of stark evidence." I do not yearn to have the prefix X installed in front of my title of Captain of Detectives. I'm much too young to be retired. So instead of trying to explain, I said, The modus operandi is... Chief Weston snorted. Schnell, there isn't a clue in the whole damn building, and yet you stand there and yap about modus operandi. That's the point, Chief. The cluelessness is itself the modus operandi that points to, You talk as if we had a whole file of unsolved, clueless, sealed room homicides. Chief, I said, a true perfect crime would be one in which no clue existed, including the fact of the crime itself, except those clues that were deliberately planned by the perpetrator for some purpose of his own. He glowered at me. What are you driving at, Schnell? I'm trying to convince you that we are faced with a very clever criminal mind, I said. A man with a fine talent, one who plans his crimes so well that they aren't even recognized as criminal. Nonsense! You can't conceal any crime forever. Forever isn't necessary, Chief. Just long enough to cover up completely, to remove all connection. We don't know how many bank tellers have been running on reduced salary because they somehow paid out a hundred in cashing a ten-dollar check. We couldn't demand an audit of all the big financial accounts in town to know the why and wherefore of the transfer of any sum of money larger than the limit of petty larceny. But now you're talking about a sly, clever operator, Schnell. This is a plain case of homicide and burglary. Plain? Was he kidding himself? I smiled crookedly. Chief, there is no doubt in my mind that our crook intended to clean out Gordon Andrews' safe without disturbing a soul. But the imminent awakening of Andrews presented a physical threat that had to be silenced immediately. So that is the work of your sly thief. Chief, just remember that Gordon Andrews was an eccentric old sourpuss who hated to do business with bankers. Now let's suppose that Andrews had awakened in the morning to find his safe cleaned out. He screeches for the cops. We come a-roaring in with the fingerprint detail and the safe specialists and the break-in experts. We find... I said with a wave of my hand. Everything just as we found it here and now. So we look Gordon Andrews in the eye and tell him that no one could get in, no one had gotten in, and that we suspect him of cleaning out his own safe and yelling copper to make trouble for the mayor and the commissioner who refused to appoint him a special detail of city employees for bodyguards last year. Go on, Schnell, said Chief Weston with deadly patience. The homicide was a spur-of-the-moment necessity. Had it been planned, the crook would have plugged Andrews with the old man's personal banker's special, which he kept on the bedside table and made it look like suicide. Know a lot about Andrews, don't you, Schnell? What do you mean, Chief? About the banker's special. I have an excellent memory, I said. Andrews had a license for the thing. The serial number is 
233-467-819, and the gun and license were acquired on August 7, 1951. The chief sarcastically grunted, Has it been fired since? It was fired six times at the date of delivery by the police laboratory for the landmark records, I said. Let's not try being funny, Schnell. This is a serious business. Andrews was an eccentric old curmudgeon, but he was also a philanthropist, and the papers will be after our throats if we don't come up with this super criminal. He's going to be damned tough, Chief. Okay, this is your project. Nothing else matters until he's caught and convicted of homicide committed during the course of grand robbery, meaning automatic hot seat. I nodded slowly. Just remember, Schnell, the whole department's behind you, Chief Weston assured me. I continued to nod, but his assurance didn't reassure me in the least. With about 98% of the general public still not quite willing to accept rockets, missiles, and space travel, I had a fat chance of convincing anybody that a telepath had kept guard over the slumbering mind of Gordon Andrews, while a perceptive solved the combination to the wall safe so that a kinematic could twirl the dial, that the imminent awakening of Gordon Andrews had indeed been an imminent physical threat to a delicate extrasensory undertaking, and that therefore he had been silenced by a kinematic with a weapon located by the perceptive after warning from the telepath, after which the criminal had continued, with the loot being floated by a levitator along a freeway explored by the perceptive, and scouted by the telepath, and cleared of barriers by the kinematic who opened and debugged them as he went along, and that the real topper for this whopper was that this operation was not the integrated effort of a clever gang of extrasensory specialists, but rather the single-handed accomplishment of one highly talented Psy-man. A Psy-man ruthless enough to kill before he would permit his victim to watch the turning dial, the floating loot, the opening portal— simply because there stood a probability that one of the two billion persons on Earth might suspect the phenomena as parapsychical activity instead of the hallucinatory ravings of a rich old eccentric who hated the incumbent political party. How best to keep a secret? Let no one suspect that any secret exists. Chapter 2 The rain was still coming down in wind-whipped torrents that slatted along the avenue in drenching sheets. Huddled in the scant cover of the apartment door was a girl of about eighteen. The raincoat she wore was no protection. The wind drove rain right up under it. Womanlike, she was struggling with the ruins of a fashionable little umbrella instead of abandoning it for the tangled mess that it was. She looked at me as I opened the door. She was without guile. She was wet and miserable and determined to take whatever help was proffered and hope afterward that no unfair advantage would be taken of the situation. I showed her my ID card, and she read, Howard Schnell, Captain Special Detail. Her face changed from cautious immobility to a sort of wet animation, and she added, as if it were important under the circumstances to be completely open, I'm Florence Wood. I took the ruined umbrella from her unresisting hand and stood it in the foyer for the janitor to dispose of, and pointed out across the rain-ponded sidewalk to the police car. It was almost high noon, but the rain was so heavy that the identity of the car was by no means conspicuous from the apartment door. Florence Wood nodded as if she caught sight of it. I said, "'Now I'll make a run for it and open the door and get in first, so that I'll be on the driver's side. As soon as I'm out of your way, just dive in and don't worry about closing the door until you're out of this rain. Catch?' She nodded. I'd play Sir Galahad and give you my foul-weather gear to wear, I said, but you're already so wet that it wouldn't do more than keep the water in. She smiled at me understandingly. Then she looked at me with curiosity because I was standing there waiting instead of making my dash immediately. I thought of how my Psy-man could have floated the loot out of an open window and kept the rain from soaking the floor at the same time. So to make conversation, I said— I'm waiting until my willpower builds up enough to overcome the forces of gravity, barometric pressure, and the rest of whatever goes into the making of a howling downpour like this. Considering that nature is dissipating energy equal to a couple of hundred atom bombs per second, it takes a bit of time to collect the necessary amount of mental power. Florence Wood laughed, 
In mere instants she changed from weather-drenched misery to a cheerful sort of discomfort no worse than many human has endured for hours at a football game. She said with amusement, "'Captain Schnell, why don't you start the car and drive it over here? It seems to me that it would take less power than stopping this storm.' law says that it's considered unlawful to operate a motor vehicle from any position other than the driver's seat, I replied. When the slack in the storm I'd been anticipating finally arrived, I took advantage of it to make my run across the sidewalk. Miss Wood followed. Her timing was perfect. Everything happened in a continuous sequence without a stoppage at any point. The door opened and I went in, landing hard and bouncing deliberately on the seat springs to hunch myself over. Miss Wood landed and whirled in a flurry of wet skirt and clammy raincoat, hauling one rain-booted ankle out of the way as the door swung closed with a solid and satisfying thunk. I started the car and let the engine idle to warm up and dry it off. Then I said, Part of my duty to the citizen includes protection of his health and comfort as well as protection from unlawful behavior. So, where do you wish to be taken? She regarded me out of clear gray eyes. "'Don't you know?' she asked with a quirk at the corner of her mouth. "'Do I look like a mind-reader?' "'Well, you did slow down the storm.' I laughed. "'Miss Wood, King Canute would have been a hero instead of a bum if he'd waited until high water before he told the tide to stop. Now, what have you any reason to suppose that I am endowed with special talents?' Well, she said, fumbling through her handbag for the comb, which naturally was at the bottom, you did come along when I needed help, and you did identify yourself when I so much wanted to know. And since I also remembered that storms as violent as this also have lulls you put two and two together, well, it doesn't require telepathy to conclude that you are soaked to the skin, and that you need and want help, and that— You'd prefer to know just whom you are driving off in a car with. Any other ideas about my talents? Well, I should think— Address first, Miss Wood. She gave me an address in a residential district that was the maximum distance one could get from City Hall and still enjoy the privilege of paying city taxes. I started the car and headed in that direction. Then I said, Now, Miss Wood, let's go on with your little fancy. Fancy? You've been moonbeaming about a little courtroom drama where twelve good telepaths and true are reading the mental testimony of a witness who had located some vital bit of evidence by perception and brought it to light by kinematic power. Well, does it seem that any truly gifted person would work for the good of humanity? I doubt that being gifted with a sense of perception would automatically endow a man with a sense of honor. But doesn't it seem just awful to think of anything as miraculous as telepathy being used for for she was trying to avoid the word immoral because she was of an age and experience that felt sensitive about its use unfortunately the only substitute was the word sin i came to her rescue it's deplorable but true that nothing was ever developed for the benefit of mankind without a few sharpshooters quickly figuring out some way to make it pay them a dishonest buck but it would be frightfully hard to bamboozle a telepathic policeman, wouldn't it? She asked, hopefully. I thought of my psi man, whose only mistake in the sealed room murder of Gordon Andrews had been in being so good that he'd actually disclosed the existence of a criminal who employed psi faculties. Wouldn't that depend on whether the policeman or the criminal was the more talented? I parried. But that supposes that the police force would have a corps of psi policemen. Wouldn't they? Honey child, I said, at the first thin hint that the commissioner was even interested in the possibility of hiring someone who knew what the term parapsychic phenomena really meant, there would be a universal howl against thought police so loud that it would shatter the polar ice caps. But why? she asked, bewildered. They'd start screaming about invasion of privacy, incite the Bill of Rights, and that would be that. You mean that the law has laws against telepathy? No. It doesn't say anything about telepathy, I admitted, knowing what was to come next. Well, then? Don't sound so superior, Miss Wood. At the first attempt, the law would discover that it had a hell of a lot to say about telepathy and perception, since they definitely affect the interpretation of the Fourth and Fifth Amendments. 
I know the fifth, she said. But how about the fourth? Unreasonable and unwarranted search, I told her. But isn't a man guilty when he's guilty? I wish it were as simple as that. But why isn't it? Little Miss Wood, you are now asking me to solve an ethical question that's been unanswered for more than ten thousand years. I smiled wistfully. I'm not, I repeat, not. Big enough to answer the following question. Shall a killer in the confessional who has been given absolution by his God subsequently be punished by his fellow man? But what has that to do with it? Well, let's have you answer one. Could you truly bear your secret soul to God if you suspected that some prying human being was taking it all down on a tape recorder? No, I suppose not. Then our thought police would be standing as a human barrier between any man and his God. I suppose so. But couldn't I tell? Tell? Tell whether someone was listening to my thoughts. That was another stumper. Does a sign wear out any faster if it's read? Can a radio transmitter be measured to tell whether the broadcast has any audience? Does the tree that falls in the forest barren of animal life generate the same wave motion as it would if all the leaves were replaced by active eardrums? There are lots of analogs, but are any of them valid? I said, If I cry out, how can I know whether I'm being heard? And in my mind I made my own reply. I thought in deep concentration. How do you read me, Simon? The response was zero, zero, and it meant nothing. My Simon could have been following my every thought from the moment that my ringing telephone summoned me to Gordon Andrews' apartment to the present instant, so far as I could tell. There was no feeling of intrusion, no feeling of presence. Chapter 3 Florence Wood giggled. "'Going to stop the rain again, Captain Schnell?' The storm was still howling. In the near suburbs, the rain came in more gracefully draped sheets, and the wind was not whirlpooled by the flu-like canyons between the buildings, but residential rainwater is just as wet per cubic centimeter as the metropolitan variety. "'Maybe I should drive up over the lawn,' I suggested. "'Daddy would blow a fuse. We might wait for it to let up.' I'd rather not, she said soberly. It's one thing to be driven home in a strange car during a cloudburst, but it's something else to sit out here making it look like as if I were paying off by making out. It came as a pleasant surprise that she did not consider me a superannuated gaffer, and it was her youth that allowed her to discuss parapsychic phenomena without the tongue-in-cheek attitude of the older know-it-alls. I considered Florence Wood and realized that she was at least old enough so that I wouldn't be judged for cradle-robbing so long as I had a parental acceptance. And I did want someone to talk out the business of psionics without having someone wind me in a sheet and ship me to a shrinker. And so I said, If it will smooth things out a bit, I'll umbrella you to the door and make official explanation to the stern and anxious parent. That we'll enjoy, she giggled. Daddy always says that he doesn't have to be a mind-reader to advise against what my boyfriends have in mind. It'll be fun to face him with a policeman. Darkly, I said, most folks don't look upon me as the fun-loving type. Policemen aren't always welcome, you know. Oh, Daddy will enjoy it. He writes a bit. He'll never be another Ellery Queen, but he will enjoy talking to a real-life captain of detectives. At this point, a lot of the favorable things took place at once, such as the arrival of another convenient let-up in the storm, the mad rush and the ringing of the doorbell, the opening of the door and some gasped instructions as we stood in a little hallway dripping puddles of rainwater on a small rug. Police, Captain. Howard Schnell. But Florence isn't... I laughed at Mrs. Wood. Not at all. This is just a rescue of a very wet maiden in distress. When we're not shooting bank robbers, we also help little old ladies and lovely young girls across streets. All in the day's work, you know. Mrs. Wood hauled Florence off, saying something about hot showers and dry clothing, while Mr. Wood regarded me with interest. He beat all the way around the bush, trying to ascertain without actually asking point-blank whether I could spend a few moments, and if so, would I like a drink? One must not anticipate, so I waited until he'd made his meaning clear. Then I accepted his offer of some bourbon, 
refused his offer of a cigar, and settled myself into the chair he waved at. I tasted the highball, smiled in approval, and opened the conversation by saying, "'Your daughter tells me that you write, Mr. Wood.' He smiled wistfully. "'Well, I'm not at the stage where mere announcement that I am working on a novel causes an immediate publication sale of seventy thousand copies. You see, I'm still trying to work out a good association gimmick.' "'A what?' An association gimmick. The name Earl Stanley Gardner, for instance, always means a story about Perry Mason and the inevitable courtroom scene full of legal fireworks. Rex Stout has his Nero Wolf, the fabulous detective who lets his secretary do all the work. And, I added, John Dixon Carr writes about Gideon Fell, who is an expert in solving sealed room mysteries. Exactly, he said. I have a series of gimmicks all planned, but I really need a strong, out-of-the-ordinary character to go along with them. You see, I propose to write a series of stories about perfect crimes. I'm not smart, I said. I've always assumed that the so-called perfect crime would be the one in which the criminal walks off scot-free with the loot under one arm and the girl on the other. He said, "'From your point of view, a true perfect crime would be one in which no clue existed, including the fact of the crime itself, except those clues that were deliberately planned by the perpetrator for some purpose of his own. That is your own angle, isn't it?' I nodded. Indeed it was, and it had been expressed in precisely the same words that I had used in speaking to Chief Weston. However, he went on blandly, you'll agree that a clue is usually the result of a mistake, or failure to plan completely, or the result of some accidental circumstance. Right. But in a perfect crime, there would be no error, no mistake. Yes, but aren't you backing yourself into a hole that you've lined with fish hooks yourself? Not at all, he replied. Clues must be cleverly contrived, created, and established in such a way that the episode is ultimately known to be the crime and not labeled misadventure, suicide, or the like. Otherwise, he said with a genial smile, we are writing about a perfectly justifiable homicide instead of a perfect crime. I nodded again. And of course, he finished, these clues must also provide precisely the correct amount of information that the motive of the criminal is not only fulfilled, but exposed, if not to one of the characters in the book, at least to the reader. Mr. Wood relaxed and sipped his own drink. From somewhere aloft, a number of individually insignificant traces added up to fairly reliable evidence that Florence and Mrs. Wood were about to return— I gathered that the cross-questioning had allayed any parental suspicion. I said, One thing you haven't mentioned, and paused for effect. To the Hindu, perfection means the inclusion of an almost imperceptible flaw, so that its maker cannot be accused of presuming to be as good as God. Is your perfect crime to be perfect in the eyes of the criminal, or in the eyes of the police? He said, Ah, Captain Schnell! That is indeed one of my bothersome problems. Mrs. Wood came into the room, followed by Florence. The girl had lost the soaked gammon look. She was transformed by modern alchemy into a poised young woman who forced me to revise my estimated eighteen several years upward. She nodded affably at her father, smiled at me, and then came over because she noticed that my highball glass was empty. I thanked her, and she smiled wide and bright as she asked, has Dad even given you the details of his impossible bandit? Well, in a way, Mr. Wood said, I'm sort of like the standard television father, incapable of adding two and two without the close supervision of the female members of my family. I, that is, we, keep telling Daddy he should hire Superman for a hero. You've changed, chuckled Mr. Wood. Changed? 
Yesterday, you advocated that I hire a detective with telepathy and a sense of perception. We discussed it on the way home," said Florence. "Superman?" I asked. "No, this extrasensory business," said Florence. Mister Wood inquired, "Are you interested in parapsychology, Captain Schnell?" "I've been interested in the subject for a good many years," I answered. "Would the public accept it?" I wonder," he mused. Mrs. Wood said, "A lot of people read psychic books." Mister Wood said plaintively. I don't want to write psychic books. I want to write whodunits. But it would solve my problem, wouldn't it? My series would consist of crimes that would be perfect, except for the introduction of a master of psionics who tells the story in the first person singular and who solves the crime by parapsychic power. It might read better if you made your extrasensory character the criminal. I suggested. He shook his head. Wouldn't do at all. A criminal with extrasensory talent would always win out over the police. There have been only a very few successful stories written in which the criminal got away. Maybe he wouldn't. I said. But how could he possibly fail? He might get sloppy. Sloppy. Mind reading every anticipated move. Or bored. Bored. One often leads to the other. I told him with a smile, which is just my policeman's way of thinking. From the policeman's point of view, you're overlooking one rather important angle. Indeed. Well, you must tell me all about it. Okay, I said. My point is that you should not view this as a single incident in the life of an extrasensory who has turned his talent to crime, but rather take the overall view. For instance. We can write the life history of our psi man in broad terms. As a schoolboy, he was considered extraordinarily lucky at games of chance and skilled in games of manual dexterity. He stood high in his schoolwork and at the same time managed to do it without working very hard. By the time he enters high school, he realizes that his success is due to some sort of sensing of when things will be right. This increases the efficiency of his talent, and he surges forward and would have become top class if he hadn't discovered that brilliance in recitation made up for a lack of handed-in homework. In other words, nothing stands as a real challenge to him. His talents surmount the obstacles that confront his fellow man. He could collect corporations or be a labor leader, president or bum. Anything he wants can be gotten without much fuss. Our psi man is primarily interested in a statistical income sufficient to support him to the dictates of his ambition. The trick is to achieve, say, twenty grand per annum in such a way that the manipulation is never discovered. At first, our psi man plans meticulously, but soon this process seems unnecessary because the poor ignorant homo saps don't even know they're being conned. He has no hard surface against which to wet his nervous edge. And so he begins to play games. He leaves clues at first to ascertain the true level of his fellow man's intelligence and ability. Next, he leaves conflicting clues to see which way the poor dopes will jump. In a world that scoffs at parapsychic phenomena, he leaves clues to support the theory that only an extrasensory criminal could have done the dastardly deed. Will one of the ignorant apes recognize the truth? If he does. He will be in a high position, or will he be one of the diligent ones who fetch coffee for the guy in the upper office? If the work of a psi man is recognized, how will our bright policeman go about it, and what will he do with the evidence after it's been shown to him? And so, Mister Wood, our psi man criminal has become bored because there is no one in the world to challenge him, and he gets sloppy through his growing contempt for the ant-like activities of his fellow creatures. At last, he shows himself deliberately taunting them to take action against him, and that I concluded with a nod at him, might be the perfect crime in which your extrasensory criminal finally exposes himself. But why, Mrs. Wood asked in perplexity, would such a talented person turn to crime? Or do you think that all extrasensory people? I turned to smile at her. Mrs. Wood, I was not speaking of extrasensory people as a statistical body. I was referring to one particular character. 
I find him hard to believe in. On the contrary, my dear, said Mr. Wood, Captain Schnell has drawn an amazingly accurate thumbnail sketch of our Psy Man, and I dare say that he could go on and on, filling in more minute details. Oh, yes, indeed, I said. But I must leave it up to the professional writer to tell what the brilliant policeman does when he recognizes the work as that of an extrasensory. For instance, does he become bold enough to mention it to Chief Weston or to Commissioner Stone, or will he confine his discussion to the company of a rain-soaked young woman so circumstantially available and coincidentally willing to discuss psionics? Captain Schnell breathed Florence Wood. What on earth are you talking about? Your father, I said. Mr. Wood stepped into the breach. Captain Schnell was dramatizing for your benefit, I'm sure, because Captain Schnell knows very well how impossible it is to surprise a telepath into revealing himself. Florence Wood's expression changed to a mildly bothered smile. It certainly sounded as if he were accusing you of something. You mean, like, mind-reading? He asked with a big belly laugh that closed the subject. Chapter 4 By most of the rules of society, both Mr. Wood and I were guilty of gross gentility. He greeted me overtly as the welcome guest and needled me with a show of patronizing tolerance, as he implied that my basic interest was in Florence. To match him, I accepted his hospitality and made use of the proximity to spy on him and his family. There are ways and means of making a pretended deaf-mute reveal himself. The human being does not live who will not leap halfway out of his skin at the shock of an unexpected revolver shot, no matter how well trained he is at feigning deafness. As for surprising a telepath, I knew it wouldn't work, but I had to try it anyway. I put both Mrs. Wood and Florence through a number of mental hurdles. To this, Mr. Wood took a quietly tolerant attitude. He understood and was prepared to accept as healthily normal a certain amount of lust and carnal conjecture in the minds of males who were interested in his daughter. He forgave me for mentally insulting his wife because he knew that my mental peregrinations were only aimed at determining whether his wife was telepathic. Finally, he came out flatly and told me to stop wasting my effort, because neither Florence nor Mrs. Wood had a trace of extrasensory power. Their lack of shocked or outraged response was not a case of the well-trained telepath divining my intention and planning a blank response. Furthermore, Mr. Wood asserted that neither of them knew of his extrasensory faculty, that he fully intended to keep it that way, and that I should know damned well that such stunts wouldn't work in the first place. And so I continued to enjoy a dinner now and then, and occasionally the company of Florence. Ultimately, the lack of progress brought Chief Weston's nervous system to the blow-up point. He called me in, and I went, knowing that trouble cannot always be avoided, and when it can't, it's just plain sense to kick out the props and have done with it. He plowed right in. And what in hell have you been doing? Chief, I've been... You put a makeup team on some half-baked writer named Wood. Edward Hazlitt. Because, he yelled, the first person you saw when you stuck your nose out of Gordon Andrew's apartment was Florence Wood. Well, Chief, you see... You perhaps suspected that she just walked through the wall of that apartment, and naturally you pulled out your hip pocket crime laboratory and checked that umbrella tip for blood stains before you threw it aside. Well, you see, Schnell, would you have been so damned gallant if she'd been an ugly old hag in a ratty dress carrying a dead halibut wrapped in an old newspaper? But you see, so you leap into gallant action, and after you rescued the fair maiden from her watery grave, you suddenly find it desirable to use a department automobile to deliver the damsel home. But, Schnell, I bet that wood girl wasn't any wetter than you were, and that's how you put the long arm of coincidence to work? It was more than coincidence. Florence Wood had been in that soaking rain and whipping wind for more than an hour. Any housewife would have corroborated my statement that only a prolonged soaking 
can achieve a truly wet-through-the-seams condition. Oh, Daddy Wood was just the guy to think of a stunt like saturating the seams and fibers of his daughter's clothing by agitating the water supersonically at high amplitude. But let's face it, that would have beaten hell out of her soft white skin. As for the umbrella, the wound could have indeed been made by a rapier-like thrust. But a comparison between the depth of the wound and the length of the tip showed that the bottom of the wound could not have been reached without forcing part of the umbrella itself into the victim's body. The face of the wound showed no such outsized penetration, hence the umbrella was not the sought-for weapon. At this point, Chief Weston's telephone interrupted him, and he snatched it up, bellowed his name, and then listened. Finally, he snarled that it was for me, and fairly hurled the handset at me. I caught it at the end of its cord and said, "'Captain Schnell, special detail.' "'Oh, I know it's you, Captain Schnell,' said the suave voice of Edward Hazlitt Wood. "'I just wanted to tell you that your analysis of the umbrella's uselessness as evidence was quite brilliant, and your logic in the matter of my daughter's rain-soaked clothing was clever. I really don't regret the chewing out you are getting. You deserve it.' I was hoping to find you bright enough to avoid it. Anyway, can we expect you for dinner this evening? Yes, I snapped and hung up, thinking a few things that would have called for a terse reprimand about foul and abusive language if telepathy were administered by the Federal Communications Commission. Wood, snapped Chief Weston. Yes? Date, he snarled. I groaned. Wood did have that nasty telepath's ability to maneuver me into a situation that I could not conveniently avoid. When they start calling the office to pester you for dates, I know what I'm doing. So do I, he yelled. You're doing nothing. Listen, Chief, I'll admit the long arm of coincidence, but you'll have to admit that when there's trouble, I'm usually the first one to smell it. So how do you connect them up? Chief, I walk out of that apartment with your own words ringing in my ears. Looks like the classical setup for a perfect crime, you said. And then I meet this girl who just happens to have a father who writes whodunits and is planning a series of books based on the perfect crime. Maybe, sneered Chief Weston, the guy is a mind reader. I've given even that some consideration. So why he tell? Any objections, I asked. "'Objections! I got a lot of objections!' he howled. "'This is a police department, not a soothsayer's convention. "'We're subject enough to criticism as it is. "'You needn't have added the act that makes us look like a bunch of damned fools.' "'But, Chief, I—' "'So what do I hear tell?' "'He hauled the tray drawer of his desk open and pulled out one of the tabloids, "'open to one of its hate-everything columnists. "'Listen!' In recent years, the legality of the famous witchcraft trials of the past has been subject to debate, with the result that these past convictions have now been declared miscarriages of justice. Posthumously, I must unhappily add, however, there has been little or no amendment to the laws against witchcraft, wizardry, charms, amulets, and spells. But brace yourself, citizens. One of our younger and more brilliant captains of detectives has shown an interest recently in parapsychics and may be training to track down criminals by the application of extrasensory detection. If this be true, the laws will have to be raptured to permit him to secure evidence, since it is a tenet of the law that evidence must be secured through legal methods and processes. Fortune tellers of the world arise. You have nothing to lose but your crystal balls. Chief Weston slapped the paper down. What do you think of that? I said... He's just making noise. Telepathy has nothing in common with... I wish I could stop you from even thinking about telepathy. If you could, I said calmly, you'd have to be telepathic to determine when I had violated your dictum. And if you were telepathic, Chief, you'd have been on my side from the beginning. He merely glared at me. At this moment, I should have been expecting the worst and prepared to meet it. 
But please remember that there's always that mental block against prying, especially when the United States mail is concerned. But now Edward Hazlitt Wood was about to show me how a real extrasensory sharpshooter clobbers his enemies. Weston's secretary entered, carrying a package. I saw it, knew at once what it was, and groaned with despair. The only chance I saw of getting out of this was the forlorn hope that Weston would believe the package was a dig, probably mailed by the sniping columnist. It was cleverly contrived. The addressee's name had been blurred and half-obliterated so that it couldn't have been quietly dropped on my desk where I could have disposed of its damning contents quietly. It had, of course, come special delivery, urgent, immediate handling. If I were a believer in amulets, witches, and spells, I'd been of the opinion that an aura of urgency had been created about the box. Chief Weston's secretary handed to him with a mumbled suggestion that it seemed to be important, and perhaps it should be opened in hopes that the contents would convey information as to the identity of the owner. I said nothing. Inside the package was a fine crystal ball, a set of tarot cards with a thick book of explanations, and a second deck of cards, the like of which most people have heard but few have actually seen. These were the square, circle, wiggly line cards used in parapsychic research. There was the damning evidence of a packing slip with my name clearly printed on it, and a rubber stamp notation that the merchandise order had been accompanied by a prepaid postal note. The timing was perfect. The problem of keeping that package on schedule all the way from its point of origin to its devastating delivery must have taxed Wood's faculties, but he'd done it. Chief Weston's color rose visibly, and in a voice loud enough to be heard in Asbury Park, he yelled, Schnell, did you buy this? I was trapped. No matter what I said, it was calculated to get me into trouble. For in the petty cash box in the secretary's desk was a petty cash slip made out in an amount of $39.17 for a postal money order payable to the Aladdin Novelty Company of Bayon, New Jersey. The signature was good enough for me to accept it myself. All along the line it had been nicely legal, or would have been if I'd really signed that petty cash slip. If it came to an argument, I'd have to perform miracles to prove my innocence. Schnell, said Weston in a cold, level voice. You'll get me a lead on Gordon Andrews' murder by tomorrow night, or hand me your badge. I fumed in silence because there was nothing to say. Get out! As I closed the door behind me, I heard the crash of the crystal ball hitting the wall. Luckily, he hadn't hurled it at the glass panel in his office door. My own phone was ringing as I approached my desk. I picked it up wearily and said, "'Very clever, Mr. Wood. Very damned clever.' He said, "'Your basic difficulty, Captain Schnell, is that you have sworn to uphold the law and are compelled to employ its legal methods. You must always work within the framework of the law. You would not think of tampering with the United States mails, even to save yourself from an unjust charge.' Wood, if I make a single move outside of the law, you'll use it against me, won't you? I'm afraid that's the way it has to be. You play according to your rules, and I'll play according to mine. Well now, Mr. Wood, in our philosophy there may be strength. Remember, upon the day that the forces of law and order must violate their own concepts in order to affect their own ends, on that day law and order ceases to be the goal of honest men. "'Spoken like an idealist.' "'Hanging up a telephone is not polite, "'but in this case hanging up did not snap the link of communication. "'Chapter Five. "'An angry man is a poor fighter. "'I sat shuffling papers on my desk, "'half of my intellect raging helplessly. "'Finally I forced myself to sit and read the papers on the desk, "'even though I knew every word on every one of them.' One reported that Wood had been one of the less conspicuous partners in a very successful personnel placement agency. I could have added a penciled note that a telepath should make a very successful personnel manager. Another said that 
Florence Wood was employed as a safety deposit vault clerk in the Third National Bank. This didn't bother me. What the standard human gets out of staring at a solid phalanx of safety deposit boxes is a headache, not perceptive gained information. There was a medical report that Wood had undergone a mild coronary occlusion some months ago, which had hastened his retirement. I wondered whether his retirement had been hastened by a real coronary occlusion, or whether he'd used his extrasensory power to fake symptoms and control the doctor's instruments. Among the papers was a complete dissertation of the stab wound in Gordon Andrews' chest. There was no trace of any foreign body. The wound did not go all the way through the chest cavity. It was not clean-cut as if made by a sharpened weapon, but more like the semi-rounded end of an umbrella or a blunt, heavy spike. In the opinion of the medical examiner, the wound had been made with a rapid thrust, but it looked as if there had been no withdrawal. An inspection of the wound for traces of excess water, icicles, or carbon dioxide, dry ice, had failed to disclose any plausible weapon or projectile that could have evaporated or sublimed out of existence. I long to suggest that a test be made for air. If a kinematic can create pyrotic effects by agitation of the molecules and something to be ignited, a good kinematic could make Maxwell's deeming go to work for him, by compressing a volume of air into a thirty-eighth slug and projecting it at revolver velocity. And in the end I was not leafing the reports or reading them. I was really staring at the wall. Specifically, I was staring at the calendar without paying much attention to it, and as I came out of my reverie, I realized that I had been absorbed in a little red smudge on one of the dates. Association is a funny process. The combination of calendar and red blob stared at hazily had finally brought my mind around to thinking of February the 14th, which honors a patron saint who has absolutely nothing to do with Jimmy Valentine who was reputed to have been a very fast man with the combination of a safe, especially the type of safe that Gordon Andrews kept his money in because he did not trust banks, which may have been a good idea considering that Florence Wood worked in a bank vault and her father... I jumped out of my office chair, just as it tilted over backwards. If I hadn't jumped, I'd have split my skull on the radiator under the window behind me. A heavy brass-edged ruler came up from the desk and swung in a whistling saber swipe at my face. I ducked in time to let the cut pass over my head. It clipped a few upstanding hairs. When it reached the end of its stroke, I wrestled it out of Wood's control just to prove that an alert local force could exert more power than a distant kinematic force. Naturally, I could. Leverage, of course. Next came a metal-to-metal -metal clicking sound— it was the police positive in the upper left-hand corner of my desk. I thought strongly. Sigh, man, you lift that gun and fire it at me through the desk drawer, and the angle and everything will be enough evidence to change Weston's opinion from angry rejection of all psionics to a cold, calculated, vengeful agreement with everything I've suggested. The clicking stopped coming from the desk drawer and resumed in smaller kind from the little desk lock in the tray drawer of the desk. These desk locks can be picked with a bent hairpin, but picking takes time. Everything takes time. At any rate, it did indeed take Edward Hazlitt Wood a finite time to juggle the little brass tumblers, turn the main cylinder, retract the sliding bolt, withdraw the desk tray to unlatch the side drawers, pull open the upper left-hand drawer and extract my police positive from its holster with its mechanism entering the firing cycle, which itself takes time, by which time I'd vacated my office and was starting across the outer office floor in the brisk, stiff-legged walk of a man in a hurry to go a long way fast. Wood was stalled, I thought. Make like a poltergeist, Psy man, and convince everybody that you exist. The outer office was a bustle of the usual police activity, but Wood did not have the ability to invade another mind and take over, at least not one of the men in the office suddenly had a fit of homicidal mania with Captain Schnell listed as the first victim. And so I made Weston's office and shoved my head in through the outer door and yelled, Weston, Third National Bank, and make it fast! I turned and headed outside as Weston started the usual top brass routine of wanting to know all of the infinitely variable reasons why he should leave his office at all, let alone right now. 
with no one to fire delaying questions at and with a growing realization that he was not going to learn anything by sitting there in fulmination, he followed. I paid no more attention to him once I knew he was on his way. I had my own hands full. Considering the general reliability of the average internal combustion engine in the face of neglect, abuse, and the natural ravages of weather, the automobile engine is a brute force mechanism completely unable to support a psychosis. I was, however, appalled to discover just how many little thumb valves, levers, wires, doodads, cams, gizmos, and cadooties there are, each of which must be adjusted within ridiculously narrow limits before the so-called brute force mechanism will deign to turn a gear. But again, and luckily, making adjustments and maladjustments takes time, and by the logical rules of classical mechanics, the simple maladjusting turn of a screw valve takes no longer to return to adjustment, provided the restorer is as bright and quick as the wrecker. We worked our way through it like a pair of fencers or jujitsu professionals going through the formal ritual of opening their engagement. He fastened on the starting system, but I licked him cold on that one because the ignition key controls the starter relay switch and I could handle both with one hand. He tried to block the starting relay, but the armature had started before he arrived with his kinematic barrier and the solid mechanico-electrical power carried the armature home. He made a futile attempt to flummox up the laws of Mr. Ohm, but he did not have the power to prevent amperes from flowing from the battery into the starting motor. By the time he thought of gumming up the Bendix, the gear had meshed against the flywheel and the engine was turning over. He tried to flood the engine, but I held the choke valve just as I wanted it. He fiddled with the breaker points, and I blocked that until one of the cylinders fired. That kicked the whole engine into life and made the engine far too rapid to control, moving member by member. This caused his attention to turn to the needle valves, but as fast as he turned them out, I turned them back on again. He hit the choke again, and I parried his thrust. The engine kicked over, caught, spluttered, and backfired, and then went into an erratic running that smoothed out slightly as it warmed. I wasted no time. I kicked her into gear and took off in a jackrabbit start with my siren wailing. Exultantly, I thought, "'Can you hit a moving target, Psyman?' Yes, you can stop an internal combustion engine turning at 3,000 revolutions per minute by yanking off the ignition system, but not when your opponent is doing everything in his power to prevent you, and not when both of you are traveling at 60 or more miles per hour and you have a rougher driving course than he. My own siren was clearing my way, driving motorists to the shelter of the side streets and parking places and causing my fellow policemen to take charge blocks ahead to clear the path for the vehicle that had the right to exceed the city speed limit. My worthy opponent drove at sixty miles per hour at his own risk, trying to race me to the Third National Bank. Wood's extra-sensory driving was no better than mine. The traffic pattern was clear to both of us. But who would know better than a policeman what the average motorist will do in the face of an emergency? He took the time now and then to hurl something at me, but this was not very effective. If you think not, figure how many things you can see and use as weapons while driving at sixty. And two, he was also fighting the unfavorable end of a missile problem called terminal control, which simply states that any guided missile approaching its target is subject to greater and greater interference by the enemy as it gets closer. Wood's near misses I ignored with a disdain calculated to make him furious, and his near hits I blocked with an ease that proved my ability to outguess and outmaneuver him. I chuckled to myself, for Edward Hazlitt Wood had been played off balance. He committed the hysterical mistake of fighting me on my ground instead of his. He had thrust and I had parried and advanced, forcing him to thrust again before he could recover. He'd been fighting in the very odd position of conducting a vigorous offensive while backstepping an inexorable retreat. He should have run and run until he was clear enough to prepare a single telling blow. And so ultimately I came to the front of the Third National Bank in a screeching halt. I stepped under a falling cornice, neatly avoided a revolving door that tried to slice me, and sidestepped the bronze bust of Salmon P. Chase that toppled from its niche of honor above the door. I evaded the erratic rolling of a pencil 
and I trod with unerring step on a circular patch of invisible stuff that was as slippery as the proverbial frictionless lubricant. The slick flowed forward and down over the stairs as I hurried below. I held myself erect above it by sheer willpower. As I strode toward the safe deposit vault, I thought exultantly, You're outpointed, Psy Man. Chapter 6 Florence Wood looked up from her little desk and cried, Why, Captain Schnell, how nice to see you. Hello, I said with a smile. I hope you won't mind my company for a while. I'm not likely to go for a stroll in... Captain Schnell, don't. Seven and one-half tons of finely wrought and polished tool steel alloy swung on delicately balanced hinges, coming to rest with the metal-to-metal -metal sound of machine surfaces sliding into a perfect fit with its precision-matched receptacle. Its piston fit made a pressure on our eardrums. Then the automatic switches took over and motors whirred in solid muffled harmony as the massive bars slid out of their nests into the polished slots. The ponderous operation that sealed the two of us off from the outside world behind a barrier of drill-proof and burglar-proof and blast-proof solidity concluded not with the mechanical fanfare it deserved, but with a gentle little click that was as final as the word of God. Do that, gasped Floris Wood, weakly finishing her admonition. She stared at me. The knowledge that this bank vault door was equipped with a time lock that would not permit it to be opened except in the interval between 9.15 and 9.30 in the morning of any working weekday ceased to be mere information and became vitally important to Florence Wood. So did the secondary knowledge that the bank vault was also contrived in available volume to limit the breathable air. There was not enough to support the average human adult overnight until opening time tomorrow morning. Now there were two of them entombed in it, and she was one of them. We'll die, she screamed. Trust me, Florence? She looked dubious. She was not at all willing to regard anyone as competent who was so foolish as to lock himself into a bank vault, and her with him. Florence was still struggling through her sea of mixed thoughts when the telephone rang. It was Chief Weston, and he bellowed almost loud enough to hear through the yards of concrete and steel that separated us. Schnell, what in the bloody hell have you done? I've shut the vault, I said. You'll die! I doubt it. How do you suppose to get out? He demanded with heavy sarcasm. Just ask Edward Havlett Wood, the Psy Man in our midst. Schnell... If you get out of there alive, I'm going to ask you for your resig... If I get out of here alive, you'll need every faculty I have to keep our Psy Man jugged for good. You and your extra sensory. Chief, get it through your thick skull that I am so convinced I'm right that I'm betting my life on it. And can you tell me why he is going to give himself away to rescue you? Because I have his daughter right here beside me. Schnell, stop yakking, Chief. Call me when Wood arrives. I have an emotional problem on my hands down here. How do you know Wood's coming? He's been following my every move by telepathy, I said. He's been trying to block me all the way. Oh, he knows all right. Then I hung up to stop a lot of senseless gab. I turned to Florence, who was just beginning to understand what I had said and what it meant to both her and her father. She stood there with shocked eyes regarding me, and with one hand pressed back against her teeth, she said, I don't believe it, in a barely audible voice. It's true, and I'm sorry it's true, I told her. It can't be true. That's what you'd like to believe, I said softly, but the fact remains that your father is a killer. I'd rather die. Florence, the choice between death and dishonor is not yours to make. Whether you live or die is up to your father, who was guilty of placing you in this awkward position by turning his talents to evil. She stared at me. But how could you? There was no other way but to bait this trap emotionally. So cold and cruel. I nodded. So were the pioneers who saved one last bullet for their wives. How could I tell this hurt girl that I had looked time and again into the minds of killers, and found them far worse than the deeds they committed. 
when the official record states that, upon such and such a date, so-and-so was punished for his crime. How is he punished for the harm he did to those who placed their trust in him? I hate them because they force me to reveal them for what they are, making me an agent of their betrayal. The phone rang again. Yeah, Chief? Schnell, Woods just arrived. What shall I tell him? Don't bother. He knows it all. Schnell, granting that you're right, why should he show his hand when he knows, or could easily find out, what the time-lock setting mechanism is on your side of the vault door? Sure it is, I replied, but it's covered by a sheet of five-ply safety glass. Use your revolver! Chief, reprimand me for a violation of regulations if you must, but let me point out that only an idiot would wear a gun when he's pitting himself against a psi man. Got everything figured out, haven't you, Schnell? Chief, I said, this affair started in a sealed room, and now it's going to end in one. I yanked on the telephone and pulled it out of its connection block, snapping that link of communication. Then, to satisfy Edward Hazlitt Wood, I hurled the instrument as hard as I could against the safety glass. The telephone bounced as if I had thrown it against six solid feet of battleship plate armor. I thought, Psy man, you are trapped. He thought, I've killed before, Schnell. Why shouldn't I profess helplessness and innocence and accuse you and the whole police department of the stupid and wanton death of my beloved daughter? Because you've erred, Psy man would. Ah, now I have proof. You're a Psy man, too. Who, me? I thought, without a visible change in my expression for Florence Wood to see. You're the one who erred, Wood. You neglected the rules. Bah! The law! Stupid law! Not so stupid, Wood. The law is really very sensible. It's strong, Wood, and it fosters the strength that comes of following it. So you see, Simon Wood, by never, never making any overt use of my talent, by never admitting that I know more than any clever man can see and deduce from what he knows, it has now become quite obvious to Chief Weston that, if any such shenanigans as extrasensory manipulation of this bank vault door take place, you're the only one suspected of parapsychic power. And then the time clock setting dials clicked around, their tiny noise muted by the glass door. They came around until they pointed to the present time. Then came the louder manipulation of outside dial lock, the heavy click of massive tumblers, and then the solid turning sound of wheel and mighty lever. The vault door swung open. Outside, a pale and speechless man faced me, looking at his daughter. Weston was shaking his head, but... The confusion was clearing. Weston was a good man, quite willing to operate without a full explanation, so long as there was a reasonable probability that some reasonable explanation would come later. The president and four vice-presidents of the bank stared at their vault door in dismay, wondering how anyone could from now on rely on any protection if the best of the vault-maker's art could be opened with such ease. And Florence... She started forward with a glad cry, but stopped in mid-stride as she realized the full truth. In those fractions of a second, she became the full mature adult who had been hurt, and who knew that hurt and pain are not the end. She stopped a full yard from him and whispered, Daddy, you did it. He looked at her out of frantic eyes. I didn't! I didn't! Chief Weston took a pair of handcuffs from one of the uniformed cops and held them up in front of Edward Hazlitt Wood's eyes. Come in quietly, Wood, or must I weld them on to you? Stunned, knowing that any move he made I would block, the murderer turned to go. I was going to have quite an interesting intellectual problem to solve. I was going to have to testify that I was clever enough to trap an extrasensory criminal without displaying my own extrasensory talent. It wasn't just a matter of putting a possible ending to my official usefulness to the forces of law and order if the facts became known. One word of suspicion against Captain Howard Schnell and some clever defense attorney would raise a wholly reasonable doubt as to which Simon opened that vault door. 
and being sworn to uphold the law and enforce the law within the framework of the law itself, I'd have to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. But according to the same sensible law, not unless I was specifically asked. And, to answer Edward Hazlitt Wood's question, the perfect answer to the perfect crime committed by the perfect criminal is a perfect retribution. End of The Undetected by George O. Smith Recording by Scotty Smith The Killer by J. T. Oliver This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman Smith made a profitable business out of murder. It was all quite simple. He killed a man and then disposed of the body. Forever. The Killer by J. T. Oliver The sign on the door said Ernest H. Smith, Private Investigator. The door opened, and a woman came in. She was a brunette about five feet two, wearing a yellow dress with black buttons. She carried a brown alligator handbag. I'm Mrs. Wilma Rogers, she said. You were recommended to me. Smith motioned to a chair in front of his desk. Sit down, Mrs. Rogers. Do you have a card? She sat down and opened her handbag. She took out a small card and handed it to him. He looked at the printed words. Recommended to Smith. He opened a desk drawer and removed a small bottle of red liquid, spilling a few drops on the blank side of the card. Soon there was visible writing on it. Okay for any service, it said. All right, Smith nodded. What can I do for you? I want you to kill my husband, she said pleasantly. Smith swiveled his chair around to face the typewriter inserted a blank piece of white paper, and began to type. Why do you want him killed? He's stingy. He won't give me enough money. How much money will he leave you, Mrs. Rogers? Roughly two hundred thousand, she said. There's insurance, of course. But I understand we can't count on that. Smith smiled. That's a nice sum. Now what time would be most convenient? She shrugged her shoulders. Any time suits me. Smith laughed. I mean for your husband. What time would be best for killing him? Oh, she said. Her brow wrinkled, and she began to mutter. Let's see now. Home at 5.15, reads the paper, takes a shower, dinner at 6.15. I can send the servants out at 7.30. Oh, I think eight will be perfect. Eight it is, said Smith putting the information on paper. Now, for a bit of information about the house and grounds. Can't afford to bungle into the wrong place and follow up the job. Mrs. Rogers opened her purse again and withdrew a folded sheet of paper. I've got the ground plan of the house here, and the address and everything marked off. Smith took the paper and looked at it. You don't overlook anything, do you? Why didn't you just go ahead and do the job yourself? She smiled and shrugged. I understand you could perform a perfect murder. I'm afraid I couldn't. Smith removed the typewriter sheet from the machine and inserted a fresh sheet. He filled it in with names, dates, and figures. When he finished, he handed it to her. Sign on the bottom line. She took the paper and looked at it. It's our contract, said Smith. I have to have a guarantee that you'll go through with your part of the bargain. If you don't, I'll have that signed confession. Mrs. Rogers looked at him in silence for a moment. Then she laughed and signed the paper. You don't overlook anything yourself. No, ma'am, said Smith. At exactly five minutes before eight, Smith drove his panel truck through the gate to the Rogers' home, turned out the lights, and drove silently to the house. He parked near the side entrance, got out, went around the truck, which was labeled Smith's TV Repair, 
and opened the back doors. He lifted a pile of ragged quilts from the floor and picked up a small air pistol. Wrapped carefully in the quilts was a tiny bottle of dark green liquid marked poison. He took a small dart from his pocket, opened the bottle, and applied a small amount of the liquid to the tip of the projectile. Then he loaded the pistol with a dart, stuck it in his coat pocket, and replaced the bottle. He walked rapidly to the door of the house, stopped at the steps to consult the floor plan, then entered. He went up the stairs and directly to the second floor, on the left. He turned the knob silently and eased inside. A small man dressed in a dark suit was seated at a desk, writing with a fountain pen, on light blue paper. He looked up and said, Who are you? Smith, I'm the TV repairman. Are you Rogers? Yes, but I... Then Smith killed him. He emerged from the house, with Rogers draped over his shoulder, and staggered over to the truck. He shoved the corpse in and crawled in after. Moving rapidly, he opened the door of the trim metal cabinet directly behind the cab and shoved Rogers inside. Then he pushed a button on the side of the contraption, and it began to hum. After two minutes he cut the power and opened the cabinet. It was empty. Smith whistled softly as he walked back to the house. He strode noiselessly in and called, Hey, Mrs. Rogers! She emerged from a door near the head of the stairs and came down. Yes, she said. Smith grinned at her. It's okay, lady, the job is over. Good, let me fix you a drink and you can tell me all about it. Smith sat down on the couch. She prepared the drinks and brought his over. They sat together and sipped the liquor. Science is wonderful, she said. Yeah, it sure is, said Smith. They spent millions figuring out fancy ways to catch crooks, and then some dumb professor invents a way so I can kill people and never be caught. I wonder what the cops a hundred years in the future will think when bodies start popping up all over the place, she observed. Who cares, said Smith. I'm making my dough, even if I will have to wait seven years for the heirs to collect. It won't be too hard to wait, she said. Since we know for certain, we'll get it. Let's drink to our success, Smith said. Let's, she smiled. Here's to a fine old professor who invented a time machine and kindly let me kill him and take it away. Here's to a policeman's nightmare, the perfect murder. They drank. Smith got to his feet and then put the glass down. Well, I'll have to go now. I... He saw a blank look of astonishment on her face. Her mouth had dropped open, and her eyes were wide, staring. But they weren't looking at him. They were looking behind him. And then he heard a polite cough. Smith spun around. He stared in amazement at the figure of a man standing there. A man clad in a strange, shimmering, metallic uniform. The man held an odd-looking weapon in his hand. He was smiling. Mr. Smith, I believe? Smith nodded automatically. Yes, but who am I? The stranger completed the sentence for him. It's quite simple. I'm Inspector Gravad, homicide. I'm arresting you for murder. Smith shook his head dully. But that's impossible. There's no murder, no body. Where did you come from? The shimmering man smiled pleasantly. Oh, but there is a body. Matter of fact, there are quite a few. We had quite a bit of difficulty tracing you down. I've come all the way from 2035 to find you. He turned his eye to the woman. As an accessory to the fact, you are also under arrest. Come along, both of you. He pointed the strange weapon at them and a silver radiance swept from it to envelop their bodies. But only for a moment. Then they were gone. The End of The Killer 
by J. T. Oliver. Breakaway by Stanley Gimble. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Breakaway by Stanley Gimble. Phil Conover pulled the zipper of his flight suit up the front of his long, thin body and came into the living room. His face, usually serious and quietly handsome, had an alive, excited look, and the faint lines around his dark, deep-set eyes were accentuated when he smiled at his wife. All set, honey. How do I look in my monkey suit? His wife was sitting stiffly on the flowered couch that was still not theirs completely. In her fingers, she held a cigarette burned down too far. She said, You look fine, Phil. You look just right. She managed to smile. Then she leaned forward and crushed the cigarette in the ashtray on the maple coffee table and took another from the pack. He came to her and touched his hands to her soft blonde hair, raising her face until she was looking into his eyes. You're the most beautiful girl I know. Did I ever tell you that? Yes, I think so. Yes, I'm sure you did. She said, finishing the ritual, but her voice broke and she turned her head away. Phil sat beside her and put his arm around her small shoulders. He had stopped smiling. Honey, look at me, he said. It isn't going to be bad. Honestly, it isn't. We know exactly how it will be. If anything could go wrong, they wouldn't be sending me, you know that. I told you that we've sent five unmanned ships up and everyone came back without a hitch. She turned, facing him. There were tears starting in the corners of her wide brown eyes and she brushed them away with her hand. Phil, please don't go. Please don't. They can send Sammy. Sammy doesn't have a wife. Can't he go? They'd understand, Phil. Please. She was holding his arms tightly with her hands, and the color had drained from her cheeks. Mary, you know I can't back out now. How could I? It's been three years. You know how much I've wanted to be the first man to go. Nothing would ever be right with me again if I didn't go. Please don't make it hard. He stopped talking and held her to him and stroked the back of her hand. He could feel her shoulders shaking with quiet sobs. He released her and stood up. I've got to get started, Mary. Will you come to the field with me? Yes, I'll come to say goodbye. She paused and dropped her eyes. Phil, if you go, I won't be here when you get back. If you get back. I won't be here because I won't be the wife of a space pilot for the rest of my life. It isn't the kind of life I bargained for. No matter how much I love you, I just couldn't take that, Phil. I'm sorry. I guess I'm not the noble sort of wife. She finished and took another cigarette from the pack on the coffee table and put it to her lips. Her hand was trembling as she touched the lighter to the end of the cigarette and drew deeply. Phil stood watching her, the excitement completely gone from his eyes. I wish you told me this a long time ago, Mary, Phil said. His voice was dry and low. I didn't know you felt this way about it. Yes, you did. I told you how I felt. I told you I could never be the wife of a space pilot. But I don't think I ever really believed it was possible. Not until this morning when you said tonight was the takeoff. It's so stupid to jeopardize everything we've got for a ridiculous dream. He sat down on the edge of the couch and took her hands between his. Mary, listen to me, he said. It isn't a dream. It's real. There's nothing means anything more to me than you do. You know that. But no man ever had the chance to do what I'm going to do tonight. No man ever. If I backed out now for any reason, I'd never be able to look at the sky again. I'd be through. She looked at him without seeing him, and there was nothing at all in her eyes. Let's go, if you're still going, she finally said. They drove through the streets of the small town with its small bungalows each alike. There were no trees and very little grass. It was a new town, a government-built town, and it had no personality yet. It existed only because of the huge ship, 
standing poised in the takeoff zone, five miles away in the desert. Its future as a town rested with the ship, and the town seemed to feel the uncertainty of its future, seemed ready to stop existing as a town and to give itself back to the desert, if such was its destiny. Phil turned the car off the highway onto the rutted dirt road that led across the sand to the field where the ship waited. In the distance they could see the beams of the searchlights as they played across the takeoff zone and swept along the top of the high wire fence, stretching out of sight to right and left. At the gate they were stopped by the guard. He read Phil's pass, shined his flashlight in their faces, and then saluted. Good luck, Colonel, he said, and shook Phil's hand. Thanks, Sergeant. I'll be seeing you next week, Phil said, and smiled. They drove between the rows of wooden buildings that lined the field, and he parked near the low, barbed fence, ringing the takeoff zone. He turned off the ignition and sat quietly for a moment before lighting a cigarette. Then he looked at his wife. She was staring through the windshield at the rocket two hundred yards away. Its smooth, polished surface gleamed in the spotlight glare, and it sloped up and up until the eye lost the tip against the stars. She's beautiful, Mary. You've never seen her before, have you? No, I've never seen her before, she said. Hadn't you better go? Her voice was strained, and she held her hands close tightly in her lap. Please go now, Phil, she said. He leaned toward her and touched her cheek. Then she was in his arms, her head buried against his shoulder. Goodbye, darling, she said. Wish me luck, Mary, he asked. Yes, good luck, Phil, she said. He opened the car door and got out. The noise of men and machines scurrying around the ship broke the spell of the rocket, waiting silently for flight. Mary, I— he began, and then turned and strode toward the administration building without looking back. Inside the building, it was like a locker room before the big game. The tension stood alone, and each man had the same happy, excited look that Phil had worn earlier. When he came into the room, the noise and bustle stopped. They turned as one man toward him, and General Small came up to him and took his hand. Hello, Phil. We were beginning to think you weren't coming. You all set, son? Yes, sir. I'm all set, I guess, Phil said. I'd like you to meet the Secretary of Defense, Phil. He's over here by the radar. As they crossed the room, familiar faces smiled, and each man shook his hand or touched his arm. He saw Sammy, alone, by the coffee urn. Sammy waved to him, but he didn't smile. Phil wanted to talk to him to say something but there was nothing to be said now. Sammy's turn would come later. Mr. Secretary, the general said, this is Colonel Conover. He'll be the first man in history to see the other side of the moon. Colonel, the Secretary of Defense. How do you do, sir? I'm very proud to meet you, Phil said. On the contrary, Colonel, I'm very proud to meet you. I've been looking at that ship out there and wondering. I almost wish I were a young man again. I'd like to be going. It's a thrilling thought. Man's first adventure into the universe. You're lighting a new dawn of history, Colonel. It's a privilege few men have ever had. And those who have had it didn't realize it at the time. Good luck, and God be with you. Thank you, sir. I'm aware of all you say. It frightens me a little. The general took Phil's arm, and they walked to the briefing room. There were chairs set up for the scientists and Air Force officers directly connected with the takeoff. They were seated now in a semicircle in front of a huge chart of the solar system. Phil took his seat, and the last-minute briefing began. It was a routine he knew by heart. He had gone over and over it a thousand times, and he only half-listened now. He kept thinking of Mary outside, alone by the fence. The voice of the briefing officer was a dull hum in his ears. And orbit at 18,000 miles per hour? You will then accelerate for the breakaway to 24,900 miles per hour for five minutes, and then free coast for 116 hours until... Phil asked a few questions about weather and solar conditions. And then the session was done. They rose and looked at each other, the same unanswered questions on each man's face. There were forced smiles and handshakes. They were ready now. Phil, the general said, and took him aside. Sir? 
Phil, you're, you feel all right, don't you, son? Yes, sir, I feel fine. Why? Phil, I've spent nearly every day with you for three years. I know you better than I know myself in many ways. And I've studied the psychologist's reports on you carefully. Maybe it's just nervousness, Phil, but I think there's something wrong. Is there? No, sir, there's nothing wrong, Phil said, but his voice didn't carry conviction. He reached for a cigarette. Phil, if there is anything, anything at all, you know what it might mean. You've got to be the best mental and physical condition of your life tonight. You know better than any man here what that means to our success. I think there is something more than just natural apprehension wrong with you. Want to tell me? Outside the takeoff zone crawled with men and machines at the base of the rocket. For ten hours, the final checkouts had been in progress, and now the men were checking again on their own time. The thing they had worked toward for six years was ready to happen, and each one felt that he was sending just a little bit of himself into the sky. Beyond the ring of lights and moving men, on the edge of the field, Mary stood. Her hands moved slowly over the top of the fence, twisting the barbs of wire, but her eyes were on the ship. And then they were ready. A small group of excited men came out from the administration building and moved forward. The checkout crews climbed into their machines and drove back outside the takeoff zone. And alone, one man climbed the steel ladder up the side of the rocket, ninety feet into the air. At the top, he waved to the men on the ground and then disappeared through a small port. Mary waved to him. Goodbye, she said to herself, but the words stuck tight in her throat. The small group at the base of the ship turned and walked back to the fence and for an eternity the great ship stood alone, waiting. Then, from deep inside, a rumble came, increasing in volume to a gigantic roar that shook the earth and tore at the ears. Slowly, the first manned rocket to the moon lifted up and up to the sky. For a long time, after the rocket had become a tiny speck of light in the heavens, she stood holding her face in her hands and crying softly to herself. And then she felt the touch of a hand on her arm. She turned. Phil! Oh, Phil! She held tightly to him and repeated his name over and over. They wouldn't let me go, Mary, he said finally. The general would not let me go. She looked at him. His face was drawn tight, and there were tears on his cheeks. Thank God, she said. It doesn't matter, darling. The only thing that matters is you didn't go. You're right, Mary, he said. His voice was low, so low she could hardly hear him. It doesn't matter. Nothing matters now. He stood with his hands at his sides, watching her, and then turned away and walked toward the car. The End End of Breakaway by Stanley Gimble Lair of the Dragon Bird by Robert Silverberg. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Lair of the Dragon Bird by Robert Silverberg. Dan Elliott sat in the muggy gloom of the West End bar on the outskirts of Venus City and grinned at his reflection in the mottled mirror. Congratulations, he said to himself. You're now the owner of the Space Needle, too. It had taken him five years, but it was worth it. The insurance money from the crashed Space Needle had just barely covered the down payment on the new ship, and it had taken five years to pay for the rest of it. But now the ship was his, and he was celebrating. The only trouble was the final payment had left him nearly penniless, and the only place he could afford to bend an elbow was a dive like the Vest End. Suddenly, someone lurched against his back, and the drink in his hand slopped over the bar. "'Why don't you watch what you're doing, buddy?' a harsh voice said. Elliot turned around. "'I didn't—oh, wise guy, eh?' Customers began to draw around the bickering duo. Elliot sized up his antagonist, a burly, nondescript man, with a seam running down from one ear to his chin. "'I'm not looking for trouble,' Elliot said, "'but if—' 
A fist erupted from nowhere and sent him spinning back against the bar. He elbowed up and drove a punch into the burly man's stomach, followed with a ringing blow to the jaw. The other staggered, and a third entered the brawl. Elliot felt a punch rake across his face, blocked a kick aimed for his groin, and barreled across the room, striking out angrily at his assailants. By now the room was filled with moving, cursing, gesticulating men, while the bartender ducked to safety. Elliot plunged through the mob and found the man who had struck him the first time. He seized him by the collar and drove him to the floor, just as someone yelled, Watch that table! He turned, not nearly in time. The flying table caught the back of his head with a sickening thunk, and he dropped unconscious to the floor. A cold rag splashed wetly on his face, and a heavy voice said, Bring him out of it. He's not badly hurt. Elliot opened his eyes slowly. He was no longer in the best end, but in a large, well-decorated office. Behind a gleaming surface desk sat a short, fat man with jowls that jiggled as he spoke, and standing to his left was a brawny, not-too-intelligent-looking man with a heavy space tan. How do you feel, Mr. Elliot? the fat man asked. All right, I guess, he rubbed the back of his head. What happened? You got in a fight. Fortunately, Sam here got you out. Elliot looked at his benefactor. Thanks, pal. Sam shrugged morosely. The fat man steepled his fingers and leaned forward solicitously. Tell me, aren't you the Daniel Elliot who cracked up a spaceship in the jungles five years ago? That's me, Elliot said. The fat man nodded. Mr. Elliot, I understand that you were near the Venusian Temple of Light, that you actually saw the dragon bird with your own eyes. Can you tell me if the thing is a robot? or is it actually alive? Elliot grinned. He had seen the fabulous bird from the jungle, hidden from the Venusian priests who worshipped it, but even at a distance he could tell the thing was alive. No robot could have moved with such sinuous grace. It's real, he said. The fat man smiled unpleasantly. I had hoped so, Mr. Elliot. I want that bird. You're the only one who can lead me to it. Elliot rose to his feet and glared at the fat man. Not me, mister. I don't like the jungle, and I don't like the idea of taking the Venusian's pet god, either. The fat man's eyes grew hard. Do you know who I am? Elliot shook his head. It was a mistake. His neck was still sore from the clobbering earlier, and the pain made him wince. You're talking to Houston Blaine, Sam said. Elliot stared silently. He knew Houston Blaine. Blaine was the Venusian commissioner for the Interplanetary Trade Board. You were in a brawl in a tavern, Mr. Elliot, said Blaine mildly. I could revoke your pilot's papers for that. It might even appear that you were, uh, intoxicated when you smashed up the Space Needle. Naturally, we couldn't let you take off in the Space Needle, too, could we? Elliot saw the picture then. The fight in the bar had been staged. Blaine had shrewdly framed him in order to get him to lead him to the Dragon Bird, and the fat man would do everything he said he would. Elliot was in his pocket. All right, Blaine, Elliot said stiffly. When do we start? Tuesday, Blaine said. And I better warn you, Elliot, that we must protect each other. If I don't come back from this trip, certain papers in my safe would make things very difficult for you. If we make it, however, you'll be well paid. What does that mean? Blaine smiled. I believe 10,000 credits will be sufficient. That is, of course, if we actually get the dragon bird. They started the next day from North Venus City, Blaine and Elliot. Sam followed them as far as the boundary line, then waved and turned back. The first few days of the journey weren't too bad. The little jeep went over the mossy undergrowth, almost as though a road had been built for it. It was, Elliot reflected, a hell of a lot better way to travel than slogging through the Venusian jungle on foot. In four days, they covered the same ground that had taken Elliot five weeks when he cracked up his ship several hundred miles to the south. At night, the two men took shifts, one of them sleeping in the rear of the jeep and the other standing guard, keeping his eyes peeled for predators. Here, Elliot encountered a temptation that was almost overpowering. It happened the first night, while Blaine slept. Elliot paced slowly back and forth on the lookout. Half an hour before his watch was due to end, he heard a faint chittering sound coming from one of the swaying whip trees overhead. He glanced up and swore. One of the grapefruit-sized purple Venusian spiders was lowering itself stealthily from the overhead branches on thick, sticky strands of web, 
It hovered some eight feet above Blaine's face, the fat, grubby face that looked evil, even in sleep. Elliot felt perspiration bursting out on himself. It would be so easy just to let the spider descend, to crawl on Blaine's ugly face, to inject its venom. No, he fought the temptation and drew his blaster. A bright spurt of golden flame split the night, and the spider withered on its web. Blaine was awake in an instant. What was that? I just saved your worthless life, Elliot said tonelessly. Spider, came out of the tree. Go back to sleep. You're not on duty for another half hour. Blaine shuddered, rolled over, and went back to sleep. During the day, Elliot drove. They moved further and further into the tangle of foliage that was the Venusian jungle, while the gray clump of buildings that was Venus City receded dimly behind them. It was hot in the jungle, hot and moist. Elliot's hair plastered itself to his forehead. Sweat trickled into his eyes. Steam fogged the windshield. After a while, he brought the jeep to a halt. Blaine wiped sweat from his wobbling chins and looked up. What's going on? You drive, Elliot said. I'm Bush. No, Blaine said. You're doing the driving in this outfit. That's your job. That's what I've hired you for. Get going, now. Elliot started the jeep up again. He'd been in low straits before, but this was about the depth and degradation. He had never hated anyone quite so deeply as he did Blaine, and had never been in so poor a position to do anything about it. Pressure began to build up in him. He was a trained rocket pilot, a man with skilled reflexes and an essential job. Somehow he'd slipped, and it had landed him smack under Blaine's thumb. It wasn't an easy pill to swallow. He would cheerfully have killed the fat man, except that he knew he'd never fly a spaceship again if he returned to Venus City without the commissioner. Blaine had him tied up six ways from Sunday, and it would do no good to strain at the bonds. On the evening of the fourth day, disaster struck. The jeep was bouncing over the mossy path between the great slime-covered trees when quite suddenly Elliot spied something rope-like slithering down a vine directly in the path of the car. Snake! he yelled, and jerked the wheel to one side. The jeep swerved. Watch what you're doing, Blaine growled, but it was too late. The right wheel hit a hidden rock, and the vehicle turned over on its side with a rending crash. Elliot was dazed, but he knew he still had to act fast. He sprang from the overturned jeep with Blaine behind him. The tree snake that had caused him to swerve was still coming toward them, its white fangs dripping venom. It sprang forward to strike, but Elliot's hand was faster. He closed his fingers savagely around the reptile's neck. He held the head at arm's length. The snake's twelve-foot body whipped around Elliot's throat and chest, pinning one arm to his side. The rocket pilot felt the dry, loathsome odor of the reptile drifting into his nostrils and retched. He gasped for air and tightened his fingers on the snake's throat, drawing his hand together as closely as he could. It was a question of which one would hold out longer. Elliot's eyes began to dim. What the hell was that fat fool Blaine doing? Blaine, he shouted. But Blaine didn't answer. With one desperate surge of power, Elliot clamped his fingers even tighter. Something snapped. The snake gave one convulsive shudder and dropped its lifeless coils from Elliot's body. He stood up, quivering with tension. As the snake hit the ground, a pencil beam seared the air, burning its head off. That's that. Houston Blaine said in relief. Elliot whirled to face him. Why the devil did you stand there? It could have killed me. Why didn't you use your knife? Blaine shrugged. You're doing all right. Now do something about the car, will you? Elliot repressed a vivid curse and turned away. The sight of Blaine sickened him, and he wished there were some way of exacting the revenge Blaine merited without forfeiting the cash for the trip. There wasn't. He bent and examined the car. The front axle's broken, he said after a moment's scrutiny. There's nothing much we can do about it out here. Nothing? Not unless you want to lash it together with some twigs, Elliot said acidly. We can't turn back now, Blaine said. Start loading your pack. We'll walk the rest of the way. The dragon bird's lair can't be too far off. The bright glow of lust was shining in the fat man's eyes. Elliot stared at him for a moment, then began packing. A day later, they arrived at the banks of the Cathal River, a swirling, slow-moving, wide stream that wound lazily through most of the continent. Elliot and Blaine kept out of sight in the brush. Look out there, Elliot said. He pointed at an island a hundred yards offshore. 
What's out that way? Blaine asked. That's the temple. See the big white building? The natives never come to this side of the river, by the way. The hunting's better over there. Give me the glasses, Blaine whispered. Elliot handed the binoculars over, and the fat man stared hungrily at the island. See anything? Just natives, Blaine said. He handed back the glasses, and Elliot looked at the little knots of mauve-skinned natives here and there on the island. Don't they have any guards? Elliot shook his head. No, they stick to their belief that the dragon bird will protect them from any invaders. Good, Blaine said. So much the simpler for us. When do we get moving? Elliot glanced at the man at his side, saw the desire on Blaine's face, the greed of the hunter. Don't be impatient, he said. It's almost noon now. Keep your glasses trained on the temple. Unless they've changed the program, the dragon bird will make an appearance at noon. The minutes ticked past slowly. Blaine kept glancing at his watch and looking eagerly out across the water toward the island. At the instant the second hand of the watch brushed past the twelve, there was a sudden boom, as of a huge kettle drum, and the sound reverberated hollowly out over the river. A group of natives, carrying a dark-hued animal the size of a small sheep, marched in orderly procession toward the temple. They laid the animal on an altar before the door. Another muffled boom followed. Here it comes, Elliot murmured. The natives stepped back reverently, and the doors of the temple slowly swung outward. The dragon bird appeared. Blaine's astonished gasp was so loud that Elliot looked around apprehensively. It's beautiful, the fat man exclaimed. More lovely than I'd ever dreamed. It is, Elliot said grimly. He took the glasses from Blaine's trembling fingers and focused them on the island. The dragon bird was walking with dignity across the little square before the altar. It stood almost the height of a man, half bird, half reptile, walking on powerful claws tipped with diamond-sharp, gleaming talons. The brilliant sunlight glinted off its metallic feathers, played over its shining plumage, lent brightness to the shimmering row of scales that covered its long, swan-like neck. "'Give me back the glasses,' Blaine said. He snatched them and stared. "'My God, what a beauty! He'll make a perfect trophy!' "'Trophy?' Elliot recoiled in amazement. Trophy? I thought you were going to capture it. Don't be a fool. How could we take a live bird the size of that one back through the jungle? We'd need a cage of chrome steel. No, I'm going to shoot it. We can take the head and skin back. That'll be enough. Elliot scowled and felt sick. The dragon bird, a trophy. The concept disgusted him. He looked away toward the island. The dragon bird had begun to feed on the small animal. It was ripping into it viciously with its talons and powerful beak. It'll be easy, Blaine went on. I'll put a bullet through the bird so as not to ruin it, and then we'll use ray guns on the natives to get rid of them. You What? They'll never know what hit them. It's merciful that way. Lord, what a lovely creature that is. Blaine raised his rifle and took careful aim. The rifle hung there a long moment as Elliot watched Blaine's pudgy finger tightening on the trigger. Then he lowered it. No, he said, I don't trust my aim. I might ruin the bird and I'd never forgive myself. He handed the gun to Elliot. Elliot took it reluctantly, feeling the coolness of the barrel, feeling the heaviness of the stock. You shoot it, Blaine said. No, I won't, Elliot retorted. We said nothing about... That doesn't matter, said Blaine blandly. I'm not asking you to shoot the bird. I'm ordering you to. Hot arrows of rage danced before Elliot's eyes. He saw the dragon bird now feasting on its sacrifice saw that beautiful, noble head pierced by a rocketing lump of metal, pictured the smoking rifle in his hands, and he could barely check the impulse to swing the rifle and bash in Blaine's bloated skull. I won't do it, he said. I will not shoot that bird. You're a fool, Elliot. You know that if we don't get the bird, you don't get paid. Why don't you... I won't do it. Very well, said Blaine coldly. I can't waste further time arguing with you. The bird may go back inside the temple any minute. Give me the gun. I'll do it myself, and I'll settle with you later. Silently, Elliot returned the gun to the fat man. Blaine took it, cocked it, sighted along the barrel. A second time, his finger began to tighten on the trigger. Suddenly, in a flash of bitter insight, Elliot realized he could never live with himself again if he allowed that finger to close on the trigger. No matter what the cost to himself, he couldn't let this fat butcher kill one of the most beautiful things that had ever lived as, as a trophy. All the pent-up rage that had been building inside him since his first meeting with Blaine exploded. Realizing exactly what the significance of his action was, 
he threw up his hand and slammed it hard against the barrel of the rifle, just as Blaine fired. The shot cracked out, breaking the silence, and the native fell. Blaine looked at him in astonishment. You fool, he shouted. The fat man leapt up, swinging the rifle around in a buzzing arc toward Elliot. The pilot sidestepped, and the butt whistled through the air, inches above his head. Blaine, off balance after the swing, fell away to one side, and Elliot sprang at him. The fat man sank to one knee under Elliot's attack, but he turned out to be stronger than the rocket man had thought. Under the coating of fat was solid muscle. Grunting, Blaine forced himself upward and hurled Elliot away from him. Livid hate sparkled in Blaine's eyes, and Elliot knew that his own face was an angry mask. This was going to be a battle to the death here on the banks of this sluggish Venusian river. The two men circled warily around each other. Blaine swung out one ape-like arm in a tentative, offensive gesture, and Elliot danced backward. "'You know what'll happen,' Blaine shouted. "'You'll rot on Venus for the rest of your life if I don't get back.' "'I'll take that chance, Blaine. I can't let you kill that bird.' He put his head down and bulled into Blaine's midsection, ignoring the rain of blows that descended on his neck and shoulders. He forced Blaine back toward the water's edge, only to have to let go when the other's fingers clawed into his throat. He pulled away, and Blaine's fingers left bright red streaks on Elliot's flesh. Blood mingled with sweat. A cloud of Venusian gnats descended on them, humming gently around their heads. Blaine's fist smashed into Elliot's stomach, but the pilot shook off the blow and landed one on the bowl of lard that cushioned the other's intestines. Blaine coughed and stepped backward. Elliot leapt for him and wrapped his arms around Blaine, barely managing to encircle the fat man's body. Then, slowly, he lifted the struggling Blaine from the ground. Here we go, he said as he heaved the commissioner's bulk upward. He got Blaine as far off the ground as he could and started to dash him to the ground again when the other broke Elliot's grasp. Elliot let him go and he fell heavily. Instantly, the pilot was upon him and the two rolled one over the other down the side of the bank toward the river. Just at the river's edge, Elliot managed to check their fall and broke loose. Blaine was on his feet again in an instant. Elliot's first punch crashed through Blaine's guard. The fat man reeled backward, lost his footing, and toppled off the embankment into the quiet water below, shouting wildly as he fell. As he struck, he shot up a torrent of water that splashed over Elliot's feet. Suddenly, the water was quiet no longer. There was a swirl beneath the river's surface, and Blaine's body became the center of a tangle of dark, saurian shapes. Blaine screamed just once before the razor-sharp teeth dragged him beneath the water. A red stain formed and drifted slowly down the sluggish stream, and then the water was quiet once again. Elliot stood on the riverbank, gasping heavily as he fought to recover his breath and mopped away the blanket of gnats that had adhered to him during the fight. He watched the streaks of red drifting downstream, and knew that his own life was forfeit now for Blaine's. He shook his head and turned away. There was nothing else he could have done. He started to walk slowly back away from the river. There was a rustling sound in the air above him. He looked up into the blazing sun, and a moment later was crouching in a huddled ball on the ground. The dragon bird was dropping gently toward him. Elliot remembered only too well what those gleaming talons had done to the sacrificial animal strapped to the altar. And then, Do not be afraid, a calm, silent voice said. You have done me a great service, Daniel Elliot. The dragon bird settled lightly to the ground, and Elliot saw deep intelligence glowing in the creature's golden eyes. It seemed almost as if the thing could read his mind. I can read your mind, Daniel Elliot, came the telepathic reply. You're... You're intelligent, then. There was a touch of sorrow in the mental voice as the bird said, I am the last of my race. We were the rulers of Venus long before your ancestors had discovered the use of fire. But after a pause, the bird continued, Well, no matter. What happened does not concern you. I permit myself to be worshipped by these natives. They bring me food and keep me comfortable. And in return, I hypnotize their enemies and keep their small island safe. It is a pleasant life, and I am becoming old. How old? Elliot asked. Several thousand of your years, the dragon bird replied. And you... The dragon bird silenced him. No, Daniel Elliot, I do not want to answer questions. I am solely concerned with the debt I owe you for saving my life. 
this Blaine held your future in threat. I think I can aid you and punish him doubly by foiling his plans. Don't be surprised by anything you see. The dragon bird wavered a little, and suddenly it was a bird no longer. Standing before Elliot, fat, ugly face and all, was Houston Blaine. Don't look so surprised, Elliot, came Blaine's snarling voice. You'd be surprised what a little high-powered hypnosis can do. Elliot rubbed his eyes and looked again. It was still Blaine, a smug smile on his heavy lips. I'm going to reward you, said Blaine's voice. You and I will take the late Mr. Blaine for every credit he's got, and we'll get those papers out of his safe. But you mean you'll take Blaine's place? Elliot asked, feeling as if he were in a dream. Temporarily. The fat figure of Blaine wavered and became the dragon bird again. Get on my back, Daniel Elliot. Moments later, they were soaring high in the sky, heading toward Venus City. End of Lair of the Dragon Bird by Robert Silverberg Resurrection by Robert J. Shea This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. Resurrection by Robert J. Shea They had been cramped for space, him and his people. Obviously, this new age had solved the problem better. You're a fascinating person, the girl said. I've never met anyone like you before. Tell me your story again. The man was short and stocky, with Asiatic features, and a long, stringy mustache. The whole story? he asked. It would take a lifetime to tell you. He stared out the window at the yellow sun and the red sun. He still hadn't got used to seeing two suns. But that was minor, really, when there were so many other things he had to get used to. A robot waiter with long, thin metal tubes for arms and legs, glided over. When he'd first seen one of those, he'd thought it was a demon. He'd try to smash it. They had trouble with him at first. They had trouble with me at first, he said. I can imagine, the girl said. How did they explain it to you? It was hard. They had to give me the whole history of medicine. It was years before I got over the notion that I was up in the everlasting blue sky, or under the earth, or something. He grinned at the girl. She was the first person he'd met since they got him a job and gave him a home in a world uncountable light years from the one he'd been born on. When did you begin to understand? They simply taught all of history to me, including the part about myself. Then I began to get the picture. Funny. I wound up teaching them a lot of history. I bet you know a lot. I do, the man with the Asiatic features said modestly. Anyway, they finally got across to me that it was the 22nd century. They had explained the calendar to me, too. I used a different one in my day. They had learned how to grow new limbs on people who had lost arms and legs. That was the first real step, said the girl. It was a long time until they got the second step, he said. They learned how to stimulate life and new growth in people who had already died. The next part is the thing I don't understand, the girl said. Well, he said, as I get it, they found that any piece of matter that had been part of an organism retained a physical memory of the entire structure of the organism of which it was part, and that they could reconstruct the structure from a part of a person, if that was all that was left of him. From there, it was just a matter of pushing the process back through time. They had to teach me a whole new language to explain that one. Isn't it wonderful that intergalactic travel gives us room to expand? said the girl. I mean, now that every human being that ever lived has been brought back to life and will live forever? The same problem I had, me and my people, 
said the man. We were cramped for space. This age has solved it a lot better than I did. But they had to give me a whole psychological overhaul before I understood that. Tell me about your past life, said the girl, staring dreamily at him. Well, six thousand years ago I was born in the Gobi Desert on Earth, said Genghis Khan, sipping his drink. The End of Resurrection by Robert J. Shea Survivors by Arthur Decker Savage This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman when man embarks upon the final atomic war, his civilization may be destroyed. Yet there will be survivors. Would you want to be one of them? Survivors by Arthur Decker Savage Olaf! Balron! They recognized each other simultaneously, there in the thin fringe of tangled brush skirting the hidden lake. Olaf! It's good to see you again. I thought there was nothing but mountains, wolves, and wild ones between me and civilization. They picked their way slowly toward the shore together. Olaf dropped gratefully to the warm sand. The sunset highlighted his reddish hair. You're not far wrong. There is wolf spore back there on the north ridge. But what in the name of the moon... Are you doing so far from New York? Headed south to stay, Boron said. He scanned the brush and trees behind them cautiously, then stretched out beside his companion, sighing. I'm getting too old for the winters, and the canned food in the ruins are getting scarcer every year. Olaf looked at him in disbelief. You're traveling alone? "'Aren't you?' the retort was sharp, with a keen edge of elderly pride. Something like a weary chuckle sounded deep in Olaf's throat. He spoke with easy candor. "'Yes, but... look, Bolron, I'm a hunter by choice. And I'm big and in my prime. I can run half a day at top speed, and I'm not too bad in a free-for-all.' You're a teacher, wise, but not in the ways of the wild. Your senses are dulled, and your reactions slow, like all city folk. Boron's eyes looked suddenly tired, older. He gazed out over the placid water. I could persuade no one to accompany me, he said simply. You made a good choice, Olaf, to terminate your education and seek the freedom of the wilds. THE NATURAL LIFE THAT I THINK ALL MUST SOME DAY EMBRACE. HE SIGHED DEEPLY. OF COURSE THERE IS THE DREAM OF ACHIEVEMENT THAT THE CITY DWELLERS ENTERTAIN. WE'VE GROWN SOFT IN OUR DEPENDENCE UPON THE BURIED FOOD IN THE RUBBLE, SPENDING OUR TIME IN STUDY OF THE BOOKS AND OTHER GOD THINGS, ALWAYS HOPING THAT WE CAN UNDERSTAND AND DUPLICATE THE OLD CIVILIZATION. BUT OUR BEST THINKERS, SINCE THEY ARE THE MOST EAGER SEARCHERS, stumble most often into the hidden pockets of radioactivity that endure even yet, and they die, and their knowledge dies with them, and our dreams and aspirations become dimmer with each generation. Olaf grunted, and Bowron went on as though to himself. I've come to believe that it's useless to follow in the footsteps of the gods, that we must wait and think and work each in his own way, until we learn what is possible for us through our own trials and the further development of our simple tools. We've learned much from the God things, slowly, over the years, but we also know that we're mutants, changed by the radiation of the great war areas, breeding true at last, and that we are different from the wild ones. True, we're superior, but we're not gods. Whether we can ever... 
Olaf had spun to his feet and was gone with incredible speed. Bauron sat up tensely, listening to the crashing of the brush, and finally to the shrill squeal of departing life. He relaxed and waited, until Olaf, grinning, returned with a rabbit. "'Our dinner, old-timer. Sorry I wasn't listening too closely to what you were saying.' Later, after they had eaten, and were stretched comfortably on the moon-drenched shore, Olaf grew reminiscent. I remember your teachings, Bauron, and I recall well our endless attempts to operate the god things, the machines and the mechanisms. But all that always seemed strange. Best of all, I like the tales of the old days, the stories of our ancestors. Bauron nodded thoughtfully. It was that way with most of my pupils. It was more comfortable to dream of the past than to cope with the current hardships. It seemed to arouse some dormant instinct in all of us. He broke off and sighed. Would you like to hear another of the stories? Very much. Bauron studied the bright moon. Well, once, in the far and long ago, there was a man named Smith who lived in a big city. When the tale was done, Olaf seemed deeply moved. I believe, he said slowly, that I'll go with you to the Southland. You might easily perish on the way, and such words as yours must live to give others comfort and hope. For we may yet find living gods in some remote corner of the world. It must have been wonderful, he mused sleepily to have lived in the companionship with the gods, with men. He curled up comfortably, paws tucked in, and laid his nose across his bushy tail. The End of Survivors by Arthur Decker Savage The Thing in the Truck by Darius John Granger this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Thing in the Truck by Darius John Granger It started with a load of potatoes. Joe Loftus and I were driving the big semi-trailer back from Montauk that night. After delivering a load of fishing gear to one of the big resorts out there, and wondering if we'd be able to pick up a truckload of anything on the way back to increase the take, when Joe spotted this sign. It was one of those standard hand-painted return load signs, so we pulled in and I climbed down from the cab while Joe remained behind the wheel, ready to roll if they had nothing for us. The sun was going down in a bank of heavy black clouds, I figured it might rain before the trip was over. I went over to the door of the farmhouse and knocked. Pretty soon I heard footsteps inside, and a man chewing a mouthful of his supper opened the door for me. He needed a shave, and he had tired, defeated eyes. "'What's the load, friend?' I said. "'I saw the sign.' "'Potatoes,' he named a price. "'Well,' I said in surprise, "'that's cheap. "'Tell you the truth, bub, they got blasted.' "'Blasted?' What do you mean? Well, now, it's hard to say. Something fell and hit the storage barn. Fell? Fell, bub. Bitty explosion, but nothing much. Maybe 70% of the load is good. The bad ones will be in sacks in the middle. Won't even know it. What do you say? That season, potatoes were going good in the wholesale markets around the city. I figured Joe Loftus and I could clear a neat profit, even if 30% of the load was waste. So I agreed to the deal, and for the next hour or so used the muscles of my back, along with Joe, the farmer, and the farmer's two grown boys, to load the sacks of potatoes into the empty van of our big semi-trailer. When he had finished, I paid off the farmer, and his wife gave us each a cup of coffee. Then Joe and I climbed into the cab, and we rolled. "'Here's something?' Joe asked about half an hour later. It was dark by then, and traffic on the Montauk Highway was light." Potato sacks shifting around, I said. We didn't pack them too good, I guess. The noise came again. 
Maybe it didn't really sound like sacks shifting around in the van. I don't know. I was in a hurry to get home. It had been a long day. I was driving. Joe squirmed around and peered through the rear window of the cab, but could see nothing. Stop the truck, he said. What for? Because I don't like that noise. Something's going on back there. Sure, I said, grinning. Our farmer's a shrewdy. His boys are back there and they're eating up all the potatoes. Very funny. Just stop the damn truck. I turned my head and looked at Joe's face. He was scared. Maybe he had one of those premonitions you read about. I shrugged and found a widened stretch of road shoulder and pulled the big semi up. Joe hopped out of the cab and went around back. After a while, I heard the rear doors swing open. Then they closed again, and Joe came back. I hadn't heard him stomping around inside the van or anything. Sex shifting around, like I said? I asked. Joe's face was white in the dashlight. He shook his head. Harry, he said. That's my name, Harry. Harry, we was tricked. What do you mean, tricked? I was getting a little annoyed with Joe. He stood half in and half out of the cab. I wanted to get moving. Ain't no potatoes, Joe said. No potatoes? What the hell are you talking about? We loaded those spuds ourselves. Ain't no potatoes, Joe repeated in a funny voice. Harry, listen, let's just leave the load and truck and everything and get the hell out of here. I looked at him and snorted, then swung out of the cab on my side and went around back. I undid the chain and the door bar and pulled the tongue down so I could open the rear doors. Then I swung up into the van in the darkness. There was a smell in there. Not a potato smell. To this day, I still can't say what it was, but it was a funny smell, and it made the short hairs on the back of my neck feel all cold and prickly-like. I lit a match and swore Joe was right. There just weren't any potatoes. I don't care who loaded them. But there was something back there. Call it jelly if you want. I saw it, and I can't do better. Say two or three tons of quivering jelly filling up the center of the floor of the van. Joe called, Well? I was carrying a lighted match into the van with me. It burned my fingers. I lit another one and slowly approached the jelly. It didn't seem to have any color, so it took on the orange glowing color of the flaming match. It pulsed. I went near it, then stopped. There were still a few potatoes on the floor of the van, after all. I stood by while the jelly rolled sluggishly toward them. The potatoes were enveloped. In a minute, there weren't any potatoes. Then the jelly thing stopped quivering. I came close and touched it gingerly with one finger. It burned. I withdrew my hand. Harry? Joe called. Just then I heard the sound of glass breaking. A section of the jelly had blubbered over against the van's small front window, smashing it. I didn't think a soft jelly would have the strength. Harry! Joe shouted. It was a sound of animal fear. I heard the sound of more glass breaking. The rear window of the cab, I thought. I hopped over the rear tongue of the van and sped around to the cab. Joe was sitting there, smoking a cigarette. What's the matter? I asked him. What happened? Nothing's the matter, he said. You want to drive or want me to drive? You just now yelled. Me? You sure I yelled, Harry? A car sped by, following its headlight beams. Windows broke, I said. Is it? Joe Loftus asked me in mild surprise. Is it now? That's what you get for trying to shift those potatoes around in the middle of the trip. Potatoes? I yelled. Hell yeah, potatoes. Hey, what's the matter with you, anyhow? Potatoes, I said. All right, so go take a look. Joe scowled but went. In a little while, I heard the tongue and doors slamming and the chain being dragged across. Joe came back and gave me a long, funny look. Yeah, potatoes, he said. I didn't push it. We'd been on the road a long time today. Sometimes the road can get to you like that. Maybe you read something about highway hypnotism. If you're driving too long on a good road like the Montauk Highway, or one of the throughways, after a while you get to see things which aren't there, or don't see things which are there. It can be plenty trouble, but it wasn't going to hurt me tonight if I imagined a return load of Long Island potatoes was a big glob of jelly. I scratched my head. Highway's got you, huh? Joe said. He knew the symptoms. Tell you what, Harry, why don't you sleep it off? I feel pretty good. I can take her in. 
I thanked Joe and climbed up on the slab bunk in the rear of the cab. The window was broken back there all right. He couldn't argue about that. But it was too dark to see into the van, except that I could see the van window was likewise shattered. I drifted off sleepily, not thinking about it much. Joe was a good driver, one of the best. Maybe, when I opened my eyes, we'd be in the city, heading for one of the big wholesale produce markets. It was raining when I awoke. Thunder rolled and rumbled and then split like a pine board overhead. Lightning was stabbing at the sky. Joe? I said, sleepily. He grunted a wordless answer. We near the city yet? You only slept maybe half an hour, chum. Why don't you catch another forty? I said, that's real white of you, pal. Joe grunted again. The truck lurched around a turn. The rain beat down. I opened my eyes and looked down past Joe's head. Just then a flash of lightning lit up the night. I caught a glimpse of a narrow two-lane asphalt road and stunted scrub pine growing in what looked like sandy ground. Hey, I shouted. This isn't the Montauk Highway. This isn't the way back. What's going on? Just get some sleep, will you? Joe said. Detour back there. Wasn't any detour when we came out. Well, there's a detour now. I was wide awake. I didn't like the way Joe sounded. Listen, I said. The road's fine. There wasn't anything wrong with the road. So why the detour? Flash flood, I guess. It's raining, but it hasn't been raining that long, and it isn't raining that hard. So I'm not the highway commission, Joe said. Now get some sleep, will you? It was this on top of what I'd thought had happened to the potatoes. Something was up. I didn't know what. Funny how sometimes a thing like that doesn't get to you at first. What had the farmer said? Something fell on his load of potatoes. Fell, I thought now. From where? And hadn't he said something about a little explosion? Ten hours on the road, I thought. Ten hours on the road, or we'd have asked him sure. Hey, Joe, I called down from the bunk. When do we cut back west? Soon as there's a road. But soon a crossroad flashed by, dimly seen by the glow of distant lightning. Joe's face was set. He didn't look at me. Joe, I said, stop the truck. What's the matter now? I want to check the potatoes, I said. You know the lock bar isn't what it should be. Don't want to lose the load, do you? I thought you said it wasn't a load of potatoes. Highway hypnotism, I said. I'll take your word for it. Hell, I loaded them, didn't I? You loaded them, Joe said, slowing the truck. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I'd look inside the van, sure. If it had been highway hypnotism, I'd know it now, because the illusion wouldn't last. They never do. But after that... After that, I hadn't figured yet. Joe was acting funny. Real funny. The truck stopped. I went around back in the hard driving rain. It was an unfamiliar road, but the kind you find all up and down the east coast near the ocean, with scrubby growths of pine on either side and sandy soil, and no sign of civilization except the marching files of telephone poles. I pulled out the lock bar and swung down the tongue and opened the back doors. Just then, the truck growled to life. The rear tires spun and whined and threw pebbles at me. The truck lurched forward. I lunged after it, grabbing the swinging lock chain and pulling myself up on the tongue. My right foot scraped along the ground, and for a minute, I thought I was going to lose my hold and fall off. But slowly, I pulled myself up while the rain beat down on me. I tried to keep it quiet. As far as I knew, Joe thought he left me back there. That crazy Joe, I told myself, climbing into the van. The rear doors swung in the wind, banging against the frame. Joe must have known I had opened them. He didn't seem to care. He was like a crazy man up there. We didn't work for any trucking company. This truck was ours. With what we made on it, we hoped to buy another before long and start a fleet. Joe and Harry, trucking. But Joe was up there in the cab, acting like a crazy man, and I was back here in the van. With what? I listened. Nothing but the sound of the motor and the rain outside. I sniffed. That odd smell was gone. I fumbled for my matches and scratched one against the flint. It made a faint, sodden sound, and I thought I wasn't going to have any luck. But just then the match spluttered and flared and caught. There were no potatoes. There wasn't any glob of jelly. Come on in away from the rain. Come over to me, Harry, honey, she said. I dropped the match and it went out. It was a woman. There was a lovely, blonde-haired woman in the van there. She had been dressed up, like for a party. 
At least in the little I saw of her, I thought that was the way she was dressed, and she was absolutely dry, as if she hadn't somehow come in out of the rain or anything. Come on, Harry, she called in a seductive voice. I'm waiting, Harry. I walked stiffly into the van. Well, I'm human, aren't I? I was fumbling again with the matches. I had to see her once more. If this was highway hypnotism, I was all for it. In the light of the first match, she'd been beautiful. I struck the second match, but the head crumbled wetly. I tossed it away irritably and was about to strike a third when her hand touched me. Harry, she said. Harry. I never did get her name. What the hell, it didn't matter. She was only there for one purpose. Probably she didn't even have a name. She didn't need one. There was no before and no after for her. Only the all-containing now and a guy named Harry Miller. Do you like me, Harry? she asked. She came against me softly firm and straining. She had a strong, musky perfume on her. Her hair touched my face, and her voice whispered in my ear. Desire me, she said. Do you desire me? Damn full question, I thought without pushing it. Hell yes, I desired her. Who the hell wouldn't? Outside, the rain drummed down. In the cab, Joe gunned the motor. I kissed the girl in the van, and she returned my kiss hotly, avidly. Harry, she said. I folded her in my arms and sat down on the floor of the van. The truck lurched, and something rolled against my leg. I reached down with one hand. The woman sensed this. Her warm fingers touched my arm as she tried to draw my hand back. But I found what had rolled against my leg anyway. It was a potato. It was what should have been back there in the van in the first place. No lump of glob and no beautiful dame, just a return load of Long Island potatoes for market. I pushed the woman away from me and stood up, holding the potato like it was a talisman. Harry, she cried, hurt in her voice. What is it? What's the matter? I didn't answer her. I walked to the rear of the van and looked out. It was dark out there. The rain came down in a heavy, faintly silver curtain. After a while, lightning lit the sky, and I saw the road was running parallel to the ocean now. I figured we were somewhere not too far from Riverhead, probably south and a little west of Riverhead, down by the water. But why? Why? Ten minutes later, the big truck rolled to a stop. I jumped down from the van and sped around to the cab, slipping on wet sand. There was a salt spray with the wind-driven rain in the air, and I smelled the sea. I thought I could make out the gleam of the breakers through the darkness but it might have been my imagination. I did hear the pounding roar of the surf, though. I saw Joe's dark bulk getting down from the cab just as I reached it. Are you going to be any trouble, boy? Joe asked me. Trouble? I repeated his word. What are you doing? What did you drive here for, Joe? He didn't answer. He went around to the van and helped the woman down. She said something, and it almost sounded like she was crying. Take it easy, baby, he told her. It won't be long now. The rain poured down, drenching all of us. The surf roared and hissed and boomed across the beach. Hey, where are you going? I shouted. They were heading down across the sand. They didn't answer. I could stay with the truck. I could pull the truck out of there. Or I could follow them and see what the hell was going on. But just then Joe came back from the beach. I couldn't see his face, but his voice sounded odd. You'd better come down with us, Harry, he said. She figures you know too much. I figure she's right. We stood very close. In the dimness, I could barely make out the big monkey wrench in Joe's hand. If I said no, he'd bought me one with the wrench. If I said yes and went down there with him, would he use the wrench on me later? It didn't look as if I had much choice. I went down across the sand with Joe. The woman was waiting for us at the water's edge. The breakers were faintly phosphorescent with glowing plankton, and I could see the outline of the woman's figure against them. Then Joe's bulky silhouette came between us. I stood there and stared out across the black sea. Neither of them paid any attention to me. The breakers broke and foamed and rolled themselves out on the sand. The tide was coming in. The wind blew spray. You're waiting for something, aren't you? I asked. It was a dumb question. They weren't down here for their health. Something coming in from the water, I guessed. Submarine, maybe. Joe said, 
were not waiting for something coming in from the water. The woman said, Don't tell him, Joe. Joe said, Funny, you still calling me Joe. Still calling me Joe. The woman, You're Joe. You're Joe until we leave. Joe, Yeah, but it's funny. The woman, I hear something, Joe. Joe, No, it's the wind. The woman, Will it be soon? Joe, yeah, soon. What are we going to do with him, with Harry? He knows too much, the woman said, but does it really matter? They were talking about me as if I wasn't there. Or like two grown people will talk about a little child in his presence. Or maybe even like two people will talk about a dog, right in front of the dog, feeding the dog a juicy bone, maybe, the day before they take it down to the pound. They stopped talking. They stood there, waiting. After another twenty minutes or so, I began to hear something. Maybe they were listening too hard. Anyhow, I heard it first. A distant hissing sound. Before I knew it, the sky had begun to grow brighter. Joe, the woman cried happily. Listen. Yeah, and look at it, Joe said. They ran by me, not down toward the water, but back up the beach toward the truck. Wait a minute, baby, Joe called. You can't go near it till the changeover. The heat. I whirled and followed them. I saw it as soon as I turned, but I couldn't believe my eyes. It was why they had come down to the water's edge. It was why Joe had picked out the untraveled road. I gawked. The big truck was glowing. Not burning, not on fire, but glowing. As if it had suddenly gone phosphorescent, say a million times more so than the plankton glowing surf. It stood out as clear as day. Joe and the woman stood between the glowing truck and me, standing hand in hand, watching it, waiting. The truck changed. It wasn't highway hypnotism. Too much had happened. Too much still would happen. The square lines of the truck were flowing, shifting, coalescing, like a slow fade on the TV as one scene shifts slowly into another. The glowing truck flowed and altered and wasn't a truck any longer. Take him with us, Joe said suddenly. The woman grabbed my arm. I pulled loose from her and she started to yell. She came after me, throwing herself on my back. I was plenty scared by what I had seen and I wasn't having any, not if I could help it. I threw the woman off my back and she fell away yelling into the rain, but Joe came after me with the wrench. I stumbled and fell just as Joe swung the big wrench. It thudded in the sand half a foot from my face and I got up and started running. Joe threw the heavy wrench this time, and it hit the small of my back, driving me down to my knees. Joe came after me, kneeing my face as I swung around and tried to get up. I flipped over, but grabbed his foot as he tried to stamp it down on me. He didn't know what he wanted, that boy. I guess if he couldn't take me with him, he was going to try and kill me. I twisted his leg, and he yowled and fell down on top of me, and we rolled over and over in the sand, clawing for each other's throat. The woman was yelling something, but I didn't hear what it was, and I'm sure Joe didn't either. We were both breathing raggedly and swinging without much force at each other now. Call it almost a draw, except I was fighting for my life, and I knew Joe had an ally in the woman. I climbed to my feet slowly, unsteadily, and found the monkey wrench on the ground. I wielded it, shaking it in Joe's face. I said, You can do what you want. I won't stop you, but just leave me the hell out of it. All of a sudden, something struck my back. It was the woman, trying to knock me over from behind. I whirled, and she backed out of my reach. But then Joe was on his feet again, and when I turned to face him, she clawed at my back. Kill him, Joe, she cried. Kill him now! Joe came for me. He didn't pay any attention to the monkey wrench in my hand. He lunged at me, and I took a swat in his direction with the wrench. We both missed, but Joe was still half out on his feet. He stumbled past me, and I turned and shoved him. He struck the woman, and they both went down. Joe, the woman said. Joe, it's starting. She meant the truck, or what had been the truck. It was a gleaming silver globe now, and something was hissing at the bottom of it. I didn't know what it was, but they knew. I didn't know it then, but I had won. I delayed them past the point where they could take me with them by force or kill me. They had to hurry. I wasn't going to stop them. I stood there hurting all over and watched them run for the thing which had been the truck. It was still glowing, but the glow was fading. A hole seemed to open in its side for them, but then suddenly the glow became so bright 
that I couldn't see anything but the dazzling light, which, slowly, but with increasing speed, rose into the rain and the night, on a pillar of flame. I blinked. I smelled ozone. The sphere was gone, but there was an afterglow in the sky. Numbly, I walked over to where the truck, then the sphere, had been. I found Joe, or what was left of Joe. It was a dry husk of a body, hardly recognizable, as if some great power had taken Joe and twisted him, while an enormous heat had dried all the moisture from his body without burning the skin. I never found the woman. Instead, there were a few hundred dry husky things near Joe. I didn't recognize them at first, and when I did, I suddenly got hysterical and ran. I couldn't figure it out then, and I still can't, although I've tried to. The husky things were burned potatoes, next to Joe, where the woman had been. But the way I figure it, they went up there, both of them. The police gave me a rough time, but eventually let me go. What happened to Joe could have been the result of lightning. Lightning, they said, can do funny things. Nobody ever found the truck. I could have told them that. It had gone up there. Home? I did some investigating. There had been a meteor fall two days before we picked up the load of potatoes. I saw the farmer and asked him about the meteors, but he merely insisted, vague as before, that something had fallen into his barn through the roof from the sky. Figure it got among the potatoes, a sentience of some kind. Figure it was sleeping. Figure the motion of the truck stirred it to life. Figure it could, well, take over things. Like the potatoes, it became the girl to keep me busy. Like Joe. It took over Joe so it could drive off on the deserted beach. Like the truck. It took over and changed the truck into a, well, something, so it could get back where it started from. Me? I must have been immune. Or am I? Because a few minutes ago, something crashed through the roof of my new truck into the van. I don't know what, but I'm afraid to go look. What would you do? End of The Thing in the Truck by Darius John Granger Recording by Jeremy Clark What's He Doing in There? by Fritz Leiber This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Peter Menzel What's He Doing in There? by Fritz Leiber The professor was congratulating Earth's first visitor from another planet on his wisdom in getting in touch with a cultural anthropologist before contacting any other scientists, or governments, God forbid, and in learning English from radio and TV before landing from his orbit-parked rocket, when the Martian stood up and said hesitantly, "'Excuse me, please, but where is it?' That baffled the professor, and the Martian seemed to grow anxious. At least his long mouth curved upward, and he had earlier explained that it curling downward was his smile. And he repeated, "'Please, where is it?' He was surprisingly humanoid in most respects, but his complexion was textured so like the rich dark armchair he'd just been occupying that the professor's pin-striped gray suit, which he had eagerly consented to wear, seemed an arbitrary interruption between him and the chair, a sort of Mother Hubbard dress on a phantom conjured from its leather. The professor's wife, always a perceptive hostess, came to her husband's rescue by saying with equal rapidity, top of the stairs, end of the hall, last door. The Martian's mouth curled happily downward, and he said, thank you very much, and was off. 
Comprehension burst on the professor. He caught up with his guest at the foot of the stairs. Here, I'll show you the way, he said. No, I can find it myself. Thank you, the Martian assured him. Something rather final in the Martian's tone made the professor desist, and after watching his visitor sway up the stairs with an almost hypnotic, softly jogging movement, he rejoined his wife in the study, saying wonderingly, Who'd have thought it, by George? Function taboos as strict as our own. I'm glad some of your professorial visitors maintain them, his wife said darkly. But this one's from Mars, darling, and to find out he's, well, similar in an aspect of his life is as thrilling as the discovery that water is burned hydrogen. When I think of the day, not far distant, when I'll put his entries in the cross-cultural index, he was still rhapsodizing when the professor's little son raced in. Pop! The Martian's gone to the bathroom! Hush, dear. Manners. Now it's perfectly natural, darling, that the boy should notice and be excited. Yes, son, the Martian's not so very different from us. Oh, certainly, the professor's wife said with a trace of bitterness. I don't imagine his turquoise complexion will cause any comment at all when you bring him to a faculty reception. They'll just figure he's had a hard night, and that he got that baby elephant nose sniffling around for assistant professorships. Really, darling, he probably thinks of our noses as disagreeably amputated and paralyzed. Well, anyway, Pop, he's in the bathroom. I followed him when he squiggled upstairs. Now, son, you shouldn't have done that. He's on a strange planet, and it might make him nervous if he thought he was being spied on. We must show him every courtesy. By George, I can't wait to discuss these things with Ackerley Ramsbottom. When I think of how much more this encounter has to give the anthropologist than even the physicist or astronomer... He was still going strong in his second rhapsody when he was interrupted by another high-speed entrance. It was the professor's coltish daughter. Mom! Pop! The Martians! Hush, dear, we know. The professor's coltish daughter regained her adolescent poise, which was considerable. Well, he's still in there, she said. I just tried the door and it was locked. I'm glad it was, the professor said, while his wife added... Yes, you can't be sure what, and caught herself. Really, dear, that was very bad manners. I thought you'd come downstairs long ago, her daughter explained. He's been in there an awfully long time. It must have been a half hour ago that I saw him gyre and gimble upstairs in that real gone way he has, with Nosy here following him. The professor's cultish daughter was currently soaking up both Jive and Alice. When the professor checked his wristwatch, his expression grew troubled. By George, he is taking his time. Though, of course, we don't know how much time Martians... I wonder. I listened for a while, Pop, his son volunteered. He was running the water a lot. Running the water, eh? We know Mars is a water-starved planet. I suppose that in the presence of unlimited water, he might be seized by a kind of madness and but he seemed so well-adjusted. Then his wife spoke, voicing all their thoughts. Her outlook on life gave her a naturally sepulchral voice. What's he doing in there? Twenty minutes, and at last, as many fantastic suggestions later, the professor glanced again at his watch and nerved himself for action. Motioning his family aside, he mounted the stairs and tiptoed down the hall. He paused only once to shake his head and mutter under his breath, By George, I wish I had Fenchurch or Von Gottschalk here. They're a shade better than I am on intercultural contracts, especially taboo breakings and affronts. His family followed him at a short distance. The professor stopped in front of the bathroom door. Everything was quiet as death. He listened for a minute and then rapped measuredly, steadying his hand by clutching his wrist with the other. There was a faint splashing, but no other sound. Another minute passed. The professor rapped again. 
Now there was no response at all. He very gingerly tried the knob. The door was still locked. When they had retreated to the stairs, it was the professor's wife who once more voiced their thoughts. This time her voice carried overtones of supernatural horror. What's he doing in there? He may be dead or dying, the professor's coltish daughter suggested briskly. Maybe we ought to call the fire department, like they did for old Mrs. Frisbee. The professor winced. I'm afraid you haven't visualized the complications, dear, he said gently. No one but ourselves knows that the Martian is on Earth, or has even the slightest inkling that interplanetary travel has been achieved. Whatever we do, it will have to be on our own. But to break in on a creature engaged in, well, we don't know what primal private activity, is against all anthropological practice. Still, dying's a primal activity, his daughter said crisply. So's ritual bathing before mass murder, his wife added. Please! Still, as I was about to say, we do have the moral duty to succor him if, as you all too reasonably suggest, he has been incapacitated by a germ or virus, or, more likely, by some simple environmental factor, such as Earth's greater gravity. Tell you what, Pop, I can look in the bathroom window and see what he's doing. All I have to do is crawl out my bedroom window and along the gutter a little ways. It's safe as houses. The professor's question, beginning with, Son, how do you know died unuttered, and he refused to notice the words his daughter was voicing silently at her brother. He glanced at his wife's sardonically composed face, thought once more of the fire department, and of other and larger and even more jealous, or would it be skeptical, government agencies, and clutched at the straw offered him. Ten minutes later, he was quite unnecessarily assisting his son back through the bedroom window. Gee, Pop, I couldn't see a sign of him. That's why I took so long. Hey, Pop, don't look so scared. He's in there, sure enough. It's just that the bathtub's under the window, and you have to get real close up to see into it. The Martian's taking a bath? Yep. Got it full up and just the end of his little old schnozzle sticking out. Your suit, Pop, was hanging on the door. The one word the professor's wife spoke was like a death knell. Drowned! No, Ma, I don't think so. His schnozzle was opening and closing regular-like. Maybe he's a shape-changer the professor's cultish daughter said in a burst of evil fantasy. Maybe he softens in water and thins out after a while until he's like an eel, and then he'll go exploring through the sewer pipes. Wouldn't it be funny if he went under the street and knocked on the stopper from underneath and crawled into the bathtub with President Rexford or Mrs. President Rexford, or maybe right into the middle of one of Janie Rexford's Oh, I'm So Sexy bubble baths? Please! The professor put his hand to his eyebrows and kept it there, cuddling the elbow in his other hand. Well, have you thought of something? The professor's wife asked him after a bit. What are you going to do? The professor dropped his hand and blinked his eyes hard and took a deep breath. Telegraph Fenchurch and Ackerley Ramsbottom and then break in, he said in a resigned voice into which, nevertheless, a note of hope seemed also to have come. First, however, I'm going to wait until morning. And he sat down cross-legged in the hall, a few yards from the bathroom door, and folded his arms. So the long vigil commenced. The professor's family shared it, and he offered no objection. Other and sterner men, he told himself, might claim to be able successfully to order their children to go to bed when there was a Martian locked in the bathroom, but he would like to see them faced with the situation. Finally, dawn began to seep from the bedroom. When the bulb in the hall had grown quite dim, the professor unfolded his arms. Just then, there was a loud splashing in the bathroom. 
the professor's family looked toward the door. The splashing stopped, and they heard the Martian moving around. Then the door opened, and the Martian appeared in the professor's gray pinstripe suit. His mouth curled sharply downward in a broad alien smile as he saw the professor. "'Good morning,' the Martian said happily. "'I never slept better in my life, even in my own little wet bed back on Mars.' He looked around more closely, and his mouth straightened. "'But where did you all sleep?' he asked. "'Don't tell me you stayed dry all night. You didn't give up your only bed to me.' His mouth curled upward in misery. "'Oh, dear,' he said. "'I'm afraid I've made a mistake somehow. Yet I don't understand how. Before I studied you, I didn't know what your sleeping habits would be, but that question was answered for me. In fact, it looked so reassuringly homelike when I saw those brief TV scenes of your females ready for sleep in their little tubs. Of course, on Mars, only the fortunate can always be sure of sleeping wet. But here, with your abundance of water, I thought there would be wet beds for all. He paused. It's true I had some doubts last night, wondering if I'd used the right words and all. But then when you rapped good night to me, I splashed the sentiment back at you and went to sleep in a wink. But I'm afraid that somewhere I've blundered and... No, no, dear chap, the professor managed to say. He'd been waving his hand in gentle circle for some time in token that he wanted to interrupt. Everything is quite all right. It's true we stayed up all night, but please consider that as a watch and honor guard by George, which we kept to indicate our esteem. End of What's He Doing in There by Fritz Leiber Recording by Peter Menzel The Stranger by Gordon R. Dixon This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman If the alien spacecraft was not a rocket ship, what was it? And an even bigger question. Should they investigate or run for their lives? THE STRANGER by Gordon R. Dixon We will not consider the odds involved in their finding the stranger, for the odds were impossible. They came down to rest their tubes on an unnamed planet of a little-known star in the Buckhorn Cluster. Because they were tired from weeks in space, they came in without looking. They circled the planet once and spiraled down to an open patch of sand between two rocky cliffs. Only then did they see the other ship. Jeff Wadley was at the controls, and his eyes widened when he saw it. But his fingers did not hesitate on the controls, for a deep-space starship is not the kind of vehicle that can change its mind about landing once it is within a half a mile of the ground. He brought the Emerald Girl in smoothly to a stop, not five hundred feet from the stranger. Then he sat back. Dad, he said flatly into the intercom, swing the turret. Peter Wadley, up in the instrument room, had already seen the strange ship, and the heavy twin barrels of the automatic rifles were depressing to cover. Jeff leaned forward to the communicator. Identify yourself. The tight beam and common code snapped across the little stretch of open sand to the cliff against which the other seemed to nestle. We are the mining ship Emerald Girl, Earth license, 582 days out from Arcturus Station. Identify yourself. There were steps behind Jeff, and Peter Wadley came to stand behind his son's tense back. Do they answer Jeff? No. Identify yourself. Identify yourself. Identify yourself. The angry demand crackled and arced invisibly across the space,
between both vessels. And there was no answer. Jeff sat back from the communicator. The palms of his hands were wet, and he wiped them on the cloth of his breeches. "'Let's get out of here,' he said nervously. "'And leave him?' His father's lean forefinger indicated the strange, silent ship. "'Why not?' Jeff jerked his face up. "'We're no salvage outfit or government exploration unit.' There was a moment of tenseness between them. The old man's face tightened. "'We'd better look into it,' he said. "'Are you crazy?' blazed Jeff. "'It was there when we came. It'll be here if we leave. Let's get going. We can report it, if you want. Let the Federal ships investigate.' "'Maybe it just landed,' his father said evenly. "'Maybe it's in trouble.' "'What if it is?' Jeff insisted. Don't you realize we're a sitting target here? And what do you think it is? Aunt Susie's runabout? Look at it. And with a savage flip of his hand, he shoved the magnification of the viewing screen up so that the other ship seemed to loom up in a hand's breadth beyond their walls. It was an unnecessary gesture. There was no mistaking that the lines of the other ship were foreign to any they had ever seen. It was big, not outlandishly big, but bigger than the Emerald Girl, and bulb-shaped, with most of its bulk up front. There was no sign of ports or airlocks, only a few stubby fins, which projected forlornly from the body at an angle of some thirty degrees. And from its silence and immobility, its strange inhuman lines, a cold air of alien menace seemed to reach out to chill the two watching men. Well, challenged Jeff, but the older man was not listening. The radar camera, he said, half to himself. He turned on his heel and stalked off. Jeff, sitting tensely in his chair, heard his father's footsteps die away, to be succeeded seconds later by the distant, clumsy sounds of a man getting into a spacesuit. Jeff swore, and, jumping to his feet, ran to the airlock. His father, radar camera at his feet, was already half-dressed to go outside. "'You aren't going out there?' he asked, incredulously. The older man nodded and picked up his fishbowl helmet. Jeff's face twisted in dismay. "'I won't let you!' he half-shouted. "'You're risking your life, and I can't navigate the ship without you!' Helmet in hand, his father paused. The deep, graved lines in his face stiffened. "'I'm still master of this ship,' he said curtly. "'Alien or not, that other ship may need assistance. By interspace law, I'm obliged to give it. If you're worried, cover me from the gun turret.' He dropped the helmet over his head, cutting Jeff off from further protest. Seething with a mixture of fear and anger, Jeff turned abruptly and climbed hurriedly into the gun turret. The twin barrels of the rifles were already centered on their target, which the arming screen showed, together with the area between the two vessels, and a portion of the Emerald Girl's airlock, which projected from her side. As Jeff watched, the outer lock swung open, and a gray, space-suited figure raced for the protection of the bow. It was a dash of no more than five seconds' duration, but to Jeff it seemed that his father took an eternity to reach safety. He reached for the microphone on the ship's circuit and pulled it to him. "'All right, Dad?' In spite of himself, Jeff's voice was still ragged with anger. "'Fine, Jeff,' his father's voice came back in unperturbed tones. "'I'm well shielded.' and I can get good, clean shots at every part of her. "'Let me know when you're ready to start back,' said Jeff, and shoved the microphone away from him. He sat back and lit a cigarette, but his eyes continued to watch the other ship as a man might watch a dud bomb which has not yet been disarmed. After a while, he noticed his fingers were shaking, and he laid the cigarette carefully down in the ashtray. 
When he comes back, thought Jeff, it'll be time. We'll have this thing out then. He's become some sort of religious fanatic, and he doesn't know it. How a man who's been all over hell and seen the worst sides of fifty different races in as many years can think of them all as lovable human children, I don't know. But, know it or not, this taking of chances has got to stop someplace. And right here is the best place of all. When he gets back, if he gets back, we're taking off. And if he doesn't get back, I'll blow that bloody bastard over there into so many bits. Coming in, Jeff. His father's voice on the speaker interrupted him. Jeff leaned forward, his hands on the trips of the rifles. The small gray figure suddenly shot back to the protection of the airlock, which snapped shut behind it. Then he took a deep breath, stood up, and wiped the perspiration from his forehead. He went down to the instrument room. Peter Wadley was already out of his suit and developing the pictures. Jeff picked them up as they came off the roll, damp and soft to the touch. "'I can't tell much,' he said, holding him up to the light. "'There's a great deal of overlap,' his father answered. "'We're going to have to section and fit the pieces together like a jigsaw puzzle. "'Wait till I'm through here.' For about five minutes more, pictures continued to come off the roll. Then Peter picked up a pair of scissors and arranged the prints in their proper sequence. "'Clear the table,' he told Jeff, "'and fit these together as I hand them to you.' For a little while longer they worked in silence. Then Peter laid down his scissors. "'That's all,' he said. "'Now, what have we got?' "'I don't know,' answered Jeff, bewilderment at his voice. "'It looks like nothing I've ever seen.' Peter stepped up to the table and squinted at the shadowy films, with eyes practiced in reading rock formations. He shook his head. "'It is strange,' he said finally. "'Do you see what I see?' demanded Jeff. "'There's no real crew space. There's this one spot up front,' he indicated it with his finger. "'That's about as big as a good-sized closet, and nothing more than that except corridors about twenty inches in diameter running from it to points all over the ship. She must be flown by a crew of midgets. Midgets? echoed the old man thoughtfully. I never heard of an intelligent race that small. Then there's something new, said Jeff with a shrug of his shoulders. No, said his father slowly. I don't remember when or where I heard it. But there's some reason why you can't have an intelligent race much smaller than a good-sized dog. It has something to do with the fact that they grow in size as their developing intelligence gives them an increasing advantage over their environment. Here's the evidence, Jeff answered, tapping on the film with one finger. No, Pete was bending over the picture fragments again. Look at these things in the corridor. They're obviously controls. Jeff looked. I see what you mean, he said at last. If there's any similarity between their mechanical systems and ours, these controls are built for somebody pretty big. But look how they're scattered all over the ship. That's a good fifteen or twenty different groups of instruments and other things. That means a number of crew members and you simply can't put a number of large crew members in those little corridors. There's a large amount of total space, Pete began. Then suddenly a faint tremor ran through the ship. Jeff leaped for the screen, and his father moved over to stand behind him. Good Lord, said Jeff. Look at her. The other ship shook suddenly and rolled silently to one side. Some unseen center of gravity pulled her back to her original position. She hesitated a moment, and then tried again, with the same result. She lay quiescent. Jeff pounded on his radiation drum graph. "'What does it say?' Pete asked. Jeff shook his head in astonishment. "'Nothing,' he answered. "'Just 
Nothing at all. Nothing. Pete came over to take a look at the graph himself. It was, as Jeff had said, the line tracing the white surface of the graph was straight and undisturbed. But that's impossible, Pete frowned. The two men turned back to the screen. As they watched, one final shudder shook the strange ship, and then, like a stranded whale who has given up hope, it lay still. My God, said Pete, and Jeff turned to him in astonishment. It was the closest to profanity his father had come in twenty years. Jeff, do you know what I think? I think that ship is manned by just one great big creature, like a giant squid. That's why no radiation registered. He's trying to move his ship by sheer strength. Jeff stared at his father. You're crazy, was all he could manage to say. Why, something big enough to shake that ship would have to fill every inch of space inside it. You can't live in space that way. That's right, Pete answered. He clamped his hands on Jeff's shoulder excitedly and led him back to the jigsaw puzzle on the table. If I'm right, he said, there's no ship at all, as we understand it, but some sort of space-going suit for something terrifically large. Something like a giant squid, as I said, or some other long tentacled creature. His body would lie there, in this space you say is about the size of a closet, and his tentacles, or whatever they are, would reach out in these corridors to the various groups of instruments. Jeff frowned. It sounds sensible, he muttered. And in any case, he wouldn't be able to go outside his ship to fix anything that went wrong. And I take it there is something wrong, or else he wouldn't be jumping around inside. Jeff, Pete said, I'm going outside to take a close look at him. Jeff's head snapped up from the jigsaw puzzle. The old sick fear had come back. It washed over him like a wave. Why? he demanded harshly. To see if I can find out what's wrong with his ship, said Pete over his shoulder, as he went to the airlock. Coming? Wait, cried Jeff. He stood up and followed his father. For a moment there, they stood facing each other, two tall men with less apparent physical differences between them than their ages might indicate poised on the brink of an open break. Wait, said Jeff again. Now his voice was lower, more under control. Dad, there's no point in playing around any longer. You aren't going to be satisfied. Just look around out there and then leave. You're going to do something. And if that's it, I want to know now. There was a moment's silence. Then Pete turned back to Jeff his face set. That's right, he said. I don't have to look. I know what's wrong, and I know what I'm going to do about it. There's a living intelligence trapped in that space thing, as you and I might be trapped. I can set it free with two of our motor jacks. If you've got one inkling of what it means to be ignored when you're caught like that, you'll help me. If not, I'm taking two jacks out the airlock, and you can fire the motors and take off and be damned to you. Between the two men, the tensions built and strained and broke. Jeff let out a ragged sigh. All right, he said. I'm with you. Good, said the older man, and there was new life in his voice. Get your suit on. I'll explain as we dress. The trouble with our friend there is that he's fallen over. I see you don't understand, Jeff. Well, this ship of ours lands on her belly. We've got booster rockets all over the hull to correct our landing angle. But ships weren't always that way. They used to have to sit down on their tail. There's no furrow where the ship landed, only a circular blast spot, so it figures. Maybe some of his mechanisms went wrong at the last minute. 
At any rate, I'm betting that if we get him upright again, he can take care of himself from there on out. So you and I are going out there, with the couple of jacks, and see if we can't jack him back into position. The sand was thick and heavy. The walk over to the other ship was tedious, with the heavy jacks weighing them down. They reached the alien hull, paused a moment to get their breath, and then attached the magnetic grapples to the skin of the ship at two positions on opposite sides of the hull, and roughly a fourth of the way up from the rocket tubes. It was hard to anchor the jacks in the soft sand. They finally found it necessary to dig them in some three or four feet to a layer of rock that underlaid the sand. Then, when everything was ready, they took their stations, each at a jack, and Pete called to Jeff in the helmet set, All ready? Start your motor. Jeff reached down and flicked a switch. A tiny, powerful jack motor began to spin, and the jack base settled more solidly against the rock bed. When he was sure it would not slip, he left it, and went around the rockets to stand by his father. His face was gray. Well, said Pete tensely, up she goes. The nose of the alien ship was rising slowly from the sand. It quivered softly from some motion inside the ship. Yes, said Jeff. Up she goes. His words were flat and dull. Pete turned to look at him. Scared, son? he asked. Jeff's lips parted, closed, and opened again. You know how we stand, he said dully. I've heard what you said from other men, but never from an alien. Most of the ones we know hit first and talk afterwards. You know that once this ship is on its feet, we're at his mercy. Just his rocket blast alone could kill us, and there wouldn't be time to get back to the girl. The alien was now at an angle of forty-five degrees. The little jacks stretched steadily, pushing their thin, stiff arms against the strange hull. Sand dripped from the rising ship. Yes, Jeff, Pete said. I know. But the important thing isn't what he does. It's what we do. The fact that we're helping him. Can't you see it that way, son? Jeff shook his head in bewilderment. I don't know, he said helplessly. I just don't know. The ship was now nearly upright. Suddenly, with an abruptness that startled both men, it shook itself free of the jacks and teetered free for a second before coming to rest, its nose pointed straight up. There it goes, said Pete, a tingle of excitement in his voice. They moved back some yards to be out of the way of the takeoff blast. Suddenly the ground trembled under their feet. Pete put his hands on the younger man's shoulder. There it goes, he repeated in a whisper. Flame burst abruptly from the base of the ship. It was warming up its tubes. Slowly, the flame puffed out from its base, and it began to rise. Jeff shook suddenly with an uncontrollable shudder. His voice came to Pete through the earphones, starkly afraid. Now what? he cried. What'll he do now? Pete's grip tightened on his shoulder. Steady, boy. The ship was rising. Up it went, and up, until it was the size of a man's little finger, a tiny sliver of silver against the black backdrop of the sky. Then, inexplicably, it halted and began to reverse itself. Slowly it turned until the blunt nose pointed toward them. Jeff's hoarse breath was loud in his helmet. Now it comes, he thought, and his muscles tensed. A long minute flowed by, and still the alien hung there. Then, abruptly, it went into a series of idiotic gyrations. It twisted and turned and spun around, swinging its fiery trail of rocket gases like a luminous tail in the darkness. Then, just as abruptly, it reversed once more, so that its head was away from them, 
In a twinkling of a moment, it was gone. Pete sighed, a deep, ragged sigh. Did you see it, boy? he cried. Did you see it? I saw it. Jeff's voice was filled with a new awe. Now I get it. He wasn't sure. He didn't know we were really trying to help him until we let him get all the way out there by himself. Then he knew he was free. That's why he wouldn't answer before. Sure, Jeff, sure, said the older man, a note of triumph in his voice. But that's not what I mean. Did you notice all those contortions he was going through up there? Did they remind you of... There was a moment of silence. Then the words came, at first slowly, then in a rush from Jeff's lips. Like a puppy, he said, haltingly, stumbling over the wonder of it. Like a puppy wagging its tail. The light of the new understanding broke suddenly in his eyes. Dad, said Jeff, turning to his father. Dad? Do you know what I think? I think we've made a friend. The two men stood there side by side, looking into the blackness of space, where the odd-shaped spacecraft had vanished. It, they felt, was on its way home. And they were right. Moreover, it was hurrying, for it had a story to tell. The End of The Stranger by Gordon R. Dixon Once Upon a Mon Beast by Charles E. Fritch This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Molehill Mountain Once Upon a Mon Beast by Charles E. Fritch That's not my real name up there, and in a little while you'll discover the reason why. If you read my real name attached to this, you'd think it was just another fantastic yarn I batted out, and then you'd forget it. And you'd laugh. You'll probably laugh anyway, for a while. But I've got to get this thing off my chest once and for all. I was a struggling science fiction author at the time it began, or rather, before it began. Nope, that's not right. Struggling isn't the word. It doesn't express the blood, sweat, and postage stamps that went into a creation, the hope and the futility that ran hot and cold with each morning's mail, the psychological and financial insecurity that comes to a beginner crazy enough to tackle such a field. And then, to top it off, I got a letter from Donald MacDonald. That's not his real name either, and in a little while you'll find out the reason why. He's one of the all-time greats in science fiction, and still is, and a fan not knowing his work would be suspected of having lost his marbles. So a name author writes me a letter. Great, huh? No. I'd sent MacDonald a batch of my manuscripts, humbly asking the great man to favor them with a glance if a moment ever came while he was resting in between dashing off novelettes. And would he kindly let me know? Frankly, honestly, without fear of injuring my delicate feelings, what he thought of the work? He would, and did. The letter read, Dear Mr. I appreciate your efforts at trying to crack the STF field, but I'm afraid I'll have to disillusion you. I have read your manuscripts with considerable care, and am sorry to report that you seem to have no talent for writing and especially none for science fiction. I would suggest you turn your energies to something else, saxophone playing, stamp collecting, anything else. If you insist upon writing, however, have you considered fillers? Best wishes, Donald MacDonald. What I should have done was go out into the country and let the gathering steam blow its lid, but I didn't. If I'd gotten an automobile in motion, I would have run down the nearest Boy Scout just to see his blood splatter. Instead, I sat down and wrote a letter to Mr. Donald MacDonald. It was a fine letter, full of colorful phrases and split infinitives. To hell with grammar at a time like that, I rationalized. I told him in no uncertain terms just what I thought of him and his criticisms. I'd be a science fiction writer just to show him up for the incompetent he was, I said. I guess I said a lot of things. It was a letter full of more than fire and brimstone. It was radioactive. I mailed it, then I had a beer. Two days later, while I was bravely punching typewriter keys in a desperate effort to make good on my boast, 
a small, haggard-looking fellow came to the door and rang the bell. We don't want any, I said. He peered through the screen door and said, I'm Donald MacDonald, in a nervous, uncertain voice. MacDonald who? Donald MacDonald. May I come in? You're kidding. No, by God, you're not. You are Donald MacDonald. He smiled wanly. May I come in? I flew all the way just to see me. I, uh, it was no trouble. I took a sky worry. A what? May I come in? Sure, sure, come on in. Have a chair. Drink? No thanks, he said, seating himself. I'm afraid I've been, that is, uh, no, I don't believe so. I got your letter, I said, suddenly remembering. My awe at the presence of the great man was suddenly overwhelmed by a feeling of, now what the hell does he want? And I got yours, MacDonald said. That's why I'm here. He gazed at my typewriter as though it were ready to bite him. You didn't take my advice. Hardly, I said, rather flippantly. Once the bug has bitten you, have you had anything accepted? I stared at the rug, hating the man for asking. No, not yet, I admitted, grudgingly. But then the bug hasn't really bitten you yet, he said. You'll know when it does. I uh, guess my letter was a bit uh, abrupt, I said, not knowing how else to fill the silence. You were pretty mad, he admitted, and I don't blame you. I should have known better than to tell you that way. But in this game, you've... Well, you've got to learn to take criticism. If your work's bad, admit it and throw in the towel. And mine's bad? He shrugged, avoiding my eyes. I'm afraid so. But the steam had been released and the period of mourning had ended, so... I'll improve, I told him. You're wasting your time. Possibly. What I can't understand, though, is why a big name in science fiction comes way the devil out here just to advise me to stop knocking my head against the wall. Perhaps more than your head is at stake, he said. What? Nothing, he said hastily. For a moment his pale face held a haunted look, and he rose, looking like a man unsure of himself. I can't talk you out of it, so I'd better go. Wait a minute. Just what did you mean by that other remark? Donald MacDonald glanced around him as though he were afraid invisible beings might be eavesdropping. You really want to know the reason why? I nodded. Your work is good, he said seriously. Too good. Not up to par on some points, but in a few years you'll be going places. That's why I sneaked away from them and came here, to beg you to reconsider, to stop this writing now before it's too late. You mean, you, you can't mean, you're not afraid of competition? He waved an annoyed hand. Competition? Hell, there's always room for more. You don't understand, he went on, screwing his face into a look of determination. I'm trying to save your peace of mind, your sanity, perhaps. The mind is a great and powerful thing, sometimes dangerous. All these things, these alien creatures that a science fiction author creates. Yes, but he had straightened suddenly, a look of terror on a face gone ashen. He went to the door like a man being pushed, fumbled for the knob. I beg of you, for your sake, forget it, he called back. Then he was gone. I went out on the porch, but MacDonald was not in sight. I heard a strange noise as of the flapping of great leathery wings. A shadow passed across the lawn. I looked up. Nothing. The next morning I got a small envelope in the mail. The letter inside read, Enclosed is a check for your story, The Mon Beast. I sank into the softest chair in the world and read those wonderful, wonderful words and held the check in my hand and read those wonderful, wonderful figures. I was so in a trance, I hardly noticed the tiny decimal point that scattered on tiny legs across the check. I hardly felt a small, sharp bite, but... My first acceptance! It was incredible, the exhilaration that flowed through me in that instant. It was like a much-needed shot of adrenaline, like cool spring water to a thirsty man. I had a check for a story someone thought enough of to publish. I was an author, a real, live, honest-to-goodness author, with a check in my hand to prove to a critical world that I wasn't a bum after all. 
Suddenly, the world was a big, wide, wonderful place to live in, and I loved everyone in it, even the poor, disillusioned Donald MacDonald. But why stop here, I thought. There were more checks where that came from. If I could sell one story, I could sell two, and then three, and four. So I did. In a way, it was something like digging my own grave. You don't understand that now, but in a little while, you'll see the reason why. After I had haunted the newsstand for about three months, the great day came. The Mon Beast was the last story in the magazine at the time I thought they really should have featured it, and my name was misspelled on the contents page, but it was a great day just the same. A day of triumph. A day of rejoicing. I'd had several stories accepted during the several months' interval, but this was the day that the fruits of my labor became evident to the world. I walked home with a proud, firm step, casually displaying the magazine to the vast public eye, to friend and foe alike. I tried to act nonchalant, as though this were old stuff to an established writer like me. It was a day of glory, of triumph, rivaling Caesar's victorious march into Rome. That evening, I read the story over and over again, marveling at the perfection of its form, savoring the exquisite flavor of each delicate, richly-hued word, the uniqueness of each choice, well-turned phrase. I fell asleep with the magazine in my hand. The next morning, the Mon Beast was sitting at the foot of my bed. Okay, okay, it said, blinking its bug eyes at me. Don't act so surprised. MacDonald warned you, didn't he? But, but... Sure, I'm real, the Mon Beast volunteered, scratching its scaly head with a long-nailed finger. That's the trouble with you guys. You're full of imagination, but you can't face reality. Where... Where'd you come from? The Mon Beast shrugged massive green shoulders. The whole thing's much too technical for me to worry about. All I know is us BEMs exist and we get to your dimension via science fiction. That power of mind MacDonald was talking about, I said, shuddering a bit. Something like that. Other forms of fiction deal with things native to your world. Science fiction regards us BEMs as real, so while we don't ordinarily exist here, there's a stress created in the barrier between us and we come through. Then you're really real. Practically. Right now, though, you're the only one who can see and hear me. You haven't characterized me sufficiently so that the readers will be convinced that I'm real. But that's okay. You'll improve. Thanks. But now what about you? I said, trying not to appear over-anxious. Are you returning to your own dimension, or are you staying here for a while? The Mon Beast grinned, showing the eight sharp-pointed teeth I knew it possessed. Sorry, I'm here to stay. I'm your brainchild, you know, so I'll have to stick to you. I gulped. Stick to me? Only figuratively, the Mon Beast said. But I'll be around. He cocked a bug eye at me and said gravely, We'd better get a few things straight right from the start. One of them is that as far as you're concerned, I'm as real as that bedpost. Real. I tried to laugh that off, but the sound came out a little weakly. <laughs> That's silly. You're just a product of my imagination. Am I? The Mod Beast said. He thrust the scaly face close to mine and yawned. Suddenly, the room became a Turkish bath. Okay, okay, I said hastily. Turn it off. Coolness came, and I breathed easier as the steam dissipated. Secondly, you're going to create bigger and better BEMs and make them more convincing, the Mon Beast continued. With all you writers turning us loose, we can have a swell time in this world. But how can you, I protested. You said the readers wouldn't believe in you, so you don't exist for them. Science fiction is growing, the Mon Beast said. Every day more people are getting to realize that there is more to the world than those things they see around them. They believe what they read in love stories and detective stories. Science fiction is next. Suppose I don't want to create more BEMs, I said. Suppose I take up saxophone playing or something and leave science fiction alone. You can't stop writing it now any more than a true fan can stop reading it. The bug has bitten you. He smiled a piano keyboard of teeth and continued. Besides, I could be obliged to at 
inspire you just a bit. But you just work along with me, and we'll both do fine. So we did. The Mon Beast isn't such a bad fellow after all. Once you get to know him, neither are the other BEMs hanging around my house. Oh yes, there are others, lots of them, hanging from the rafters, under chairs, in coffee cups, everywhere. It's an occupational hazard, you know. Chances are, though, you wouldn't be able to see them, unless you're a real gone science fiction fan, and even then, maybe not. But some day you will. Some day you'll be sitting in your favorite chair, reading your favorite science fiction magazine, and you'll look up. Maybe it'll be sitting on the desk beside you, running one of four hands through a nest of snakes on its scaly head. Maybe it'll be only an inch tall and perched on the piano, watching you. Maybe at first it'll be just a warm, dank breath on the back of your neck. Maybe next year, next month, tomorrow. Who knows? Perhaps even now. Here's a little tip: when you lay down this magazine, turn around slowly. Have you ever had the feeling that something was going on behind your back, but when you turned around, you saw nothing? What's that? You think maybe you've got that feeling right now? Listen. On second thought, now that you know, maybe you'd better not turn around. Take this as a gag, a nice big laugh. You'll be a lot better off that way. What you don't know can't hurt you. End of Once Upon a Mon Beast by Charles E. Fritch. One Out of Ten by J. Anthony Furlane. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I watched Don Phillips, the commercial announcer, out of the corner of my eye. The camera in front of me swung around and lined up on my set. And now, on with the show, Phillips was saying. And here, ready to test your wits, is your quizzing quizmaster, smiling Jim Parsons. I smiled into the camera and waited while the audience applauded. The camera tally light went on, and the stage manager brought his arm down and pointed at me. "Good afternoon," I said into the camera. "Here we go again with another half hour of fun and prizes on television's newest, most exciting game, Parlor Quiz. In a moment, I'll introduce you to our first contestant. But first, here is a special message to you mothers." The baby powder commercial appeared on the monitor, and I walked over to the next set. They had the first contestant lined up for me. I smiled and took her card from the floor man. She was a middle-aged woman with a faded print dress and old-style shoes. I never saw the contestants until we were on the air. They were screened before the show by the staff. They usually tried to pick contestants who would make good show material—an odd name or occupation, or somebody with twenty kids. Something of that nature. I looked up from the card for the tip-off. Mrs. Freda Dunny, the card said, ask her where she comes from. I smiled at the contestant again and took her by the hand. The tally light went on again, and I grinned into the camera. Well, now we're all set to go, and our first contestant today is this charming little lady right here beside me, Mrs. Freda Dunny. I looked at the card. How are you, Mrs. Dunny? Fine, just fine. All set to answer a lot of questions and win a lot of prizes. Oh, I'll win, all right," said Mrs. Dunny, smiling around at the audience. The audience tittered a bit at that remark. I looked at the card again. "Where are you from, Miss Dunny?" "Mars," said Mrs. Dunny. "Mars," I laughed, anticipating the answer. "Mars, Montana? Mars, Peru? No, Mars up there," she said, pointing up in the air. "The planet Mars, the fourth planet out from the sun." My assistant looked unhappy. I smiled again, wondering what the gag was. I decided to play along. Well, well, I said, all the way from Mars, eh? And how long have you been here on Earth, Mrs. Dunny? Oh, about thirty or forty years. I've been here nearly all my life. Came here when I was a wee bit of a girl. Well, I said, you're practically an Earth woman by now, aren't you? The audience laughed. Do you plan on going back some day, or have you made up your mind on staying here on Earth for the rest of your days? Oh, I'm just here for the invasion," said Mrs. Dunny. "When that's all over, I'll probably go back home again. The invasion? Yes, the invasion of Earth. As soon as enough of us are here, we'll get started. You mean there are others here too? 
Oh, yes, there are several million of us here in the United States already, and more on the way. There are only about 170 million people in the United States, Mrs. Dunny, I said. If there are several million Martians among us, one out of every hundred would have to be a Martian. One out of every ten, said Mrs. Dunny. That's what the boss said just the other day. We're getting pretty close to the number we need to take over Earth. What do you need, I asked. One to one? One Martian for every one Earthman? Oh, no, said Mrs. Dunny. One Martian is worth ten Earthmen. The only reason we're waiting is we don't want any trouble. You don't look any different from us Earth people, Mrs. Dunny. How does one tell the difference between a Martian and an Earthman when one sees one? Oh, we don't look any different, said Mrs. Dunny. Some of the kids don't even know they're Martians. Most mothers don't tell their children until they're grown up. And there are other children who are never told because they just don't develop their full powers. What powers? Oh, telepathy, thought control, that sort of thing. You mean that Martians can read people's thoughts? Sure. It's no trouble at all. It's very easy, really, once you get the hang of it. Can you read my mind? I asked, smiling. Sure, said Mrs. Dunny, smiling up at me. That's why I said that I'd know the answers. I'll be able to read the answers from your mind when you look at that sheet of paper. Now that's hardly sporting, is it, Mrs. Dunny? I said, turning to the camera. The audience laughed. Everybody else has to do it the hard way, and here you are reading it from my mind. All's fair in love and war, said Mrs. Dunny. Tell me, Mrs. Dunny, why are you telling me all about this? Isn't it supposed to be a secret? I have my reasons, said Mrs. Dunny. Nobody believes me, anyhow. Oh, I believe you, Mrs. Dunny, I said gravely. And now, let's see how you do on the questions. Are you ready? She nodded. Name the one and only mammal that has the ability to fly, I asked, reading from the script. A bat, she said. Right. Did you read that from my mind? Oh, yes. You're coming over very clear, said Mrs. Dunny. Try this one, I said. A princess is any daughter of a sovereign. What is a princess royal? The eldest daughter of a sovereign, she said. Correct. How about this one? Is a Kodiak a kind of simple box camera, a type of double-bowed boat, or a type of Alaskan bear? A bear, said Mrs. Dunny. Very good, I said. That was a hard one. I asked her seven more questions, and she got them all right. None of the other contestants even came close to her score, so I wound up giving her the gas range and a lot of other smaller prizes. After we were off the air, I followed the audience out into the hall. Mrs. Dunny was walking towards the lobby with an old paper shopping bag under her arm. An attendant was following her with an armful of prizes. I caught up with her before she reached the door. Mrs. Dunny, I said, and she turned around. I want to talk to you. When do I get the gas stove, she said. Your local dealer will send it to you in a few days. Did you give them your address? Yes, I gave it to them. My Philadelphia address, that is. I don't even remember my address at home anymore. Come now, Mrs. Dunny. You don't have to keep up that Mars business now that we're off the air. It's the truth, and I didn't come here just by accident, said Mrs. Dunny, looking over her shoulder toward the attendant who was still holding the prizes. I came here to see you. Me? Mrs. Dunny set the paper bag down on the floor and dug down into her pocketbook. She took out a dog-eared piece of white paper and bent it up in her hand. Yes, she said firmly. I came to see you, and you didn't follow me out here because you wanted to. I commanded you to come. Commanded me to come, I spluttered. What for? To prove something to you. Do you see this piece of paper? She held out the paper in her hand, with the blank side toward me. My address is on this paper. I am reading the address. Concentrate on what I am reading. I looked at her. I concentrated. Suddenly, I knew. 251 South 8th Street, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, I said out loud. You see, it's very easy once you get the hang of it, she said. I nodded and smiled down at her. Now I understood. I picked up her bag and put my hand on her shoulder. Let's go, I said. We have a lot to talk about. End of One Out of Ten by J. Anthony Furlane Zero Hour by Ray Bradbury. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Zero Hour by Ray Bradbury. Oh, it was to be so jolly. What a game! Such excitement they hadn't known in years. The children catapulted this way and that across the green lawns, shouting at each other, holding hands, flying in circles, climbing trees, laughing. Overhead, the rockets flew, and beetle cars whispered by on the streets. But the children played on. Such fun, such tremulous joy, such tumbling and hearty screaming. Mink ran into the house, all dirt and sweat. For her seven years, she was loud and strong and definite. Her mother, Mrs. Morris, hardly saw her as she yanked out drawers and rattled pans and tools into a large sack. Heavens, Mink, what's going on? The most exciting game ever, gasped Mink, pink-faced. Stop and get your breath, said the mother. No, I'm all right, gasped Mink. Okay, I take these things, Mom. But don't dent them, said Mrs. Morris. Thank you, thank you, cried Mink, and boom, she was gone, like a rocket. Mrs. Morris surveyed the fleeing tot. What's the name of the game? Invasion, said Mink. The door slammed. In every yard on the street, children brought out knives and forks and pokers, and old stovepipes, and can openers. It was an interesting fact that this fury and bustle occurred only among the younger children. The older ones, those ten years and more, disdained the affair, and marched scornfully off on hikes, or played a more dignified version of hide-and-seek on their own. Meanwhile, parents came and went, in chromium beetles. Repairmen came to repair the vacuum elevators in houses, to fix fluttering television sets, or hammer upon stubborn food delivery tubes. The adult civilization passed and repassed the busy youngsters, jealous of the fierce energy of the wild tots, tolerantly amused at their flourishings, longing to join in themselves. This and this and this, said Mink, instructing the others with their assorted spoons and wrenches. Do that and bring that over here. No, here, Ninny. Right, now, get back while I fix this. Tongue in teeth, face wrinkled in thought. Like that, see? Yay! shouted the kids. Twelve-year-old Joseph Connors ran up. Go away, said Mink, straight at him. I want to play, said Joseph. Can't, said Mink. Why not? You would just make fun of us. Honest, I wouldn't. No, we know you. Go away, or we'll kick you. Another twelve-year-old boy whirred by on little motor skates. Aye, Joe, come on, let them sissies play. Joseph showed reluctance and a certain wistfulness. I want to play, he said. You're old, said Mink firmly. Not that old, said Joe sensibly. You'd only laugh and spoil the invasion. The boy on the motor skates made a rude lip noise. Come on, Joe, them and their fairies, nuts. Joseph walked off slowly. He kept looking back all down the block. Mink was already busy again. She made a kind of apparatus with her gathered equipment. She had appointed another little girl with a pad and pencil to take down notes in painful, slow scribbles. Their voices rose and fell in the warm sunlight. All around them, the city hummed. The streets were lined with good, green, and peaceful trees. Only the wind made a conflict across the city, across the country, across the continent. In a thousand other cities, there were trees and children and avenues, businessmen in their quiet offices, taping their voices or watching televisors. Rockets hovered like darning needles in the blue sky. There was the universal quiet conceit and easiness of men accustomed to peace, quite certain there would never be trouble again. Arm in arm, men all over earth were a united front. The perfect weapons were held in equal trust by all nations. A situation of incredibly beautiful balance had been brought about. There were no traitors among men, no unhappy ones, no disgruntled ones. Therefore, the world was based upon a stable ground. Sunlight illumined half the world, and the trees drowsed in a tide of warm air. Mink's mother from her upstairs window gazed down. The children... She looked upon them and shook her head. Well, they'd eat well, sleep well, and be in school on Monday. Bless their vigorous little bodies. She listened. Mink talked earnestly to someone near the rose bush. 
though there was no one there. These odd children, and the little girl, what was her name? Anna? Anna took notes on a pad. First, Mink asked the rosebush a question, then called the answer to Anna. Triangle, said Mink. What's a tri, said Anna with difficulty. Angle. Never mind, said Mink. How you spell it, asked Anna. T-R-I, spelled Mink slowly, then snapped. Oh, spell it yourself, she went on to other words. Beam, she said. I haven't got tri, said Anna. Angle down yet. Well, hurry, hurry, cried Mink. Mink's mother leaned out the upstairs window. A-N-G-L-E, she spelled down at Anna. Oh, thanks, Mrs. Morris, said Anna. Certainly, said Mink's mother, and withdrew, laughing, to dust the hall with an electro-duster magnet. The voices wavered on the shimmery air. Beam, said Anna, fading. Four, nine, seven, A, and B, and X, said Mink, far away, seriously. And a fork, and a string, and a hex, hexagony, hexagonal. At lunch, Mink gulped milk at one toss and was at the door. Her mother slapped the table. You sit right back down, commanded Mrs. Morris. Hot soup in a minute. She poked a red button on the kitchen butler, and ten seconds later, something landed with a bump in the rubber receiver. Mrs. Morris opened it, took out a can with a pair of aluminum holders, unsealed it with a flick, and poured hot soup into a bowl. During all this, Mink fidgeted. Hurry, Mom, this is a matter of life and death. Aw, I was the same way at your age, always life and death, I know. Mink banged away at the soup. Slow down, said Mom. Can't, said Mink. Drill's waiting for me. Who's Drill? What a peculiar name, said Mom. You don't know him, said Mink. A new boy in the neighborhood, asked Mom. He's new, all right, said Mink. She started on her second bowl. Which one is Drill, asked Mom. He's around, said Mink, evasively. You'll make fun. Everybody pokes fun. Gee darn. Is Drill shy? Yes. No. In a way. Gosh, Mom, I gotta run if we want to have the invasion. Who's invading what? Martians invading Earth. Well, not exactly Martians. They're, I don't know, from up. She pointed with her spoon. And inside said Mom, touching Mink's feverish brow. Mink rebelled. You're laughing. You'll kill Drill and everybody. I didn't mean to, said Mom. Drill's a Martian? No, he's, well, maybe from Jupiter or Saturn or Venus. Anyway, he's had a hard time. I imagine, Mrs. Morris hid her mouth behind her hand. They couldn't figure a way to attack Earth. We're impregnable, said Mom in mock seriousness. That's the word drill used. Impreg. That was the word, Mom. My, my. Drill's a brilliant little boy. Two-bit words. They couldn't figure a way to attack, Mom. Drill says, he says, in order to make a good fight, you got to have a new way of surprising people. That way you win. And he says, also, you got to have help from your enemy. A fifth column, said Mom. Yeah, that's what Drill said and they couldn't figure a way to surprise Earth or get help. No wonder. We're pretty darn strong, laughed Mom, cleaning up. Mink sat there, staring at the table, seeing what she was talking about. Until one day, whispered Mink melodramatically, they thought of children. Well, said Mrs. Morris brightly, and they thought of how grown-ups are so busy they never look under rose bushes or on lawns, only for snails and fungus. And then there's something about dim-dims. Dim-dims? Dimensions. Dimensions. Four of them. And there's something about kids under nine and imagination. It's real funny to hear Drill talk. Mrs. Morris was tired. Well, it must be funny. You're keeping Drill waiting now. It's getting late in the day, and if you want to have your invasion before your supper bath, you'd better jump. Do I have to take a bath? growled Mink. You do. Why is it children hate water? No matter what age you live in, children hate water behind the ears. Drill says I won't have to take baths, said Mink. Oh, he does, does he? He told all the kids that. 
no more bath, and we can stay up till 10 o'clock and go to two televisor shows on Saturday instead of one. Well, Mr. Drill better mind his P's and Q's. I'll call up his mother and... Mink went to the door. We're having trouble with guys like Pete Britz and Dale Jarek. They're growing up. They make fun. They're worse than parents. They just won't believe in Drill. They're so snooty because they're growing up. You'd think they'd know better. They were little only a couple of years ago. I hate them worst. We'll kill them first. Your father and I last. Drill says you're dangerous. Know why? Because you don't believe in Martians. They're going to let us run the world. Well, not just us, but the kids over in the next block, too. I might be queen. She opened the door. Mom? Yes. What's Lodge Ick? Logic? Why, dear, logic is knowing what things are true and not true. He mentioned that, said Mink. And what's impressionable? It took her a minute to say it. Why, it means, her mother looked at the floor, laughing gently. It means to be a child, dear. Thanks for lunch, Mink ran out, then stuck her head back in. Mom, I'll be sure you won't be hurt. Much, really. Well, thanks, said Mom. Slam, went the door. At four o'clock, the audio visor buzzed. Mrs. Morris flipped the tab. Hello, Helen, she said in welcome. Hello, Mary. How are things in New York? Fine. How are things in Scranton? You look tired. So do you, the children, underfoot, said Helen. Mrs. Morris sighed. My mink, too. The super invasion. Helen laughed. Are your kids playing that game, too? Lord, yes. Tomorrow it'll be geometrical jacks and motorized hopscotch. Were we this bad when we were kids in 48? Worse, Japs and Nazis. Don't know how my parents put up with me. Tomboy. Parents learn to shut their ears. A silence. What's wrong, Mary? asked Helen. Mrs. Morris's eyes were half-closed. Her tongue slid slowly, thoughtfully, over her lower lip. Eh, she jerked. Oh, nothing. Just thought about that. Shutting ears and such. Never mind, where were we? My boy Tim's got a crush on some guy named Drill, I think it was. Must be a new password. Mink likes him, too. Didn't know it got as far as New York. Word of mouth, I imagine. Looks like a scrap drive. I talked to Josephine, and she said her kids, that's in Boston, are wild on this new game. It's sweeping the country. At this moment, Mink trotted into the kitchen to gulp a glass of water. Mrs. Morris turned. How are things going? Almost finished, said Mink. Swell, said Mrs. Morris. What's that? A yo-yo, said Mink. Watch. She flung the yo-yo down its string. Reaching the end, it... It vanished. See, said Mink. Oop. Dibbling her finger, she made the yo-yo reappear and zip up the string. Do that again, said her mother. Can't. Zero hours, five o'clock. Bye. Mink exited, zipping her yo-yo. On the audio visor, Helen laughed. Tim brought one of those yo-yos in this morning, but when I got curious, he said he wouldn't show it to me, and when I tried to work it, finally, it wouldn't work. You're not impressionable, said Mrs. Morris. What? Never mind. Something I thought of. Can I help you, Helen? I wanted to get that black and white cake recipe. The hour drowsed by. The day waned. The sun lowered in the peaceful blue sky. Shadows lengthened on the green lawns. The laughter and excitement continued. One little girl ran away crying. Mrs. Morris came out the front door. Mink, was that Peggy Ann crying? Mink was bent over in the yard near the rose bush. Yeah, she's a scare baby. We won't let her play now. She's getting too old to play. I guess she grew up all of a sudden. Is that why she cried? Nonsense. Give me a civil answer, young lady, or inside you come. Mink whirled in consternation, mixed with irritation. I can't quit now. It's almost time. I'll be good. I'm sorry. Did you hit Peggy Ann? No. Honest, you ask her. It was something... Well, she's just a scaredy pants. 
The ring of children drew in around Mink, where she scowled at her work with spoons and a kind of square-shaped arrangement of hammers and pipes. There and there, murmured Mink. What's wrong? said Mrs. Morris. Drill's stuck! Halfway! If we could only get him all the way through, it'll be easier. Then all the others could come through after him. Can I help? No, thanks. I'll fix it. All right. I'll call you for your bath in half an hour. I'm tired of watching you. She went in and sat in the electric relaxing chair, sipping a little beer from a half-empty glass. The chair massaged her back. Children. Children. Children and love and hate, side by side. Sometimes children loved you, hated you, all in half a second. Strange children. Did they ever forget or forgive the whippings and the harsh, strict words of command? She wondered. How can you ever forget or forgive those over and above you, those tall and silly dictators? Time passed. A curious waiting silence came upon the street, deepening. Five o'clock. A clock sang softly somewhere in the house, in a quiet, musical voice. Five o'clock, five o'clock, time's a-wasting, five o'clock, and purred away into silence. Zero hour. Mrs. Morris chuckled in her throat. Zero hour. A beetle car hummed into the driveway. Mr. Morris. Mrs. Morris smiled. Mr. Morris got out of the beetle, locked it, and called hello to Mink at her work. Mink ignored him. He laughed and stood a moment watching the children in their business. Then he walked up the front steps. Hello, darling. Hello, Henry. She strained forward on the edge of the chair, listening. The children were silent. Too silent. He emptied his pipe, refilled it. Swell day. Makes you glad to be alive. Buzz. What's that? asked Henry. I don't know. She got up, suddenly, her eyes widening. She was going to say something. She stopped it. Ridiculous. Her nerves jumped. Those children haven't anything dangerous out there, have they? She said. Nothing but pipes and hammers. Why? Nothing electrical. Heck no, said Henry. I looked. She walked to the kitchen. The buzzing continued. Just the same, you'd better go tell them to quit. It's after five. Tell them... Her eyes widened and narrowed. Tell them to put off their invasion until tomorrow. She laughed nervously. The buzzing grew louder. What are they up to? I'd better go look, all right. The explosion. The house shook with dull sound. There were other explosions in other yards on other streets. Involuntarily, Mrs. Morris screamed, Up this way, she cried, senselessly knowing no sense, no reason. Perhaps she saw something from the corners of her eyes. Perhaps she smelled a new odor or heard a new noise. There was no time to argue with Henry to convince him. Let him think her insane. Yes, insane. Shrieking, she ran upstairs. He ran after her to see what she was up to. In the attic, she screamed. That's where it is. It was only a poor excuse to get him in the attic in time. Oh, God, in time. Another explosion outside. The children screamed with delight, as if at a great fireworks display. It's not in the attic, cried Henry. It's outside. No, no. Wheezing, gasping, she fumbled at the attic door. I'll show you. Hurry, I'll show you. They tumbled into the attic. She slammed the door, locked it, took the key, threw it into a far, cluttered corner. She was babbling wild stuff now. It came out of her. All the subconscious suspicion and fear that had gathered secretly all afternoon and fermented like a wine in her. All the little revelations and knowledges and sense that had bothered her all day and which she had logically and carefully and sensibly rejected and censored. Now it exploded in her and shook her to bits. There, there! she said, sobbing against the door. We're safe until tonight. Maybe we can sneak out. Maybe we can escape. Henry blew up, too, but for another reason. Are you crazy? Why'd you throw that key away? Damn it, honey. Yes, yes, I'm crazy, if it helps, but stay here with me. 
I don't know how in hell I can get out. Quiet. They'll hear us. Oh, God, they'll find us soon enough. Below them, Mink's voice. The husband stopped. There was a great universal humming and sizzling, a screaming and giggling. Downstairs, the audio televisor buzzed and buzzed insistently, alarmingly, violently. Is that Helen calling? thought Mrs. Morris. And is she calling about what I think she's calling about? Footsteps came into the house. Heavy footsteps. Who's coming in my house? demanded Henry angrily. Who's tramping around down there? Heavy feet. Twenty, thirty, forty, fifty of them. Fifty persons crowding into the house. The humming. The giggling of the children. This way, cried Mink below. Who's downstairs? roared Henry. Who's there? Hush. Oh, no, 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 said his wife weakly, holding him. Please be quiet. They might go away. Mom? called Mink. Dad? A pause. Where are you? Heavy footsteps. Heavy. Heavy. Very heavy footsteps came up the stairs. Mink leading them. Mom? A hesitation. Dad? A waiting. A silence. Humming. Footsteps toward the attic. Minks first. They trembled together in silence in the attic, Mr. and Mrs. Morris. For some reason, the electric humming, the queer cold light suddenly visible under the door crack, the strange odor, and the alien sound of eagerness in Mink's voice finally got through to Henry Morris, too. He stood, shivering in the dark silence, his wife beside him. Mom? Dad? Footsteps. A little humming sound. The attic lock melted. The door opened. Mink peered inside, tall blue shadows behind her. Peekaboo, said Mink. Zero Hour by Ray Bradbury. Recording by Jeremy Clark. Half Around Pluto by Manly Wade Wellman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Ellett Half Around Pluto by Manly Wade Wellman Their glassite space helmets fogged, and their metal glove joints stiffened in the incredible surface cold. But the two men who could work finished their job. In the black sky glistened the little arc light of the sun, a sixteen hundredth of the blaze that fell on earth. Around them sulked Pluto's crags and gullies, sheathed with the hard-frozen pallor that had been Pluto's atmosphere eons ago. From the wrecked cylinder of the scout rocket, they dragged two interior girders, ready curved at the ends. These, clamped side by side with transverse brackets and decked with bulkhead metal, managed to look like a sled. At the rear, they set a salvaged engine unit. For steering, they rigged a boom shaft to warp the runners right or left. For cargo, they piled a sled full of containers, ration boxes, the foil tent, what instruments they could detach and carry, armfuls of heat tools, a crowbar, a hatchet, a few other items. Moving back from the finished work, one of them stumbled against the other. Instantly, the two puffy, soot-black shapes were crouched, glove fists up. Fierce in the system's duskiest corner. Then the moment passed. Warily, helmets turned toward each other, and they went back in a half-strip rack. In the still airtight control room, lighted by one bulb, their officer stirred on his bed strip. His tunic had been pulled off, his broken left arm and collarbone set and splinted. Under a fillet of bandage, his gaunt young face looked pale. But he had his wits back. The appropriate question, he said, is, what happened? The two men were removing their helmets. Conked and crashed, sir, said Jinx, the smaller one, uncovering a sallow, hollow-cheeked face. 
Lieutenant Wofford sat up, supporting himself on his sound arm. How long have I been out? Maybe forty hours, sir. Delirious. Corbett and me did the best we could. Take it easy, sir, he said as Wofford began to get up. Lie back. We've done what Emergency Plan 6 says. We bolted a sled together and coupled on a sound engine unit for power. Quite a haul back to base, said Wofford, almost cheerfully. His eyes were bright, as though he savored the idea. About halfway around Pluto. We'd better start now, or they'll get tired of waiting. They've gone, sir, Corbett growled before Jenks could gesture him to silence. He was beefy, slit-eyed. We saw the jets going sunward this morning. Wofford winced. Gone, he said. That's right, I didn't stop to think. You said forty hours. They couldn't wait that long. We're past opposition already, getting farther away all the time. They had to go, or they wouldn't have made it. He stood up uncertainly and reached for his ripped tunic. Corbett stepped over and helped him slide his uninjured arm into the right sleeve, then to fasten and drape the tunic over his splinted left arm and shoulder. We'll just have to get back to base camp and wait, said Wofford grimly. Sir, said Jenks, our radio is gone. I tried to patch it up, but it was gone. When they didn't get a signal, they must have thought... Nonsense, Wofford broke in. They'll have left us supplies. They couldn't wait, signal or none. Our job is to get back and stick it out there until they come for us. He sat at the control and began to write in the log book. Corbett and Jenks drifted together at the other end of the room. You meathead, snarled Jenks under his breath. You knew he took the berth to Pluto because the first mate was a lady, Leah Strominger. He had to know they were gone, protested Corbett, equally fierce. Not flat like you gave it. He came here to be with her. Now she's jetted away without him. How does a man feel when a woman's done that? Stop blathering, you two, and help me into my suit, called Walford, rising again. We're going to rev up that sled engine and get out of here. Outside, the sled lay ready under the frigid sky. Wofford tramped around it, leaned over, and poked the load. Too much, said his voice in their radios. Keep the synthesizer, the tent, these two ration boxes. Wait, keep the crowbar and the hatchet. Dump the rest. We travel that light, sir? said Gents doubtfully. I've been figuring, said Wofford. We're on the far side of Pluto from base camp. That makes 10,000 miles, more or less. Pluto's day is 19 hours and a minute or so, Earth time. We can travel only by what they humorously call daylight. And we'd better get there in 10 days. A thousand miles every nine and a half hours. Or maybe we won't get there at all. How's that, sir? Asked Corbett. The heater's in these suits, Wofford reminded him. 240 hours of efficiency, and that's all. Well, it's noon. Let's take off. His voice shook. He was still weak. Jinx helped him sit on the two lashed ration boxes and slung a mooring strap across his knees. Then Jinx took the steering boom and Corbett bent to start the engine. When the arc light sun set in the west, they had traveled more than four hours over country not too rugged to slow them much. Darkness closed in fast while Jinx and Corbett pitched the pyramidal tent of metal foil and clamped it down solidly. They spread and zipped in the ground fabric, set up lights and a heater inside, and began to pipe in thawed gases from the drifts outside. After their scanty meal, Corbett and Jenks sought their bed strips on opposite sides of the tent. Wofford tended the atomic heater for minutes until the sound of deep breathing told him that his companions were asleep. Then he put on his spacesuit, clumsy with his single hand to close seams, he picked up sextant and telescope and slipped out into the Plutonian night. It was as utterly black as the bottom of a pond of ink. But above, Wofford shone the faithful stars in the constellations mapped by the first stargazers of long ago. He made observations, checked for time and position. He chuckled inside his helmet, as though congratulating himself. Back in the tent, he opened the logbook and wrote, First day, course due west, run 410 miles, to go 9,590 miles, approximately. Supplies adequate, spirits good. Wriggling out of his space gear, he laid down. 
asleep almost before his weary limbs relaxed. Everyone was awake before dawn. They made coffee on the heater and broke out protein biscuits for breakfast. As the tiny sun weaked into view over the horizon, they loaded the sled. Corbett slouched towards the idling engine at the tail of the sled. No, get on amidships, said Wofford. I'll take over engine. My job, began Corbett. You're relieved. Strap yourself on the ration boxes. That's right, Jenks. Steer again. Make for that level ahead. With his right hand, Wofford ran a length of pliable cable around his wrist and threw a ring bolt on the decking. He touched the engine controls, and they pulled away from camp. The sled coursed over great knoll-like swellings of the terrain, coated with the dull, pale, frozen atmosphere. Beyond, it gained speed on the vast, flat plain, almost as smooth as a desert of glass. "'What's this big rink, Lieutenant?' asked Jinx. "'Maybe a sea, or maybe just a sunken area full of solid gases. Stand by the helm. I'm going to gun a few more MP... H's out over. No wind, grunted Corbett. Nothing moving except us. The floor of hell. If you was in hell, the rest of us would be better off, said Jinx sourly. Wofford began to sing, though he did not feel like it. Trim your nails and scrape your face. They're all on the other side of space. Tokyo, Baltimore, Maryland. Hong Kong, Paris, Samarkand. Tokyo, London, Troy, Fort Worth, the happy towns of the planet Earth. At camp that night, he wrote in the logbook, Second day, course due west. Run 1,014 miles. To go, 8,576 miles, approximately. Supplies adequate? Spirits fair. What's for supper? Paul Corbett, entering. I could eat a horse. That'd be cannibalism, said Jinx at once. Yah, you splinter. Don't eat any lizards, then. Spirit's good, Wofford corrected his entry and closed the logbook. He thought of Leah Strominger. She was a most efficient officer. Her hair was black as night on Pluto, and her eyes as bright as a faraway sun. Wofford wrote in his logbook, Fifth day, course north, west and southwest, curving through mountainous territory. Run 1,066 miles, but direct progress towards base camp, not exceeding 950. To go, 6,260 miles, approximately. Supplies short. Spirits fair. He wrote in his logbook, Seventh day. Course west, southwest, west, northwest, west. Run 1,108 miles. To go, 4,090 miles, approximately. Supplies low. Spirits fair. He wrote in his logbook, Ninth day. Course northwest by west. West. Run 1,108 miles. To go, 2,030 miles, approximately. Supplies low. Spirits low. Lieutenant, said Jinx from across the tent, as Wofford closed the book. Well, we know you're in command, this party and all of Pluto, but we ask permission to state our case. What case is your case? demanded Wofford, rising. I'm doing my best to get you back to base camp. Sure, said Corbett. Sure. But why base camp? Well, you know why. That's right, we know why, agreed Jenks, and Corbett grinned in his ten days tussock of beard. They'll have less supplies for us, Wofford went on. Shelter and food and fuel and instruments. They'll expect us to reach base camp and hold it down for the next attempt to reach Pluto. We know why, repeated Jinx. And that's not why, Lieutenant. Let me talk, sir. It's a dead man's talking. You won't die, snapped Wofford. I'll get you both there alive. He stepped to where in one corner he had managed to bath, a hollow in the frozen ground lined by pushing the floor fabric into it. From the heater he ran tepid clean water into it. He clipped a mirror to the tent foil, searched out an automatic razor, and began to shave his own dark, young thatch of beard. "'You're proving my point, Lieutenant,' said Jinx. "'Police seen up your face to look pretty.' "'Why not?' growled Wofford, mowing another swathe of whiskers. "'No reason why not. Ten, twenty years from now, they'll find your body, 
whenever the inner orbits get to where they can boom off another expedition. You'll look young and clean-shaven. You, you know who'll weep. Wofford lowered the razor in his good hand and glared at the two. They grinned in the bright light opposite him. They looked as if they hoped he'd see the joke. I said it's a dying man that's talking, said Jinx again. Won't you let me say my dying say, Lieutenant? Let's all die honest. I'm going to get you there, Wofford insisted. Ah, now, said Corbett, as though persuading a naughty child. You think they've left twenty years' worth of supplies to keep us going? The ship didn't carry that much. Even if they left it all. He grinned mirthlessly. I can figure what you're figuring, Lieutenant, he went on, with a touch of jinx slack manner. You die, young and brave. You'll shave up again before you lie down and let go. And when the next shipload arrives, there'll be you, lying like a statue of your good-looking young self, frozen stiff. Am I right? Corbett was right, Wofford admitted to himself. The man was more than a great meaty lump. After all, to see another man's unspoken thought so clearly. Then Jinx took it up. First mate, Leah Strominger, will have a look. She may command the new expedition. She'll be promoted away up to Admiral or higher. Twenty years of brilliant service. Gone gray around the edges, but still a lovely lady. There you'll lie before her eyes, young and brave as you was when she deserted you. She'll cry, won't she? And hot tears can't thaw you out or wake you up. Shut your heads, both of you, shouted Wofford, so fierce and loud that the foil tent wall vibrated as with a gale in the airless night. But they had guessed true. He'd wanted to be found at base camp. He'd wanted Leah Strominger to know, some day, that she'd blasted off and left behind the man most worthy of all men on all worlds. Everybody takes a hot bath tonight, said Wofford. We'll all sleep better for it. Tomorrow's our last day on the trail. To do two thousand miles, said Jinx. To do all of that. The expedition mapped an area at least that wide around base camp, and it's slick and smooth. We can almost slide in. All slick and smooth, but just this side of base camp, Lieutenant, said Jinx. How do you mean? That string of craters, don't you remember? It's just this side, east of base camp. This lead will never go over that, sir. Nor around, Corbett put in. We'll have to detour, maybe three thousand miles, and the heaters in our suits won't last. I know about the crater, said Wofford. We'll take care of them when we reach them. Stripping, he lowered his body into the makeshift tub and began to scrub himself one-handed. He awakened in the morning to the sound of a furious argument. Corbett and Jinx, of course. A trifle, division of the breakfast ration, or of the breakfast chores, had set off their nerves like trains of explosive. Even as Wofford rose from his bed strip, Corbett swung a cobble-like fist at Jinx's gaunt, grimacing face. The nimbler, smaller man ducked and sidled away. Corbett took a lumbering step to close in on his enemy, and Jinx darted a hand to his belt behind, then brought it forward again with an electro-automatic pistol. I've been keeping this for you, Jinx shrilled. I'll just diminish the population of Pluto by thirty-three and one-third percent. Hold it, bellowed Wofford. He was too late. A stream of bullets chattered through Corbett's body, folding him over and ripping through the paper-thin wall of the tent. Air whistled out. The tent began to collapse. Jinx, pinned under Corbett's body, was squealing like a pig. Lieutenant, help me! Wofford saw in an instant that the wall could not be patched in time. The bullets had torn loose in a regular strip. Pressure had done the rest. Even now the tent was only a few seconds away from complete collapse. As he stumbled across the floor toward the spacesuits, his heart was laboring and his chest straining for breath. Spots swam in front of his eyes. He found the topmost spacesuit by touch and fumbled for the helmet. The tent drifted down on his head in a soft, murderous folds. He opened the valve, shoved his face into the helmet, and gulped precious oxygen. His dull awareness brightened again, momentarily. But he knew he was still a dead man unless he could get into the suit before the pressure fell completely. Numbed fingers plucked at the suit opening. Somehow he got the awkward garment over his legs, closed and locked the torso, pulled down the helmet. He was lying in darkness, with a low, steady hiss of oxygen in his ears. He rolled over weakly, got to his feet. He turned on his helmet light. He was propping up a gray cave of metal foil that fell in stiff creases all around him. At his feet were the bodies of Jinx and Corbett, 
Both were dead. After a while, clumsily, painfully, he dragged the two corpses free of the tent. He found the heater and thawed a hole in the frozen surface, big enough for both. He tumbled them in and then undercut the edges of the hole with the heater so that the chunks fell in and covered them. While he watched, the cloud of vapor he had made began to settle, slowly congealing on the broken surface and blurring it over again. In a year, there would be no mark here to show that the surface had been disturbed. In a thousand years, it would still be the same. In the first ray of dawn, he flung all the supplies from the sled, except the fuel containers. He checked the engine and started it. Into his belt bag, he thrust the logbook. Nothing else went aboard the sled. No food, no water container, no tools, instruments, or oxygen tanks. The tent he left lying there, with all that had been carried inside the night before. As the sun rose clear of the distant rim of the plain to eastward, he rigged a line to the steering boom, then lashed himself securely within reach of the engine. Steering by the taut line, he started westward, slowly at first, then faster. It was as he had hoped. The lightened sled attained and held greater speed than on any previous day. I'll make it, he said aloud, with nobody else to listen, on all Pluto. I'll make it. Faster, he urged the engine's rhythm, and faster. He clocked at speed by the indicators on the housing. A hundred and fifty miles an hour. A hundred and sixty. Not enough. Whipping the boom line tight around his waist to hold his course steady, he sighted between the upcurve of the runner forward. There was level, smooth, frozen country, mile upon mile. He speeded up to 175 miles an hour. More. The sled hummed at every joining. At noon he'd done a good thousand miles. By mid-afternoon, 1,600. Two and a half hours of visibility left and more than 400 miles to go. I can do those on my head, muttered Wofford to himself. And then, far in the distance, the flat rim of the horizon was flat no longer. It had sprung up jagged, full of points and bulges. Speeding toward it, he steered by the line around his waist while he cut his engine. He came close at fifty miles an hour, almost a crawl. Some ancient volcanic action had thrown up those mountains, like a rank of close-drawn sentries. The sled could not cross them anywhere. Still reducing speed, Wofford drew close to a notch but the notch gave into a crater, a great shallow saucer two miles in diameter and filled with shadows below so that Wofford could not gauge its depth. Opposite, another notch. Perhaps once the crater had been a lake, with water running in and out. If he had come there at noon, he could have seen the bottom, and perhaps... But it didn't noon. Wofford was talking to himself again. His voice sounded thin and petulant in his own ears. By noon tomorrow the heat will be out of his suit. He stopped the sled, unlashed himself, and trudged to the notch. He stood in it, looking down and then across. The little bright jewel of the sun, sagging toward the horizon, showed him the upper reaches of the crater's interior, pitched at an angle of perhaps fifty degrees. Even if it had been noon, it would have been no use. The sled could never climb a slope like that. Then he looked again this way and that. He nodded inside his helmet. He might as well try. Returning to the sled... He started the engine and lashed himself fast again. He steered away from the crater and around. He made a great looping journey of twenty miles or so across the plain, building speed all the time. As he rounded the rear curve of his course, he was driving along at two hundred and sixty miles an hour, and he had to apply pressure to the boom with both hand and knees to point the sled back straight for the notch. Straightening his humming vehicle into a headlong course, he leaned forward and sighted between the upturned runners. Now, he urged himself, and watched the break in the crater wall rush toward him. It greatened, yawned. He leaped through, and with a groaning gasp of prayer, he dragged the boom over to steer the sled right. It worked, as he had not dared hope. The runners bounced, bit, then he was racing around the inside of the great cup's rim, like a hurtling bubble on the inner surface of the whirlpool funnel. Two miles across, three miles or more on the half-diameter, the engine laboring up to 300 miles an hour, centrifugal force holding it there. Little more than 30 seconds raced by when he knew he had won. He saw the far notch growing near. He came to it in a last booming rush and hurled his whole weight against the boom to face the runners into the notch. Under the low-dropping sun, he and his sled shot into the open country beyond the range. His right arm felt dead from shoulder to fingertip. His head roared and drummed with the racing of his blood. His face had tired spots in it. 
where muscles he had never used before had locked into agonized grimace. On he sped, straight west, gasping and gurgling and mumbling in crazy triumph. An hour, an anticlimactic hour, wherein the sled almost steered itself over the smoothest of plain, and up ahead he spied the black outline of base camp. It was a sprawling low structure, prefabricated metal and plastic and insulation. Black outside to gather what heat might come from outer space. It held aloof on the dull frozen plain from the irregular stain where the expedition ship had braked off with one set of rockets and had soared away with another set. Larger, more familiar, grew base camp with each second of approach. Shakily, Wofford cut his engine, slowed from high speed to medium, to 100 miles an hour, to 60, to 50. He made a final circle around base camp and let it coast in with the engine off, to within 20 yards of the main lock panel. He got up on legs that shook inside his boots. He felt his heart racing, his head still ringing. He sighed once and walked close, his gauntlet fumbling at the release button on the lock panel. But the button didn't respond. Jammed, he said. No. Locked. He couldn't get in. He had reached base camp, but he could not get in. They hadn't counted on his return. They'd gone off and left base camp locked up. He sagged against the block panel and cursed once with an utter and furious resignation. He felt himself slipping. He was going to faint. His legs would not hold him up. He was slipping forward and seemed to be sinking into the massive and unyielding outer surface of base camp. It was a dream, or it was death. He did not lose all hold on his awareness. He had a sense of lying at full length and blinding light flashes that made his eyelids jump and a tug somewhere, as though his helmet was coming off. He would have to put out a hand to see, but his left arm was broken and his right arm limp from weariness. "'You're back,' said a voice. He knew, a voice strained with wonder. "'You managed. I knew you would.' "'Now,' said Wofford, "'I know it's a dream. We dream after we die.' A hand was cut behind his neck, lifting him into a sitting position. He felt warm fluid at his lips. It's no dream, said the voice beseechingly. Look at me. I don't dare. The dream will go away. But he opened his eyes and looked at her hair like Plutonian night, her eyes like bright stars. Leah, he said. I'm going to call you Leah. Please call me Leah. I'd be bound to dream about you. I've dreamed about you so much. Ow! He got his right hand up to cherish his tingling cheek. So you felt that, she said. Now I know you're awake, or must I slap you again? I'm sorry, madam. You call me Leah. Can you stand up? I'll help you. She helped him, and he stood up, there in the admission chamber of base camp. Leah Strominger was smiling, and she was crying, too. You didn't go away, he said. You're still here. The weight of his odyssey, half around Pluto, was beginning to stagger him. No, I stayed. I knew you'd come back. I knew Pluto couldn't kill you or keep you from coming back. He drank more from the cup she held to his lips. We'll wait together for them to come with the next expedition, she promised him. Twenty years? Supplies? There'll be plenty. Don't you know about Pluto? Didn't those craters, those old volcanoes, tell you? Thinking of how he had crossed the crater, Wofford shuddered. Pluto is colder than anybody even guessed, outside. But inside are the internal fires like all the solid planets. We made our tests, and we can tap them. I kept the instruments for that. It means we'll have power, and can make our synthetic foods, and so on, for as long as we need them. You and I are the inhabitants here. He stumbled to a chair and sat. Twenty years, he said. Her arm was still around him. Her hair brushed his cheek. It won't be long. We have so much to say to each other. End of Half Around Pluto by Manly Wade Wellman.